side for a while. Maybe this is my good side. They say if you take a mirror. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our council meeting for Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. Good morning, council. Good morning, staff that are here and that are virtual. Good morning, good morning to the uh, viewing public. We have nobody, I don't think anybody from the public. We have one press guy here, so there you go. One, Chris, I shouldn't say press guy, but Chris is here. Anyway, uh, welcome, and uh, we are in the right side of spring. Sometimes you might wonder, because it was snowing when I left here yesterday, and but maybe by the weekend you might need bug spray. So who knows, right? So, and how about those leaves? Not so good last night, but uh, that happened with uh, Tampa Bay. So they'll have to pick up their socks and do a bit better. So if you look at any way to bring a community or a country together, uh, sports sometimes does that. It changes the dialogue and everybody's on the same page. Right, Amanda? <laughs> All right, we'll move on. So uh, we do have a, a published agenda that was on our website uh, for everyone to view. And I guess the first question I'll ask, is there any, uh, any additions to the agenda? Councilor Wickens. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the uh, old rats, that's the Osprey Rural Amateur Theater Society uh, are putting on a play in, uh, in June and they're asking for some uh, I guess some free rentals so that they can um, practice, do their, do their rehearsals. Um, I'll have a, a list, of, it's every Sunday from now until the 10th of June. And there will likely be some, uh, some dress rehearsals likely on the Thursday and Friday beforehand. So, so your request to have some, some free opportunity or some availability, availability of space for their, yes. for their practice and stuff. Yes. And that's at the Osprey Community Center? Yes. Okay, so uh, then you're moving that to, edit, to add yes, that. Uh, so I do we have a seconder that. for that? Uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen, any discussion on adding that to the agenda? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay, that's carried. We'll, uh, we'll add, add that part to the agenda then. Are there any other items to be added? Hmm, okay. Well, I think there's one item that needs to be added. There was a bit, there's been a letter that's been circulated through our community that I think we need to have a conversation about. I don't know if anybody has received it. I've received, I think I've received more calls than, than our waste management project. <laughs> so anyway, I think it needs, uh, I'd like to add that to the agenda. If you don't, does everybody, it was sent out by the, um, the Sogging Landowners Association, I think. And uh, is everybody aware of that? Uh, so I, I, if somebody would care to put that, move that, uh, to add it to, so. Deputy Mayor, sorry, uh, Councilor Dubik and Deputy Mayor Nielsen to add that to the agenda. So it's a conversation about the public yeah. letter? Yeah, yeah, and I think, you want to get it, I think there's some communication that needs that and some things that need to be discussed there. Uh, any discussion on adding that to the agenda? Quick the question. Point? Sorry, Mayor McQueen, if I may ask a quick question. So given the nature of our agendas this term, um, when we are adding items to the agenda? Are they just going straight to the consent agenda for discussion? Are they gonna to go to specific items? I would think the ORATS request that Councillor Wickens is putting there is community development. The public letter is police under PLEA-SB because of the nature of what it's talking about. Anyways, Clerk Martel, if you can answer that question for me. Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you through you, Mayor McQueen, to, count, to Deputy Mayor Nielsen and the rest of council. Yes, I would, uh, I would believe that the request that Dan, that Councilor Wiggins had mentioned would go under economic and community development, as it would historically normally be under a CGP application. Um, and then the second request, um, I was going to ask for clarity whether it wanted to be under corporate administration or under the um, safety and policing. Okay, is that enough clarity? So I think Clerk Martel is looking for clarity on the public letter. Um, I think corporate corporate administration probably makes the most sense given it's um, under that department at the bylaw enforcement officer because it's under the planning files. So that would probably make the most sense. Thanks, yeah. Mayor McQueen. It's just trying to, to understand the agenda as, as we'll move forward today. And that's probably something that we would clarify whenever we do a review of our procedure bylaw, but mm. it makes it long as it's somewhere on the agenda. And if that fits there, then that makes sense. Sometimes there's things maybe you can't fit and it goes into other, I, I don't know. But if that's, 
okay with everybody is just an understanding of that uh, amendment being placed at a certain part on our agenda. So any other discussion on that addition? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. So, so we suggested that uh, ORATS would be under a corporate, you should just, I should, for me as a chair, I need to add that yes. uh, on, the, on that because I will definitely miss it. So that's under 10.2, sorry, Madam Clerk. Uh, sorry, so the- We have to, we have to make- The Osprey rec will be under economic and community development. Yep, I, I, that's why I put it under 10.2 almost. It would be right as I look at the agenda. I mean, we have to vote on approving the, the agenda as a whole. And then the other one with regards to the under corporate, and it's, uh, where is it? It's, uh, what number is it? CLS and planning is nine. So I'm thinking 9.12. My apologies, Deputy Clerk uh, Van Alstein. I was just suggesting that the public letter be under CLS and planning. So it'd be 9.12, because we have 9.11. Yes. yes. Thank you. Just so we're all on the same page. Well, for me, wonderful as, book. as me, me as chair, if I don't put a big X and have it there, I will definitely be corrected. <laughs> all right. Any other additions uh, or deletions from the agenda? <laughs> <laughs> well, it could happen. Uh, seeing none, can I have a motion into the amended agenda? Deputy Mayor Nielsen, Councillor Allen, any discussion there? Seeing none. All in favor uh, is carried. I'm sure the viewing public always is amazed of how we weave ourselves through <laughs> our, 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 our business. Okay, so that's been approved. Okay, open forum. Uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, are there any uh, individuals wishing to speak to items on the, I guess it's sort of, the, I guess it could be the amended agenda in a sense, but. There is nobody that has registered for open forum today. Well, that's, 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 a, that's must be a first for a few months, I think, right? So I guess we must be doing everything right or there's nothing controversial. Maybe, I don't know. All right, so there are none there, so we'll move on then. So we do have an approved amended agenda. Is there any declaration of community interest with the members of council? If one does uh, find that uh, an, an issue, they can declare it at that time as well. We have the minutes of uh, April 19th, 2023. Can I have a mover and a seconder for those minutes? Councillor Allwood. What a seconder, Councillor Lowhead. Okay. Any discussion or errors or omissions on those minutes? It went on a little longer, but uh, anyway, uh, seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. We did start at one of that, that day, so that it made it a little later. We did pretty good, I think. All right. Uh, moving on then to uh, item six on our agenda. This is with regard to delegations, community safety, and well being plan and uh, it's virtual. So Madam Deputy Clerk, or I presume you're gonna let them into our, into our council meeting. And we have Sarah, we have Sarah and Anne Marie. Good morning. Good morning. And how are you? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Well, it's our pleasure. And Anne-Marie is going to be here as well, or is she the backup? <laughs> um, she will be available to answer questions, but I'll begin by giving the presentation. So just a moment and I'll share my screen. Thank you. No problem. You have 10 minutes for your uh, presentation. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. And would you like the questions throughout or wait to the end? I'd prefer if you wait until the end, if that's all right, and then we'd be happy to respond to any questions that come up. Sure. Thank you. So thank you again, Mayor and members of council for the opportunity to speak about community safety and well-being planning today. The overall goal of community safety and well-being planning is to achieve sustainable communities where everyone is safe, has a sense of belonging and opportunities to participate, where everyone can meet their needs for education, healthcare, food, housing, income, social and cultural expression. The eventual impact of this is a reduction in crime. So what does this mean and how are we working towards this goal? This approach means focusing on protecting individuals against the risk factors that make people vulnerable to crime and victimization. We're focused on building supports, improving access to resources and promoting positive community engagement. 
Second, we are working collaboratively and cooperatively to identify potential duplication or gaps in service delivery and leveraging strong working relationships between agencies and across sectors. Third, we're using local data to track the collective impact of work in our communities and inform future decisions. Finally, one of the ultimate goals is to decrease the need for acute incident responses, such as emergency department visits and police service calls, which are reactive and costly. This is the provincial framework for community safety and well-being planning. Acute incident responses, those reactive emergency responses, are in the middle of the bullseye. Our goal is to focus on strategies in the three outer rings, risk intervention, prevention, and social development. What does this look like? Ultimately, this means that everyone is aware of services and how to access them for themselves or the clients they support. And where gaps may be identified, we are working together to address systemic issues through advocacy and long-term planning. As a community, we're focusing on addressing risks before a crisis occurs. A visual representation of prevention might look like this. If people are falling into a river, there is of course value and necessity to throwing in life preservers or sending ambulances to respond. It may even be prudent to build rafts or fund more ambulances so response times are faster. We might build hospitals closer to the river, but these are not proactive strategies. Pulling people to safety does not address the conditions that made them vulnerable to falling in in the first place. So how do we determine who is at greatest risk? Can we identify some of these risk factors to prevent some people from falling in? This is the governance model for the plan. Over 70 partners participated in this process and continue to serve on the advisory committee, including both Bruce and Gray counties, member municipalities, police services and police service boards, health, education, community services, and other agencies working across both counties. How did community safety and well-being planning start? Under the Community Safety and Policing Act, community safety and well-being plans were legislated for all municipalities across Ontario. The Ministry of the Solicitor General has identified some of the benefits as an increased understanding of risks, enhanced communication and collaboration, increased coordination and access to services, and finally, that reduced reliance on incident responses, such as police service calls and emergency department visits. For your reference, I've included links to the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan for Bruce and Gray, which includes community survey results and data gathering, identification of our top areas of priority, and a broader discussion of the process and background of the planning as well as the indicator report, which is the data framework and includes key indicators from public health, emergency department and police service data, 211 call trends, income and employment data, among others. When issues are referred to community safety and well-being planning, we are creating a framework for addressing them by either referring the issue to an appropriate community agency or action table with expertise in that area in order to leverage existing work already happening or addressing needs through support or advocacy, such as a letter of support for a project, initiative, or funding application, or exploring opportunities for future research. Where possible, action tables aligning with our top five priority areas are existing organizations or collaborations. The Community Drug and Alcohol Strategy is the action table for addictions and substance use. The Bruce Gray Poverty Task Force is the action table for employment and income. The homelessness response table is the action table for housing and homelessness. The mental health action table is currently in development and the crime prevention action table was recently established and brings together representatives from community agencies, police services, and several interested members of the public. We're creating an assessment tool which will help organizations identify and promote protective factors that help protective factors to help mitigate risks that make people vulnerable to crime or victimization. This could include things like policies for offering subsidized recreational programming to families living in low income or continued investment in physician recruitment programs and other primary health care options to ensure everyone has access to services. Through a community safety and well-being lens, we are also asking organizations to look at things like whose input is considered and how community outreach is undertaken. 
This tool will help ensure that asking questions about protective and risk factors is part of the decision-making process. A situation table is a risk intervention model that was restarted in Gray Bruce in mid-2021 and falls under the purview of community safety and well-being planning. Representatives from over 20 local agencies meet weekly to present high-risk situations for discussion, determine appropriate supports, and respond within 48 hours. This process does not take the place of ongoing case management or long-term support, but is designed to avert a crisis. 27 situations were presented in 2022 and nine so far have been presented in 2023. The expertise of those at the table is used to determine if a situation meets the criteria for acutely elevated risk. This means that chronic conditions have accumulated to a point of crisis or new circumstances have increased the risk of harm or victimization. And one agency does not have the resources to respond to the situation alone. Determining acutely elevated risk is a judgment call. The group votes to determine if a situation meets the criteria, and if so, agencies work together to determine appropriate responses. This model determines, depends on trust, collaboration, and strong working relationships between everyone at the table. Data from the situation table helps us to identify top risk factors that make people vulnerable to crisis, as well as supports and agencies that are most frequently offering assistance in these situations. We may eventually be able to compare our data with other areas across Ontario, which may help us better understand unique approaches to risk mitigation, particularly in rural communities. The top three types of service that were mobilized in 2022 situations related to housing, addictions, and mental health supports. Data from other situation tables and research on this model suggests that the long-term benefits are a decrease in emergency department visits and police responses and an increase in collaboration between agencies. This is one strategy through which we are bringing together resources and generating solutions. In the last year, community safety and well-being planning has focused efforts on branding, building a new website, creating social media templates, and a one-page short, short summary of the goals and activities of this work. With these tools, we will continue to work towards educating the community about the relationship between upstream prevention and a decrease in crime and victimization. The key to successful community safety and well-being is working together using the experience and expertise of different sectors to target the root causes of complex issues, collaborating to ensure that everyone has access to the resources they need to thrive. We want to mitigate risks and address needs as much as possible before they require reactive responses and continue to build strong communities where everyone feels a sense of safety and belonging. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for that uh, presentation, Sarah. Uh, Emery, do you have anything to add before I go to questions? Or? Nope, Sarah covered it all. I'm just here to assist with any questions that might come forward. Okay, well, thank you for that. All right, uh, are there any uh, questions to the presenters from council? Well, you must have answered all the questions. <laughs> any comments? Councillor, sorry, uh, Councillor Dubik and then Councillor Allen. Okay, Councillor Dubik. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I think it's quite incredible, the work that you do for our community. Wondering, um, what are your greatest needs or gaps, you know, in terms of you being most effective to deliver the services that you do? Thank you for the question. So I'll respond, then I'll let Emery um, add anything that, that I might have missed. Um, just to, to sort of clarify the role of community safety and well-being, we're not a direct service provider. So this is intended as sort of an overarching umbrella under which all of the community services um, and uh, social support agencies um, are working. So we're trying to ensure that there's one place for things like data collection, resources, um, and that we're all working together instead of uh, working, you know, sometimes in silos or perhaps not recognizing what, um, what everyone else is, is working on or what services they can provide. So I would say that um, our greatest challenge and also our greatest strength is establishing those relationships and ensuring um, that we're providing referrals and that everyone knows what everyone else is is working on but i'll let Amory speak a little more to that in in gray county 
I think you've covered it really, Sarah. Collaboration is really important, especially when there are wait lists and there are a lack of resources for some of the services that we do provide, um, not necessarily Gray County, but provide as, as community agencies. Um, this group allows community agencies to come together to find different ways to work together uh, and to assist people through the star table that are in crisis. Uh, and when you have, you know, more than one agency and more than one person working on a solution for a person, um, it, it's often easier than than working through the red tape and the silos that are out there. So that would probably be the one area that we are a little bit um, focused, a little bit frontline focused. Uh, but Sarah's right, the rest of the community safety and well-being is more that data collection, identifying gaps, um, and identifying services that may be able to fill those gaps, and then advocacy to the to the province. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other uh, comments? I know Grey Highlands this started a few years back, but Meaford is part of their own plan, are they not? I thought they were. Yeah. Yeah, they have their own plan. Versus, other than Meaford, everybody's on the same plan, right? <laughs> That's correct. So Meaford has their own plan and all other municipalities across Bruce and Gray and the two counties have created this one plan jointly. Right, right. Okay, well, thank you for that, Dan. I see there's no other uh, questions. So I do need a motion then, uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen and second by, to receive it, Councilor Dubik that, uh, so moved by Deputy Mayor, second by Councilor Dubik that Council receives a delegation from Sarah Pelton and Anne-Marie Shaw regarding the community safety and well-being plan for information. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Well, thank you, and you guys have a great day, and uh, have a great okay. rest of the day, and get your smile cookies. I hear they're, they're available. Thank you very much. All right, bye for now. So we only have one delegation presentation for today's council meeting, so then we can move on into the, uh, the business at hand. So we do have the... Uh, Committee of the whole minutes from uh, April 26, 2020, sorry, March 26, 2023. April, that's right. This is the fifth month. Yeah, I was back there. I was right. April 26, 2023, Committee of the whole meeting minutes. And there's a number of uh, points there that I think can be rolled up probably in one motion. Unless uh, any of those items need to be pulled out to uh, a separate discussion. If not, can I have a mover and a seconder, please? Okay, Councillor Allwood and Councillor Allen. Uh, so I'm just going to read the, the minutes of the 20, sorry, April 26, Committee of the Whole 2023, Committee of the Whole meeting be approved as circulated. It is listed there. I don't know if I need to read it all off. I guess it's what you wish, maybe. Should I read that off, Madam Clerk? Or could you, do you wish to read it off? Viewership. Yeah, sure. So that the minutes of the 2023-04-26 Committee of the Whole meeting be approved as circulated, and that Council approve including P1-1 Village of Markdale, including extension to West Gray and a master servicing plan update, and P1-2 Kimberly, Amick, and Talisman in the master servicing plan update, and P1-3 Beaver Valley Ski Club to Road 32 in a master servicing plan update, and P1-4 Gray Road 12 to and 30 corridor from Markdale to County Road 32 in the master servicing plan update. P1-5 Gray Road 30 corridor from Beaver Valley Ski Club to Gray Road 13 in a master servicing plan update. And P2-1 Village of Flesherton in a master servicing plan update. And P2-2 built up areas in Flesherton beyond the existing sanitary sewers in a master servicing plan update. And P2-3 Highway 10 corridor from Markdale to Road 120 in a master servicing plan update, and P2-4 Highway 10 corridor from Road 120 to Flushton in a master servicing plan update, and P3-1 Hamlet, Hamlet of Eugenia in a master servicing plan update, and P3-2 Eugenia Lake area in a master servicing plan update, P3-3 Gray Road 4 and 13 corridor from Flushton to Hamlet of Eugenia in a master servicing plan update, and P3-4 Gray Road 13 corridor from Eugenia to intersection of County Road 30 at Kimberley in a master servicing plan update, and the council directs staff to proceed with a request for proposal to engage an engineering firm to complete the master servicing plan update. Thank you, Madam Clerk. If I read it, it probably like monotone, so you did a better job than I would. Any discussion or points raised on that uh, motion? Okay, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. I think we had a fantastic conversation during the community as a whole on this item, and we did a good job as a council as a whole um, diving into it. Um, expressed concerns in the community as a whole that 
this document is a foundational document towards a lot of other policies that de get developed throughout the municipality and that um, the concerns with servicing areas encourages development. So because of that, I do disagree with the majority of the way the motion is worded. So I will not be supporting it. Okay, thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. Any other comments, questions? I think there's a lot to be said that, um, you know, we'll be going through our zoning and then, and then our official plan review. And, you know, there is some merit to the sense of where we want to take the municipality in the next 10, 20 or 50 years. So servicing is a big part of that. I mean, uh, the planning ground is moving in front of us as we know it. So there's a lot of things happening there as well, but obviously, and I know there was a lot of discussion on this of, of certain areas, but I think overall we've decided to move into a direction to at least give, I think in a sense, this gives us the information to make decisions further on. And, and certainly um, from that point, there was good discussion the other day for sure. Councilor Dupi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, so just to echo that, I, I do believe that this um, exercise will help provide us um, a foundation where we can, well, where we will have some information, analysis, and data where we can further understand and have um, that will enrich our conversations about how we develop. Um, I, you know, I think it's important for all of us to have the information in front of us and to have that conversation about how and where we develop um, as a whole council with staff and with input from, from the community. Thank you for that. Any other comments? I know we did have a presentation last uh, council meeting with regards to our water rates and, and where they're going. I, I would uh, suggest that this information will come back to council to decide where they take that information, whether it's through water rates or whether it's with DC charges. I think that is a very important. So I think fundamentally this gives the background for information for council to make those decisions for other things that we have to decide on for sure. Councilor Allen, did you have something there? Okay. All right, seeing there's no other discussion, the motion has been read, it's been moved and second. All in favor of the motion? Opposed? That is carried. I well, hope you guys don't have to get up and leave now. <laughs> All right, moving on to item eight, corporate administration. And this is uh, under my uh, part. So this is uh, being a bylaw to appoint members to the road safety committee, uh, Committee, remove a member from the Museum Advisory Board and amend the bylaw 2022-103-2022-26 appointment bylaw. And can I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Councillor Allwood, do I have a seconder? Councillor Lohead, I read the motion just by the point there. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Okay, then we uh, have a, a point here with regards to, uh, a uh, we need to appoint a member from council to the Soggy Mobility and Regional Trans Transit Board and direct staff to bring forward a, an amendment to the appointment bylaw to include this appointment. So I guess I'll, I'll look for, um, well, interest or is there a motion on the floor to appoint a member from council? Deputy Mayor. I well, can't I just understand, got. I can't understand hand language, sir. Uh, fair that. enough. I was about to suggest and appoint <laughs> Councillor Allen, who didn't give me a head shake. So I will retract that, and now I'm lost because I thought that's what we're going to do today, but apparently I was wrong. <laughs> Is that what the finger point means? Yeah, I, was, I, was, I was looking for support. <laughs> well, <laughs> Councillor Dubik. So, so I do have a recommendation for appointment. If I don't get a head shake as I look down the row to the very end of the row. Fantastic. All it. right. The council appoint uh, Councillor Lowhead uh, to the Soggy Mobility and Regional Transit Board and direct staff to bring forward an amendment to the appointment bylaw to include this appointment. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Wickens. I guess I first have to ask is, uh, is the Councillor Lowhead willing to stand for that position? Uh, you may have to say yes, that again. Sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Dubik. Yes, happily, I will. Okay, very good. We wouldn't want to put somebody on there if they weren't willing. <laughs> okay, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? 
Carried. Okay. Uh, thank you for putting your name forward, uh, Councillor Lohit. Uh, Councillor Allen, you uh, <laughs> you had uh, no interest on the carry on on that. I just like to spread the work around. I just find that I yep. have enough to do. Thank you. Very good. So, if if there's items of discussion on the uh, Grey Highlands uh, Senior Advisory Committee, you can invite Councillor Lohit to attend your meeting. There you go. <laughs> All right, that's that's carried. So then, moving on to then our section nine of uh, CLLS and planning. Uh, this is chaired under Councillor Allen, so I'm going to pass the chairmanship over to you, Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item number nine point one is a recommendation that Council receive the 2023-0417 Senior advisory committee unapproved minutes for information and you see that note that there was a recommendation in the minutes but that will be dealt with at the time of uh, notices of motion okay so okay any uh, somebody want to put that on the table deputy mayor councillor dubik seconding any discussion on those minutes <coughs> Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? And that's carried. 9.2, Committee of Adjustment meeting minutes that council received the 2023-0411 Committee of Adjustment meeting minutes for information. Motion to put that on the floor, uh, Mayor McQueen and Councillor Wickens. Any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's carried. Fence bylaw request. And there's some options there that council received the correspondence from Pamela Giaz, Giar Izo, sorry, for information. And then the option is um, that council give direction to some staff to staff. So, Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we've all had the opportunity to re read the request. I think we understand the request uh, that, you know, it's to provide or prevent animals, however, coming onto your property. But I don't, you know, there is no bylaw in our, I don't think there's anything in our subdivision planning process and, and maybe that's something it could or maybe or suggest changing but it's it it's um, this is in the area of uh, where there was uh, a subdivision agreement so I understand uh, this is a new property uh, I think it is also important for council to look at the response that came from our clerk's department with regards to process and probably I'm not sure if a few members on council are fair are, are, are um, understand the line fences act but basically under each property boundary it's a separate process for each each person uh under our zoning we if there is a fence i think and probably i mean look at our manager of planning but there is certain criteria around fencing but it's not a requirement to have fencing and i think the request here is asking that we change it that it's a requirement right so um, Madam Clerk, I don't know if you had anything to add to your, your presentation. I thought you uh, explained it very well. I don't know if you have any highlights on, on what you have responded. Um, I don't really have many highlights. I think I tried to put it in as plain English as I could when I responded to the resident so that it was clear um, for her to understand. The Line Fences Act is a, um, a very old and very dated piece of legislation that has not been updated in many, many years. And um, it was initially, as, as I'm sure the mayor understands, it was initially brought forward for agricultural properties and maintaining that um, the herd stays on their own property, those kinds of things. It wasn't, I don't believe it was ever meant for um, subdivision areas or urban areas, um, which would make, as, as Ms. Giariza has, has pointed out here, it a substantial cost 
when you only need a hundred meters of fence um, as opposed to acres and acres of fence line between two properties. So um, I think that's where the, the issue lies. Um, it just appears that the neighbor doesn't have the need for a fence and, and doesn't want to take part. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what the, the what our role is in this without a bylaw or without her going through the line fence process. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, three, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that uh, explanation. There's nothing stopping somebody building their a fence on their side of the property, right? And and uh, that's usually what people do. And in most cases, on the agricultural side, you do that as well. Um, a question uh, through Mr. Chair to uh, Manager of Planning is: Are there any jurisdictions that do? Or are you aware? And maybe I'm putting you on the spot, or maybe the clerk on the spot. Is there? Are there any municipalities that do mandate this? Because I think that's that's sort of something that's being asked, and I'd be curious if, if any jurisdiction does mandate this, unless it was a subdivision agreement. Because I know, for an example, in a subdivision agreement, they may not allow you to put up uh, clotheslines. We've seen that, right? So, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't know if there's a response there. Martel, thank you. I'm not a. I'm not a. I did a little bit of research. I did a lot of searching of other uh, municipal. Um, bylaws going out there. I'm not aware of too many that mandate uh, fences between properties and that they have to share. I am aware of some that have it included in specific subdivision agreements that the developer has to provide for that fence. Um, however, that does also increase the cost to the developer, which then increases the cost of the homeowners. And, and it, it, it makes it seem that every single person wants a fence between their properties as well. So um, um, a lot of municipalities also have that um, any fencing in urban areas is a civil matter and the municipality won't get involved. So there's a lot of varying issues out there. There's not a, a it's not a cookie cutter type of deal. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think this is my last comment. So then if you're experienced um, people on your property, then there's another mechanism that you can deal with in the sense of, I guess, OPP, or bylaw or whatever, if, if there's things happening that are not restricting people from coming on your property, correct? Thank you. So if somebody's coming in your property where they shouldn't be, that's a trespass to property. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion on this item? Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair Allen. Um, kind of along the lines Kirk Martel mentioned that some municipalities should as a civil matter that the municipality doesn't really get involved. I have concerns with municipality trying to move forward. Like the request is to create a bylaw that would be mandate fencing. And I have concerns with that because there's one, I find it would be unneighborly to force everybody to put up fencing all across the municipality. And there's lots of instances where that probably isn't what their want is, but when you create a bylaw, then the bylaw needs to be enforced across the entire across the region. So, I have um, I just have concerns with the municipality trying to get involved in that kind of a concept. The I do agree that the um, Line Fences Act has more to do with um, agricultural boundaries, given the the nature of the way it's laid out, um, and unfortunately, that doesn't work for the um, individual in this case. Um, given the, the small lot versus the three different bordering properties. Um, but it didn't, I think, becomes a cost to bear on the individual who does want to in, in, uh, put up fencing around their property. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Allwood. Thank you, Chair Allen, for you. Yeah, I agree with the Deputy Mayor. You know, I believe the Line Fence Act was primarily a piece of agricultural uh, legislation that goes back many years and that uh, in our primary settlement areas, urban areas, fencing issues are usually resolved by discussion between neighbors. I don't think uh, it would be a good idea for the municipality to legislate anything in that area. Um, if uh, neighbors can't come to an agreement on sharing costs of fences and you still want to put up a fence, there's nothing stopping you from putting up a fence on your own property. So. I believe that would uh, probably be the my recommendation to to this uh, ratepayer, but uh, I think that should be the position of council too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lohead. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I, I, I'll echo what um, 
Councillor Allwood and the Deputy Mayor have just said, you know, it's um, there is nothing stopping you from putting up a, a fence uh, on your own property should you wish. You know, I keep thinking of the old adage that good fences make good neighbors, right? But should the municipality get involved and legislate fences, I think we'll have a whole lot of bad fences across the municipality of Gray Highlands, right? So, um, yeah, I simply can't support this request. Okay. So I'm seeing um, kind of leaning one way. So I'm assuming that uh, the motion would be that council receive the correspondence for information. Somebody want to put that on the floor? Councillor Allwood? Chair Allen, I'll move that. Okay, thank you. A seconder, Councillor Dubik. Any further discussion, Mr. Mayor? Just a point, I think there's only one, one regulated part about fencing is if you have a pool, right? And you have to have a fence. I think that's one thing that's an exception where it's mandated that you have to have it for safety. Purposes. I believe that isn't a line fence. That no. would be a pool a fence actually around the pool itself. itself that's right. Yeah. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, question through you, Chair Allen. Um, if the consensus run here is that to the, who are you posing this, the question to? Fair. This would probably be poised to Clerk Martel. Okay. The discussion around the table is that we believe the Line Fence Act doesn't necessarily fit in an urban area, but it still exists. Is there a way for council to opt out of the Line Fencing Act in urban areas? Well, that's interesting because the the, um, there was a discussion yesterday between the clerk and myself. We had our liaison meeting. And um, I think in the past, the clerk has recommended that we do opt out of the Line Fence Act. So I'm assuming that is a possibility. So, so Clerk Martin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I did present a report to council way back in 2017, and that was about opting out of the Line Fence Act entirely. I'm not 100% sure if you can opt out for urban versus uh, rural agricultural, those kinds of things. So uh, that would require some, some research. I know municipalities do have the option to opt in or out of the Line Fence Act in, in, in its entirety that I do know. I'm not sure about the other part. So, Deputy uh, Mayor, would you like to make a motion that you do? I would like to make an amendment to the motion an amendment that to... we add that council direct staff to research opting out of the Line Fences Act for urban areas. Okay, so you're moving that a seconder for that. Uh, Councillor Allwood, any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Oh, now you got me going. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the agricultural side, it would be, I know it doesn't get used very often, but I think, you know, there I, is, Mr. Mayor, I think the mayor is suggesting to see if we can opt out just in the, the urban areas. Not touching it. Yes. Oh, I, okay. I missed yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. I got, I got okay. Here. Good. I'm not going to mess with it. Okay. Good. Any other discussion? <laughs> Any other discussion on the amendment to Councillor Wickens? What of the folks are... Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, what of the folks that like to keep chickens in their backyard in an urban area? You're opening a can of worms, folks. It's 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 still an urban area. Clerk Martel. So should this pass, that will come back in the report. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So um, vote on the amendment to the main motion. All those in favor. Opposed. Okay. You have some opposed, but that is carried. Okay, and um, now the vote on the amended motion. Mr. Mayor. So the amendment has been made and has been passed. The question I have is to determine, as Councilor Wickens raised a good point, to determine or describe urban, because you can have urban in the sense of, of a city, you can have urban in the sense of a town, you can have urban in the sense of a village, you can have urban in a tertiary. There's a lot of urban, and I think there's a lot of difference. So hopefully that may be come back in the report as well. But I think uh, Councillor Wickens raises a good point because we do have a, a bylaw in place that does allow backyard chickens, but maybe in that bylaw it speaks to the part of fencing yes. too. So maybe it addresses that does. part, right? Yeah. But I do think there's a different urban, and even in the Great Highlands. I'm um, sure our yeah. clerk will be very thorough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, no, uh, Councillor Wickens. Does everybody understand how the, the Line Fence Act actually works? <clears throat> if you stand, if you stand at the front of your property, say 
my place is on the north side of the third line. So you stand at your property. On your right-hand side, you're responsible for the right-hand side length fence to the rear of your property. Go to the rear of your property, and in my case, look west. You're responsible for half of the rear line fence on your property. So vice versa, if you went to the other side off the fourth line, they're, re they're responsible for the west and the back half that would meet my back half. That's how it works. And if you have, you have uh, disputes, then it has to be settled through council and they will be made, if they both have livestock, they'll be made to put up a fence and it will be taken off their taxes if they don't. If Anyways, that's, that's sort of uh, how it works. Again, we're not looking at eliminating yeah. from the, the ag or rural areas. So. Okay, no further discussion. And this is on the amended motion. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. <laughs> Gray transit route that council receives staff report CLS 23.17 addendum and that council verify that the that the auth that they authorize the mayor and clerk to sign the MOU amendment to extend the term to 2025 was for the bus stop agreement that is attached. So remember we had discussion on this that we thought that route was going to be discontinued. It has been discontinued, but this is for the actual bus stop agreement. Okay, so any discussion, um, sorry, um, motion, Deputy Mayor. And seconder, Councillor Dubik. Thank you. Any discussion on this item, Mr. Mayor? Just quickly, and this has been in place from our roads department or whatever. Who's responsible for clearing the snow in front of those bus stops? Is that a responsibility of ours, theirs, nobody's? There's liability. I don't know if anybody has an answer for that, but. Uh, it's just something that um, CEO liability is always something that uh, somebody has to assume the liability. And I know it's in Mark Dillon and, and certainly at the Kimplex service at King Edward Park. Obviously we keep our roads clear and stuff and then we have a certain thing, but it is something that we are part of liability and somebody slips or falls. I just want to make sure that we're addressing that part. Thank you. Any comments on that from staff, CAO, Gavin? Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, yeah, I mean, the liability is there regardless of whether it's a bus stop or not, because it is on our property. We did have a discussion initially um, and, you know, those properties are cleaned uh, when there is a snowfall. So we figured that, you know, um, it wasn't it wasn't a huge uh, issue at this at, at the point. Uh, due to the lower ridership. I mean, obviously, if it gets to a point where we're installing bus shelters, um, there would have to be an amendment to the agreement. Okay. No further discussion? Oh, sorry. Clerk Martel. Thank you. Uh, the agreement has the owner providing the snow coverage for it, um, but it also the agreement also states that the county will obtain uh, municipal general liability insurance, uh, naming the owner as, as an insured in the amount of $5 million as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that. Mr. Mayor. There's always the 1%. That's why I raise it, right? Yeah. There's always, we've been trained well, Ms. Adams. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So all in favor of that motion, that is carried. Bylaw enforcement quarterly report. The council received staff report CLS 23.21, bylaw enforcement status report, December 2022, January, February, and March 2023. Somebody like to put that on the floor? Councillor Allwood. I'll move that, Jerome. And Councillor Dubik is seconding that. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is carried, thank you. 
9.6, Multi-Municipal Long-Term Care Working Group Capacity Expansion. Terms of reference, the Council received staff report CLS 23.22, and the Council approved the draft terms of reference for a renewed Multi-Municipal Long-Term Care Working Group capacity expansion in principle for distribution to the neighboring municipalities to gauge interest in membership. Somebody like to put that on the floor. Mayor McQueen and Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Discussion. <coughs> Mayor McQueen. Just a high level point to council is this was something that we had, did you read it? We had, we had in place in 2017 when it was, as it read, reads in the report and the reasons why, and then it was dissolved because then the changes to the uh, Gray Gables was taken away from being sold to being kept in the ownership of the County of Gray. As we did a presentation at AMO, Roma, yes, Roma in January, with regards to the minister of, uh, was it the minister or was it the PA? I can't remember now. I guess it was the minister, I think it was, with regards to um, Gray Gables. And we, it's, I think it's very much should be understood that this is a Gray County facility, which is above us and we're a tenant to this facility. Well, there is, I think, concern from our community with regards to the um, beds that have been awarded to expand this facility. I know I brought a notice of motion forward to the county two months ago and it was uh, deferred or, did, or put on hold until we see what happens with Rockwood Terrace and its development and the cost. But I feel that it's important that the lower tier communications, similar to what was in place in, in 17, that we have the conversation and build support that this is an important thing in the county, an important facility in the county of Gray and we need to continue to help assist the county and communicate to their public and process of, of keeping it um, moving along. So I'll leave it at that. And I just, in the sense of circulation, I was thinking about this last night that I would think in the past, it says in the report that it was including at the time Blue Mountains and Chatsworth. I would certainly would say that certainly the circulation to Southgate and Meaford, municipality of Meaford, and maybe all municipalities as far as that goes. But I think that's important because I know I'm looking at the uh, neighboring municipalities that do uh, physically touch Gray Highlands. And I think it has, it's, I mean, long-term care facilities is available to anybody in the province of Ontario. I guess it could even go even further than that. And so it's not about, you know, this is about here and in Gray Highlands, but in the sense of geographically, and I don't know if at some point when this gets up and running, there was a lot of data that was provided to the committee back um, when we were working on this about uh, population and growth. All that has changed because we have seen a tremendous amount of growth since 1718 when all that information was provided for the reasons why we need to keep Gray Gables. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of with regards to demographics and planning and a lot of things that this committee could I think uh, have a mandate to sort of uh, refresh and, and move forward. So I think it's neat and, and to really push, really assist the county to the importance of expanding long-term care in this area. Okay, thank you. So before you turn your, the motion is for neighboring municipalities. So are you wanting to include uh, other municipalities? Well, I would think neighboring municipalities would include Southgate, Chatsworth, that, Blue Mountains. That touch our yeah, borders. Yeah, okay. but I'm open to discussion. You know, we want to be fully inclusive here, but uh, I would think that that's what I was thinking that was it touch our borders. Touch our are, borders. Are okay. in the geographical area of, of that catchment area. All right, thank you. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair Allen, to Mayor McQueen and his motion and this motion. Yeah, I agree with touching the neighboring boundaries. We'd want to be careful that we didn't like. Ironically, we want support of the full county, but we have to make sure we don't get too many county council members on this group so that there would be a perceived conflict there. Um, but I would think if we reached out to just the neighboring municipalities that border ourselves, um, we could probably get supports um, that would, would be within that, that limitations. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, Councillor Oliver. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you to the mayor. 
you know, I, I agree in circulating the terms of reference, and uh, but my concern is that uh, isn't there a use it or lose it uh, with those those beds and a date and a deadline? I mean, we may be well. This may well result in us looking for a, a new application for more beds because I think quite possibly uh, what's happened up at county is going to result in uh, the existing allocation being applied somewhere else. But am I wrong in that? Or? I think there is a a date, um, but this is better than just sitting back and waiting for the county to do something. Absolutely, you know, I, I agree with. Let, let's gauge the interest and uh, yeah. but I'm just wondering whether or not we're going to be applying for new beds and rather than trying to keep the beds that are already allocated but either way we should proceed we need to thank proceed. you yeah so okay Mr. Mayor two points of clarity that was my notice of motion that was in February was asking county council to bring back a report following up our our, our uh, delegation in, in January just to uh, report and, and maybe keep the ministry up to date and not just yeah i think that is a concern that we all had when we left that delegation was use it or lose it and i think it's i think proactively and i'm looking at this as being proactively is 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 to develop and, and try to bring communication to the county that we understand it's a cost but we want to be in dial or um, dialogue with the province to say and I, I think part of that discussion and part of the discussion, if you've seen it, the county is, this is something that's been rolled across the province and there's a lot of communities looking at expanding and there's only so many contractors out there too. So there's a whole lot of dynamics around and the cost, right? But I think it's going back to what Councillor Allwood is, is saying is that's, that's a big concern, use it or lose it. And also when I brought it forward to the county was another option because it was explained that when the county did make that application in 2020, when I was warden, that they made it as, as a, an application to um, uh, a, a health hub or, or a big picture of building a brand new Gray Gables and then Gray Gables that's currently here would be uh, uh, moved into assisted living. I think there's other options. The option that I could look at uh, is, is expanding the wing and, and just looking at just getting funding for those beds because you don't get funding to take the 66 beds here and building a new facility. That's, that was sort of some of the conversation that happened back maybe August of 2021 at the County of Gray. So I just think, I don't wanna get into a lot of detail, but I think there's, there's reasons to have this committee to have those conversations and look at the big picture. And this is a, a big picture thing. This is not about Verhounds. I will say one other comment, Mr. Chair. I think the deputy mayor did receive some criticism that well, why was Gray Highlands um, making a delegation about a county owned facility. But I think part of it is, is I think it's the interest of the county of Gray is made up of nine municipalities. And if there's interest from the nine municipalities or part of that, I think it still warrants that. I don't think that, that lower tier municipalities can be, can be uh, sidelined not, not to inquire about things that are in either in their municipality or in their region of, their, of the County of Gray. So, yeah, okay. it's pressing. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Question of clarity, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mayor. So this is passed. Next steps, um, don't recall reading it, but next steps would be then the invitation would go out Okay, and with the terms of reference and all that stuff, I don't know the clerk. Okay, fine, thanks. Okay, the next item, 9.7 Town Hall Forum, annual locations and timing. The council received, um, I'm gonna just uh, suggest that we discuss first. <laughs> okay. So who'd like to open up the discussion? Deputy Mayor, sorry. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, I'm very pleased to see this come forward. I think it is exactly what this council discussed in terms of trying to have town hall forums, public engagement. Um, I think that this is uh, a good way for council to lead discussions and have discussions with the community. Um, I think having the 
set day of the month and the time works in the sense of allowing the community to prepare any questions or comments you might have and be ready for it. It'll take time for that build to happen, just like any kind of community event or community discussion. Um, but I'm excited to see. I was also excited to see within the report that the scheduling was to circulate around the municipality and the, and the suggestion of the first um, seven locations being significantly spread out across municipal halls and arenas and not just your usual suspects, I would say, in terms of locations for town hall meetings. Um, I was very, uh, very happy to see the report the way it came through and have no problem supporting it. But as a chair's request, we'll allow discussion to continue. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Councillor Dubik. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, so, so yes, I, I agree. I think this is um, a great way for us to be face to face with community, um, and you know, continue to strengthen those relations and those conversations and those direct conversations. Um, I do wonder in terms of the timing. So, so I do think um, staff being very thoughtful again about you know timing, you know, quarterly meetings and and locations. Um, just putting a thought out there. Um, August is typically a very, you know, um, uh, a heavy vacation time and wondering, um, you know, if we may want to consider moving the August meeting to September, um, you know, when most kind of folks are around. And the clerk has an answer for that. Thank you so much. Clerk Martel. We did actually take that into consideration. It was one of those things, but we also discussed that it is also a time where a lot of our secondary seasonal residents are here. So we didn't want to take away that availability for the summer seasonal residents to have an opportunity to meet with council as well. You know, that, that, that is a good point. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Allwood. Uh, thank you, Chair Allen. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm encouraged to see the, uh, the quarterly meetings moving around our uh, municipality, but uh, I would hope that this is just a baseline and that, you know, we could call a town hall if issues uh, become timely and uh, we want to, we want to engage the public. Uh, so while uh, I support having these four, I, I hope that we're not removing the option of, uh, of uh, scheduling additional town halls if required. I from here, I can see our clerk and our CAO, and I Fringe. saw nods from both of them. So that's uh, affirmative nods, I'm hoping. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Deputy Mayor. I uh, thought a question just came to my mind, Chair Allen. Um, for if council is wanting to direct the agenda of the town hall, so in other words, if we want to say there's a focus on five items for discussion purposes for people to bring in would it be required for council to have the discussion as a body or is it possible to have that agenda made up outside of a council meeting and the reason i bring that up is because this is actually suggesting may 16th being our first one at the osprey community center if there were items that council members wanted to have as part of the talking points on that particular night, would we have to make that decision today um, to be able to set that agenda? Or is it something that could be done outside of the actual formal sitting of a council meeting? So, okay. Um, well, my thought with, with um, the town hall is that the residents speak on what they want to speak on, that we don't set the agenda. That's my, my thinking. Because you know, if we set the five, there'll be one that they wanted to speak about that we'll get criticized for. But Clerk Martel? Uh, we're on the same page with that, um, Councillor Allen. Um, I believe that's the thing. You, you don't want to limit your public from speaking to you. Um, however, if you get into a situation where there's a hot button topic, Council could then say, we want to schedule a separate meeting for a hot button topic and we'll schedule it for this date related to the, the, these agenda topics. But these ones were meant to be just the open ended come to speak to Council for anything that you kind of wanted, that the residents wanted to speak on. Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I don't know who's been on the 
table here has been in, we have done these two terms ago. And a couple things, I, I, I think there's some merit to what the deputy mayor is saying, because if you want feedback, what a better time to get feedback if you want it. Number two is they have to be chaired and they have to be chaired in an orderly matter because if you don't, it's a free for all. It has to be orderly, there has to be, and I would suggest that myself chair it. And the simple fact is that kind of the procedure bylaw, I have the authority, if somebody gets out of hand, we can shut it down or whatever, blah, blah. Not to say we're heavy handed. No, but sometimes things can get out of hand. And there's the respect of, the, of our democracy in the sense that there's ability to do that. Um, so in the past, what we've done is what, what uh, somebody's got ahead of him here, Tom, maybe, maybe Paul. Um, and I remember Osprey, exactly, you know, is we gave a little bit of a high level. This is what's happening. This, 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 just to sort of give a little bit of a communication because it's it, what better time to communicate to your residents It's say, this is what's happening. What this is what's happening. Clerk's part is this planning. We're doing a zoning bylaw review. You know, it's a good time to come out with those high level points that we're doing because communication is so critical. So I think that, you know, I think that maybe through the process of a bit of a 10 minute address of what's happening that could be in there is that there's items that you want to sort of tell the people and then, then, then it sort of triggers the opportunity to feedback. But absolutely you want the ability to, if there's a burning issue, they, they raise it, but there has to be orderly fashion. and. I think we got to be careful. Again, this is the part about properly chairing it. Is it's not an attack on a council person or attack on if staff are there. I'm not sure if the staff how that format is going to be. If staff's going to be there or, or whatever, but we've got to make sure it's 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 um, in a process that's civil. I'm not saying it won't be, but it just has to be orderly done in a very orderly fashion. And that you know we're coming out to the public you know four times a year this is a great opportunity to connect engage with your council this is a and that's the positive thing that we want to portray so i'll leave it at that Mr. Jay. oh the one thing i did say up august yeah i think we could try it this august and see how it works if there's you know we think we can move it. but i the only thing on the date was um, i was looking on the calendar i don't know when amo is in 2024 because I, I think we're august 20th and it, it meets it it passes in 2023 but i just wasn't sure because it wasn't in my calendar i never googled it so i don't know when that is that's that would be the only thing is, is if it falls because around the 20th sometimes emo can fall around the 15th to the 20th and you obviously you know obviously we would know that ahead of time before we book our calendar times and stuff like that but that's the only thing i thought i don't know what was it like after 20th 21st yeah. but it's this is for the 20th isn't it Next year. Next year. Yeah, 2024. Yeah, August 20th, 2024. August 18th, then 21st. So that's going to be right on the same time. So that's that that that'll have, should probably be we moved can, up. We've got lots of time, yeah. obviously, to change that. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any comments from our clerk on the mayor's comments about chairing and other items? Uh, no, not necessarily. Other than uh, I believe he's 100% correct that. There should be a chair. Somebody has to focus the discussions and make sure things are coming back and forth um, because it's not a council meeting, the procedure bylaw or a committee meeting. Procedure bylaw really doesn't take effect. However, it, you are council, you are the board of directors for this organization, and you have the right to uh, ask somebody to leave one of the premises by the municipality at any time for disorderly conduct. Um, yes, bang that gavel. Um, I think this is a, a very good initiative. Um, the other thing I will say is if there is recent things that a council member, um, further to what Deputy Mayor has said, if there is a council member that wanted to make sure that something was addressed at the meeting or whatever, if they wanted us to put out on the notice for the thing, for the thing, sorry, um, the notice for the town hall forum, um, we can say uh, you'll receive a brief update on this, this, and this, and then it's open to discussion with your council member. So um, I don't think you need a meeting to discover, dis discern that information if if Councillor Allen is going to be bringing forward an update of, of the activities of the CLS departments, then that can be included on there if, you know, those kinds of things. So um, I don't think that has to be formalized with everybody on board. Thank you. Another comment, Mr. Mayor? Just a quick comment. Uh, this council, um, council, we've uh, implemented um, a strong chair position like on our council. Proof of thought, I don't know two things. 
does each chair want to give a little two minute blurb if that's what your communication because i think that really shows the public that we have a council that's engaged secondly i don't know if you want to have comments like if it was a roads issue the director or the chair of you know i don't know I, i'm just thinking out loud but I, it shows that there's good engagement it doesn't like i said about chair just in order the orderly but i'm just saying and i just throw that out i don't know what kind of dialogue you want we're just receiving we don't want to get into debate i'm just open i'm just asking for that question do you want to be careful with this though that we're not you're not in a council meeting yes. and you're not getting you're not stating a position on things. You can speak about things that have already happened in the past that are not coming forward, but anything that's going to be before council, we have to make sure that we're not stating opinions and trying to get people on the same pages. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Lohan. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair Allen. I, I think that there's some uh, value to actually sort of, you know, um, I, keeping these town halls particularly informal, right? I think that there's a, it's a bit of a barrier to entry for the, the public um, dealing with the, the formality and the procedural nature of council meetings in general. And I think that the more this uh, mimics a, a council meeting and the procedure that we all, that we, you know, we must and for good reason undertake here in, in these chambers, I think it's, it's best, um, you know, informal um, to have a sort of, uh, you know, dialogue with our friends and neighbors and um, community members here in Great Highlands. I agree. I was even thinking that perhaps if we were setting up these new committees where, um, and, and I'm thinking that we may have somebody kind of assigned to each area, maybe when we go into that area, that person chairs. Um, but anyways, those are all details we can work out. So the reason I wanted to, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Dubik. Uh, thank you, Chair Allen. Um, so, so just to echo that informality, um, you know, I, I would cautious us, you know, we serve, you know, having, you know, these kind of many presentations at the start, all of us going through it, because I think that can really um, eat into time when the I think the um, the objective is really to keep the dialogue open and have, um, you know, our residents and our constituents, you know, um, coming up, you know, to, um, you know, to ask questions or, you know, provide comment and feedback, um, you know, again, like the concept of, you know, a five, 10 minute maybe introduction about things that have happened, what we're working on, uh, you know, what's going forward. Um, and even if, you know, again, if, if the mayor, you know, will chair the, these meetings, you know, I think it's easy for maybe the mayor I don't want to put the mayor on the spot, um, you know, but to do that intro, do that five, 10 minute intro, you know, on behalf of all of us to keep it really simple and succinct, um, open up the floor and then, you know, and then um, councillors and members of council, you know, can, you know, respond, you know, as per, you know, area of, area of expertise and take it away from there. Okay, thank you. All right, so the reason I wanted to have a discussion first, um, was I, 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 as chair, I, I can't amend them to the motion, but I thought about perhaps, and this was brought up last term, I believe by Deputy Mayor um, Desai, that perhaps we schedule um, a town hall in the high school, in addition to these um, locations. It would have to be during the day during school hours. So just wondered what people think about that. And if somebody wanted to make, add that to the motion, um, I would uh, accept that motion. <laughs> Mayor McQueen. You can always pass the chair back to me. Yes, that's true. That. That's true. Sorry, you can always pass the chair back to me. We should do that. Um, when's municipal or government week? There's a certain week in the year that that's there's government to me that would be the time to do that because it's all tying into the uh, education uh and maybe not just necessarily at high school it could be like uh, an opportunity and i'm thinking at the public school but public school do get involved i remember one time i was at a thing at mcphail and there's my picture on the wall that somebody drew and it was government week 
as the mayor, you know, so they are engaged. Just throwing darts at it. Well, <laughs> didn't see any holes, but you never know, right? But, but I, I think I think there's a lot of merit to that, uh, and maybe you start there. And and I think it's hard for this for the six months because you got to get it booked in. But I think that's something that uh, I would certainly I'll let somebody else put that on the floor. But I would support that. Okay. But is, there is a government week. I don't know when that is, but there is a government week. Okay, CAO Govan. Uh, thank you, Chair Allen. Um, so we do um, invite the uh, younger uh, elementary school kids in uh, to, to do a mock council meeting and, and to talk to them about civics and uh, local government. Um, I think um, Councilor Allen's suggestion of the high school, I mean, you've got uh, kids who are approaching voting age or if not voting age. And I think the idea is to encourage our high school, uh, you know, um, children to get involved in local politics. So I, I think, you know, they're at that age where they're ready to go out and vote. And I think it would be an excellent opportunity to get in front of them and, and talk to them. Yeah, I'm just looking at, um, so the, um, we obviously have to do that during the school year, during the school day, um, and maybe just after school gets back in, perhaps the third week of October. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair Allen. I think, um, so I was prepared to move a motion, but then you uh, mentioned the specific date. I think it's important to realize that we cannot book ourselves into the school. So the motion I think would be that um, council directs, so that council receives staff report CLS 2323, and that council directs staff to move forward with the scheduling of the town hall forums quarterly on the third Tuesday of the month at 5 p.m. And that staff be directed to reach out to the high school, Great Highland Secondary School, to gauge interest in having a municipal town hall forum at the high school during a school day on a date of their choosing. Okay. Now we can take out the uh, on a date of their choosing, but I think that's the goal is we're going to have to reach out to the high school. We're going to have to have conversation with the principal, which classrooms are doing civics that might have, have to uh, engage this and then get support from the school itself. I think it's a fantastic idea. Um, I think C CAO Govan uh, had a good point about um, capturing their interest or trying to capture their interest in municipal politics right before they're hitting that voiding age. Um, I'd be excited to see the topics that the students bring up um, and which ones they would understand fall within municipal guidelines and don't fall within municipal guidelines. So I'm excited about that as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for bringing up this concept, uh, Chair Allen. Okay, thank you. Um, Clerk Martel, would you, could you read that motion back? Please? So I just wonder for point of order, should this be a motion after this is dealt with? Because that's sort of, it's, we don't, we can't schedule it. I think it's a separate motion that would make that request uh, to edit. I don't I think know. that's clear in the motion. Uh, thank you. That council receives staff report CLS 2323 and the council directs staff to move forward with scheduling the town hall forums quarterly on the third Tuesday of the month at 5 p.m. And that staff be directed to reach out to Gray Highland Secondary School to gauge interest in holding a special town hall forum for students, potentially during local government week. Sounds good to me. The seconder for that. Councillor Wickens. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor. I have, I have no problem with the motion. I like that. I have no pro problem with the motion. I just got two texts here that May 16th is the Harvest Cafe for the library. That is a major fundraiser for the, the library, which is the same night as what we're talking about this town hall. Yes, that is true. So, I, so I'm thinking right away we got a conflict and we know that is a fundraiser for that. For that. So I'm thinking um, could the 18th, I know it's going out. I know you have to get it out there to advertise, but I'm thinking I just got two messages saying that's a Harvest Cafe night. And I think that's not a yes. good night to, to have conflict. I agree. Councillor Lowhead. 
just food for thought, throwing it out there. Is it a possibility that we might be able to combine the two, you know, come for the, the town hall, stay for the fundraiser? I mean, honestly, there's going to be a lot of, if there's going to be a lot of people there, um, it could be a, a nice opportunity to, uh, to complete the two. Just thinking that through. Mr. Mayor. Well, I know that generally they use up a speaker. They have a, a group of people that bring food. It's sort of their own event. It's full at the, it's usually filled, it's full. Um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, it's not a bad suggestion, but unless it was earlier on the day, but I, I just think that it, for the, in fairness to them, they're already booked, they're probably advertising and all that kind of stuff. So I think uh, we want to, we want many friends. We don't want, <laughs> we want to keep everybody happy. So I don't know if the 18th works for people. I know it's sort of hard because you did a Google a Google poll. It's booking, it's staff, it's a lot of things. I just think that and maybe we take a break. I guess you can't take a break during a motion on the floor. Maybe uh, I guess you could, but I, I just wondered if we, I think we need that conversation. Yeah, or do we move it to June? Gives, uh, it's pretty tight anyways. Like it's, it's the third today. Um, uh, it's only, less than two weeks two weeks yesterday so um what do you think about moving it to june whatever date that would be we'd have to check to make sure facilities are available sorry councilor wickens yeah thank you uh, chair ellen i don't think we have a farm safety meeting on the 18th mr mayor no may hey. oh yeah i think we're yeah. Councillor Dubik. Uh, thank you. Um, so wondering if we can maybe just take this offline and do it via Doodle and find uh, an alternate date that may work for all. Except we need to have this finalized if we're going to have it soon. Clerk Martel. Uh, thank you. The resolution as proposed does not actually say May 16th is the first date that was listed in the report. Um, so what we can do is after this one, is, if this resolution gets passed as it is, uh, we can actually post the date and then we'll put beside the May 16th date to be rescheduled due to conflict. And then we'll come up with, we'll send out a poll and we'll come up with a date okay. for the rescheduling. All right, that sounds good. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, we did, did, we had a motion and did we have it seconded? Yes. Okay. All those in favor. Great. That's carried. Thank you. A few minute break. Watch out break. Um, how about if we do Kinburn? I don't think it'll be very long. Let's do Kinburn street and then we'll break before we have the planning policies update. If that's okay. All right. Um, so the next one, Kinburn street road allowance. The council received staff report CLS 23.25, Kinburn Street Road Allowance Finalization, and the council approved bylaw 2023-056, being a bylaw to close part two and ratify the purchase and sale agreements, and that the remaining revenue from the sale of the properties after expenses have been paid be placed in the land sales reserve. Anybody want to put that on the floor? Councillor Dubik and Councillor Wickens, thank you. Um, discussion, this has been in the works for, started, what, 73 years ago? <laughs> uh, with the, yes. <laughs> Comments, I think uh, we're, Deputy, or sorry, Mr. Mayor. I think when we meet this past, we should buy the, the clerk and staff a little cupcakes. Of thank you <laughs> for all the hard work they've done on this and all the other stuff. <laughs> it's been a long process. Okay, no discussion. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Yes, thank you. Good work, everybody. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, so 9.9, .9, we'll take a break before we get into that. And um, it's 11.24 is is 10 minutes okay? Um, so okay. we'll say 11, well, we'll say 11.35. Is that okay? Okay, great.
Okay, thank you. It's 11.35, so we're back. And we are at item 9.9, .9, planning policies update report. And again, I think perhaps we'll have the discussion first, if that's okay, and then make the, the motions. So will we start out with a presentation? Is there a presentation or is our manager of planning here just to answer questions? I'm just here for questions. Okay, all right. Okay, so I'll open it up to council. Okay, not seeing anything. <laughs> 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 Deputy Mayor. I feel like I try to put my hand up too fast and lead the discussions on a lot of these. I, I would like to first say thank you very much to staff for the fulsome report and the discussion points that are here and presented. There are some significant concerns with the potential passing of the provincial um, planning statement and the way that it may or may not affect Great Highlands um, rural municipality. There are significant, like I was just having a discussion with some of my fellow colleagues around this table. I'm the owner of a 28 acre parcel of land right on Great Road 4. My parcel should not be able to be severed. There is hazard lands to the one side of me. There is county lands to the other side of me. And if these policies went through, there would be nothing stopping me from severing off two two acre parcels. I own 28 and a half acres, easily able to sever off two two, and a, two two acre parcels. Those parcels would be large enough to be serviced by septic and, and wells, but it would deteriorate the rural nature of the landscape of Great Highlands, the agricultural nature because part of my lands are a one agricultural it would deteriorate the efforts that have been put in place for decades to protect farmlands and the nature of rural Ontario there's some significant concerns with what is being um, suggested here not to mention the fact that the policy itself says, you have no choice but to be, you cannot be more restrictive. Council has always had the option to be more restrictive than policies so that we can um, have specific planning directions and policy ideas that suit the differences in regions across this province. And instead we have a policy that says, you cannot be more restrictive. Can, can I just jump in there and Go ask our manager on that point? We can be more restrictive than the county official plan. Can we be more restrictive than the provincial, what it's called now, provincial policy statement? Yes, except for this policy, because then they have a subsequent line that says official plans and zoning bylaws shall not contain provisions that are more restrictive than policy 4.3.1. 4.3.3.1a, except to address public health or safety concerns. Right, but were we previously, right now, can be, we can't be more restrictive than a provincial policy, can we? You can always be more restrictive provided you do not conflict. So an example is the OFDUs, the on-farm diversified uses. We are much more restrictive than what the framework the province has set out would suggest. Um, I believe I, I've been told through, I think, council members and, and county staff that when we did our plan, there was discussion at the time, can we just say no OF, OFDUs? That would be a conflict because the, the province provides direction to permit those things, but we say they're going to be a max size of whatever and on a size of whatever. So that's being more restrictive, but not conflicting. Okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt. You're, turn your mics off now. Thank you very much, Chair Allen. That's a perfect question to ask. So if we're looking at the staff report here, 4.3.31a is the provision that says new residential lots created from a lot or parcel of land that existed on January 1st, 2023. It doesn't specify 
what's part of another parcel that existed, um, how it has been historically severed from other lots. That's a big concern. This could really encourage, you know, further to our water and wastewater, my comments that our ability to guide and direct the growth in Grey Highlands. This policy would prevent our ability to guide and direct growth within this municipal boundaries. And I understand that the staff report itself, due to the limited time that the province allows for comments, which is an intentional objective, that staff are recommending we, we partner with the county and have a, a county response to the PPS. It is unfortunate that we don't have the time to properly um, surmise and put together a Grey Highlands um, specific response. And I and I, it's not staff's fault. I respect the fact that staff are trying to deal with our zoning bylaw and a lot of other things and the amount of time it would take to properly put together um, a response to the, the province on this one. So I do agree with what staff are recommending, which is to work with the county into creating a, a response because the rural nature of Gray County as a whole. Um, but yeah, there's there's logically significant concerns with what the private province is directing. And when you add it in addition to some of the other, um, like Bill 23 and the goals there, you could see significant growth in rural municipalities, in rural areas that have never seen growth like this and have never seen severances just because the province says we need houses. And I don't disagree we need houses, but you have to be logical on where you're trying to put them. To have you know, hundreds of lots get created across a municipality in an attempt to say it's gonna produce the right type of housing is not a logical response to the crisis we're in. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Councillor Dubik. Uh, thank you, Chair Allen. Um, so I'll just echo that, um, the comments that Deputy Mayor Nielsen had, has made. Um, you know, I think it is unfortunate how um, the provincial government is pushing down um, new rules on this in a, in a very um, quick manner um, without sort of the, some good um, collaborative discussions about how to achieve goals. Um, you know, what is these changes will change the landscape, you know, of the municipality. It will change how our rural area looks. Um, you know, it, it, you know, our, un, our uniqueness, um, you know, may be at risk here. Um, do support, um, you know, our staff working with the county to respond, um, you know, to these, uh, to these policy changes. Um, you know, I think that is the most effective way to do that, given the short time. Um, and as staff has pointed out, um, you know, if we do want to increase you know, the, our, our voices and um, comments, you know, councillors individually can also write, you know, to, to the province. Um, um, and, and so that is something that, you know, I, I will also do. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Other comments? <laughs> Councillor Wickens. Well, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here. I guess, um, as uh, Councillor Dubik said, uh, changes are coming and uh, change is inevitable. It doesn't matter. It changes. Everything changes every day. And uh, sometimes I agree with Deputy Mayor <coughs> Nelson. Sometimes I don't. This time it's, it's, it's a not. I mean, how much, uh, how much government intervention do you want in your life? you know, being told what to do with your land when the province says it's, it's legal to separate. And, and we're talking about family farms. Family farms, the role of the family farm has changed drastically. And uh, I know uh, I, I am so connected with this. I um, farm myself and, and uh, as luck would have it, uh, I guess our, our father, or my father-in-law, 
he uh, he severed off two lots of the family farm. So I like my two daughters, they have a place to build, um, you know, if they want to stay in the area. And I know of lots of people that are connected to their home. And, and uh, I know of one instance that's going on right now, a young lady's trying to build a home and uh, she wants to put it on her family farm. Uh, she calls it the gravel pit where, you know, they don't farm it. And she thinks it would be an excellent place for a home, which I would tend to agree. And uh, I don't know. Uh, just uh, government, government, it just keeps, the thin edge of the wedge just keeps pushing in. And uh, we've all talked about it, you know, how much government control do we want in our life? If they're building the home and, you know, they satisfy everybody, you know, they've got the room for the septic and they've got a place for a well and I'm all for it. Thanks. Thank you. A question for our manager of planning. Years ago, people used to be able to, as Councillor Wicken said, um, sever off a, a lot off the corner of their farm and retire there. The problem that came up in the future was when that farmer that retired there um, left for whatever reason, then somebody else came along and bought it perhaps from the city and didn't like the idea of manure and cows looking over the fence and things like that. So was that taken into consideration when they stopped allowing severances or was it more to protect farmland or a little bit of both? Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I, my degree is actually in rural planning from Guelph. So this was, um, no severing and ag lands was like the, the most sacred of things that was ever discussed as being in the PPS. And my professor, I think is actually, I believe he's one of the people who's pretty instrumental in, in having those policies change the provincial level. But the theory behind not allowing them is there's, you know, we live on a three dimensional plane. There's concession blocks that were in existence, 10 lots per block for the most part. There's a fixed, fixed amount of land, fixed amount of arable land to grow food from which we eat and our society relies upon to function. And to sever a lot gives a, an injection of funds to a farmer, you know, in the short term. Let's also separate ag land from rural land. So we got rural lands that are recognized as being more marginal. And we have loads of those in Great Highlands. We're probably like a 50-50 split of rural versus ag. There's an acceptance that... The, the same problems don't exist to the same degree in rural lands as they do in ag lands. Now you can still farm in rural lands and you can still cause conflict. So what you've discussed is, is, is one of them. You, you build a lot, that person then has rights to build a house, farms smell bad when they have animals and there's conflict. So the, the province also has a mechanism uh, a uh, control called minimum distance separation that says if you're going to build a new livestock barn, it has to be a minimum distance from a lot line or a sensitive receptor, uh, which then restricts the ability to place a new barn on agricultural lands when you sever off those lots. Instantaneously, a big chunk of the retained land becomes unavailable for a barn. And it's more important for things like hog barns, big chicken barns, because they got a way bigger setback. Uh, it, it can almost sterilize the entire lot, except way, way in the back of the lot, which then adds cost for driveway and all that stuff for the for the farmer. So there's that aspect. Then uh, MDS one, it applies in the same the other direction. You can't make a new lot if it's too close to an existing livestock barn, and that's that's supposed to kind of fix that. But if you if you allow them to happen, that MDS two conflict is there, and it, it sterilizes your your agricultural lands. So there's that aspect, there's taking the literal land out of production. So you take two acres out, six acres, whatever. It's not growing food anymore because it's going to be grass for someone's house. Cumulatively, there's a, a degradation of the public interest is what it's about at the end of the day, because the greater society needs the food to survive. And that's what the planning controls and decisions are, are generally based on. So when we talk about government inter intervention, the justification is upholding a greater public interest. And I, I totally respect private property rights and you have to balance those things. That's the logic behind no severances in ag lands. In my opinion, it's, it's a pretty good logic. It's pretty fair. I, I think allowing them in rural lands, totally fair. Um, but the ag land one is, is different. And long-term, eventually, even if you pass this, everybody does two severances 
50 years from now, nobody can do any severances and you still have the same problem you have today with affordability and farms and, and things like that. So my planning opinion, it's not going to solve anything. Um, the reason I, I've put what I've put in here about it'll be tricky for us to get on board is exactly the discussion so far. It's, it's hard in the period of time for council to, to perhaps come up with an agreed upon comment, right? And I, myself, I can, if directed, provide comments as the manager, but to speak on behalf of council is tricky in the window that we've got, right? Because there's differing opinions here. So that's what I'll say on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow up and then I'll go. I think the mayor is wanting to say a few things. <sighs> thank you. Uh, another uh, scenario is somebody comes up and they're naturalists and they have really good agricultural land and they do nothing with it and it grows up in hawthorns and weeds. So there's all of that land out of production. That's Thank just another have. thought. Yeah. Okay. okay. Anybody else want to speak before the mayor? <laughs> 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 Councillor Lohan. Thank you, Chair Allen. So, uh, I mean, <clears throat> something I think we all heard during this last election cycle was um, that uh, farmland must stay farmland. I heard that repeatedly, whether it was at um, uh, you know the public meetings or face-to-face uh, -face at the door, that um, people are um, in Grey Highlands are afraid <clears throat> that we're losing farmland, and we are something to the tune of about 300 acres per day in Ontario anyway. Um, so I think that this is, you know, obviously on front of mind for a lot of constituents here in Grey Highlands and um, just sort of ruminating on something that Councillor Wickens said about you know, government intervention on, on land and the, the, you know, the sharp end of the wedge. Um, you know, it's also conversely, the other side of that sword is um, uh, allowing people to, allowing the severance of these lands. I mean, I fully understand the, the purpose and the ad advantage in the family farm situation. But um, you know, how long will it be solely for grandchildren or, or children? And how, uh, how often will it be for the express purpose of keeping it within the family and creating that kind of housing? And, um, and so do we not open, you know, do we not allow the sharp end of the wedge in for simply the development of agricultural land by allowing these types of severances? So um, I think it's a double-edged sword. And I, I guess I just, we need to, I think we need to proceed very cautiously with this kind of policy. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I don't think I have enough time before lunch, but I do well, want to- I'm, I'm actually hoping that um, council and staff will uh, agree to finish this topic before lunch. I guess it depends how long it goes, but um, uh, we'll give it a try anyways. Well, I do want to- uh, secondary thing that hasn't been discussed is it does talk about the secondary plan so I'll address that one first and that might just take us to lunch um, is uh, it was suggested that and I think I was one of the ones that suggested that part of this report talks about the process of a secondary plan I must cl add clarity because in my attention and it did bring uh, Matt did bring it up here that there was a secondary plan for the Beaver Valley area in 1993 in my mind, it was a secondary plan for the region, not just the Talisman lands, it was for the region. And that was something that I talked about a few terms back in council, just in general sense, because of the water system and everything there. So I just wanted to, you know, I, I know that it's, it says there about the Talisman lands, but in my mind, it was similar to, and it, I forget what page it is, and, and Matt mentioned it, in 1993, there was a, a Beaver Valley plan. And to me, that was always something that obviously there was a plan for the Beaver Valley area. But I think even before that would have been Artemisia and Euphrasia. I don't know if it was a Beaver Valley plan even before. I don't even think Artemisia had official plan. They had zoning before amalgamation, but I don't think they had an official plan before zoning. But there was a Beaver Valley plan. Obviously, there's probably history of where that it would be really interesting how that got established. Of what, what created the Beaver Valley plan. Anyway, just as a, as a, I, I just sort of wanted to point that out that that's where my mind was when I asked that to be coming forward in a report that it's for the bigger area because in the Beaver Valley we have we have the Beaver Valley Ski Club we have the Talisman Lands we have Beaver Valley or uh, Kimberly itself we mean we we counsel in the past of, of, of even through our master servicing plan looked at servicing Beaver Valley you know as your possibilities of development in between that 
it's a big picture that was always in my mind. And, and obviously um, the process has been laid out, what that would look like. And then obviously I, I just wanted to. Uh, it, it does, Mr. Mayor, it does say in the thing about, it was for the Beaver Valley. It didn't specify just Talisman land. So oh, I thought I was reading it. It said here. Page 13. A, yeah, but if I read 12 through you, it says staff estimated that implementing a secondary plan for the tal Talisman property would realistically take at least two years. So it does speak specifically to say Talisman property. Yes, a future one. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So that's the but part the of the existing one is for the Beaver Valley. So sorry. So that's where I was saying it in my mind. Yeah. It was the bigger, the bigger picture, yeah. not just and I think there's a there is an interesting comment that is made here that from a perspective of the municipality just selling that lands and then turning around and putting restrictions on a particular property, I think is, is problematic. But that's what I'm saying in the generality of the whole area, you know, I think the municipality or council could do that but i think you have to be very careful of, of doing selling something and then all of a sudden putting restrictions on something i think that could be if it's site specific generally i don't think it would be i think generally you would have that ability to move forward um in the valley itself and and and, and because i think you got to be careful in that sense okay so so I've lived this. I've been a farmer all my life. I grew up on a farm. My dad's still on the farm where I grew up. My kids are on the farm. They want to farm. You talk about protecting farmland to make it feasible that a farmer can make a living without having to have off farm income because it doesn't work. It does not work. So whether a farmer has severed a lot for his parents or whatever, it keeps the family together. I mean, I'm so fortunate that our family, my dad's still, my mom and dad's still on the farm. My kids want to farm. It's a unit. The Mullen family, they have multi-generations and it's sort of criticized on the 12th line, but they are a family together. So to start off with, I strongly feel that if the province wants to preserve farmland, then they need to have incentives to make farming a full-time profession that you can live and work on the farm. It's not there. Province of Quebec does have subsidies that allow farmers to farm. Put it in perspective, a few years back, when we started hearing $20,000 an acre down by London, holy smokes, 20,000 acres, that's $2 million for a 100 acre farm. That's here now. Try buying a two or $25,000 an acre farm and try to farm. It doesn't work. It does not work. And so, yeah, I think realistically, I think, uh, Matt has said it in his report, there could be a hundred applications. I don't doubt it because you know what? You're a long time dad. And I'm saying that I know it's been a struggle. I've all my life, I've had to have an off farm, whether I'm blowing snow or I'm council, I'm doing contracting work to support the family farm. And that is so true across the province. So when I hear people say, oh yeah, we need, and I'm not saying, I'm saying generally, and I'm, let's get you council head, but we need to provide, preserve agriculture lands. Sure. Then make it so then it's, it's, it's realistically that you can support yourself on that farm. I don't know, the, the OFA came out with a report. And maybe I'm going to get more in a hypothetical talk here, but OFA came out in a report that in the next 10 years, 40% of the farmers are going to either retire or be gone. What happens then? I tell you, my boys can't go out and spend $2.5 million on a hundred acre farm unless they got a really good job. And you know what? When I got married, my wife said, yeah, you know, I married a farmer. And she said, if I knew a farmer worked all this time, I would maybe think in second guess because what's a farmer do? You work all the time and you work out to provide, to buy that farm. It's a lifetime commitment. And I don't have any regrets for doing that, but I tell you, it's, it's, you know, Obviously, I, I'm, I'm wealthy because I've worked hard and, and have agricultural land, but, and I say that in tongue in cheek, but the thing is, well, I'm just saying is, but it, today for any young person to go out, I've told my boys, if you want to buy a farm, you better get a good job because there's no way. So, so there, this is the crutch that we're in. And so the family farm versus corporate farm, Matt and I were talking a bit about this. So yes, the corporate farm today can be run from a 400 horsepower tractor driving a GPS indicator that can plant that 100 acres in, in eight hours. 
providing there's nothing in the way. But that's that's maybe more generalizing in Southern Ontario where you have tracts of land that they're well, one thing we have in Gray County, it's called stones and fields and aggregate, or there's a lot of things in the way. So it's not, and that's probably a big part. And I was on the bus in 1997 when we drove through, well, at the time it was Osprey and other municipalities to, of how it was determined what was ag and what was rural. And it was, it was no tabletop dis discussion. It was inside of a car driving around and each reeve of that municipality determined, well, that's ag and that's rural. And basically if there was a chunk of land that was determined that it was 600 acres or more than it was egg. And if it was less, rural. Each reeve had a different perspective and Artemisia's egg lands are different than Oshby's egg lands and Euphrasia's different egg lands. That's just a little bit of a history there. So, and then in 2005 and well, 1991, the province came back and said, Gray County, you got to stop all these severances. And they shut it down for a while. And then they put policy in place and, and, and created things and played it to carry that. So, that's why I have three farms with three, three lots off three farms. I live beside a subdivision that has five acre lots. It can work. And I'll tell you something. You talk about the social and economic drivers of your municipality. I know they talk about taxation and the cost of servicing for those lots. We just passed a development charge uh, bylaw that's now, which wasn't in place 30 years ago. MDS wasn't in place 30 years ago. Deputy Mayor, you said about the, on your property, there's a lot of constraints that will still factor in. If there's wetlands, if there's MDS, I think the MDS will still stay with this policy, I think, right? I don't know, hold that thought. So, so but the economics, okay. We talk about our schools. You talk about our, our arenas. We talk about our community centers. And we're struggling. We have four of them. If we don't have people using them, well, we are gonna to have to make a tough decision. We talk about taxation. On that 100 acres, I would say there's probably $15,000 comes in taxation of those three lots that have houses on them versus probably 1,800 that comes from a farm. Bruce County ran into this a few years back where they didn't have the severance policy. I'm just giving a perspective here. Um, they have a higher residential tax rate no, a higher, higher agricultural tax rate because they don't have the residential portion of that of the county. Three years ago, at the county, there was a request to lower the tax rate. You remember this, Madam CEO, from 25% to 21.9, I think that's where it's at today. That was on the basis of residential lands. 70, I think 75% of the taxation comes from residential lands. If you had, if that was a shift, so, that was that supporting agriculture. What's supporting it? The residential portion of that, just because that was a policy or a discussion that the county made a decision to change it from 0.25, I think it went to 2.22 and then finally went to 0.219, okay, or whatever. And that's a shift in taxation. So your residential portion is covering, so there's a bit of subsidy for the agricultural side. Okay, so probably a lot of people didn't realize that, but the economics, of, of, you know, I know on one, one of my farms, there's three families there that, that, that their father built them the house and they all very, part, very much involved with the local church and they're very big supporters of that local church to keep that church going. If they all left, that church would close. We talk about a school closing here just in 2017. It's about volume and people. There's just there's so many dynamics. And, I, and I, I know we have to have the bigger conversation here they talk about septic and wells. Well, in 2003, the subdivision in Feversham was on a water system, half acre lots. The reason why they were on a water system because they made those lots, when they, that plan was developed in 1970s, they made the lots smaller because they could, they just have a septic bed, but they have a water system. So you can reduce because when you put septic and well together, you've got to have setbacks. Well, you remember what happened to Walkerton? The pendulum swung and all the all the regulations changed. And I don't quote me that. I think the water rates probably for a year at Feversham went from $200 or $300 to probably $1,200. Guess what? Somebody drilled a well. Next guy drilled a well. Everybody drilled a well because they didn't want to pay those high costs for that water system. And now we have, unfortunately, we, we've lost the water system in Feversham. But my point is, however they did it, they figured out a way to put a septic here that was already there in a well. And that's been in place for 20 years on a gorge in Feversham. 
You talk about septic and wells. Well, I'll tell you, the province of Ontario has approved the stuff that comes from Southgate be poured on your land. You want to get neighbors upset. You pour that on your land and for a couple of days, they're pretty outright. You talk about that liquid manure that's poured on your, on your land compared to a septic that is, has, the septic systems have been greatly improved over the last 30 years versus pouring that right on your land. Now it's treated, but you know, you look at a septic, two septics on the corner of your farm versus pouring that over your land, you're going to get, well, you know, anyway. So there's a lot of dynamics. This comment, I'll say, you can have okay. an island on Muskoka and have a 12,000 square foot house and put a septic on. You tell me the receptor of Lake Muskoka with a septic that's surprising 12,000 square foot house. We've got to put things in perspective on that. And I know, I don't know if it was Wayne Cohal, Cohead, Cohal was your, was, was your professor. And I know he was very strong in that, but he had his opinion and others had their opinion as well. So I think in summary, Mr. Chair, I, I think there's a lot of discussion here, a lot of perspective. And I was saying to Matt at break, we can have a different perspective in Great Highlands, we can have a different perspective in Great County, and you can have a different perspective all across the province because there's so many variables that, you know, that can be in play. Going back to the corporate farm, if, if the way of preserving agricultural lands means that it's the corporate farm that buys the farms, uh, basically you're gonna have the barns knocked down, the house is gonna be knocked down and they're gonna be farmed because that's just the way it's gonna be. It, and, and is that what we want? You, you, want a, you want a community with nobody living in it? That's the what, in my mind, in the next 20 to 30 years, if you don't put something in place and you know what, you talk about high intensity farming, well, 150 years ago, up to maybe 1960, everybody, well, I know I grew up on a farm that was 170 acres and my dad had 25 cows on 100 acres. Everybody had a small amount of animals. Today, one farm can have 2,000 animals. You tell me how that is right, that you put 10, there's 2,000 head of cattle on an acre property and that's, that's okay in agriculture. Mind you, you can't allow a septic and a well throughout the countryside. Something is not right there on that perspective because when you do have severances, you do eliminate the high density farming, yeah. which then if, if, if that ever had a hog barn and there was 1200 hogs and that ever broke, you talk about contamination of your water system and that's allowed today. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're in support of, of these severances. Well, I just, I think there needs to be a bigger conversation for the understand. I'm bringing a perspective. Yeah. Others okay. are bringing a perspective. And I think it's important that, and, and Dan knows it because he just brought a perspective and, you know, growing up here and living here and making a living here, that's the way it's, 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 you know, it, it's not just me. There's a lot of people in that same position. And, and last comment, I'll uh, be more comments, but Deputy Mayor, you said about your land, but you wait till your kids get old enough and they want to get have a family and they want us, you know what? I think you have to look at the next generations. And in today's day, you don't have to go to Toronto. You don't have to go to Ottawa to have a job. You can work from home with the internet today. And I think that changes the family, the family structure of, of the family structure that family can stay because Years and years I've been on council and people say, how do you keep your kids from leaving? Because they've got to go off to university, they got to go off. There's nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But that's, you know, each is to their own. But they can't, and you know, nowadays people can't afford to come back. I know we've had people trying to come back. And now uh, one of those two acre lots, house on there is probably worth a million to a million and a half, two, 2.5 million on a farm. I don't know where the future is going to be, of how, unless it's the, it's the bank of mom and dad. <laughs> because how no seriously how I, I, you know, I know or, I, I, or there's another community that's yeah. that is making it but the only reason that community is making it because of shops there has to be off farm income to support there's no way about it you have to have just an interest rates are going up anyway okay so I, i've got two hands down there it is Councillor Allwood has not spoken yet. So if, unless something is in direct response to the mayor's comments, I will go to Councillor Allwood. Thank you, Chair Allen. Just a quick comment on what the mayor said there. I mean, it's getting, the reality is, as Councillor Wickens and the mayor have just said, you know, making a living off a family farm now is, is not the future. It's impossible. I live on a small farm. I, I don't pretend I'm a farmer. I farm, I farm my land, but I don't do that work. 
but um, I'm surrounded by neighbors who have farmed for generations and they've never, they've told me, they've never made a, a dime farming. The, the only investment they have and their, their, their wealth is the property that they own. So we all know that um, the rural and agricultural heritage in Gray Highlands and Gray County is important to us. And, and that's why we live here. And uh, while generations of people have lived here, but what concerns me is, you know, that provincial policy statement has always been the over, overarching planning document. And, you know, they talk about the growth plan. So we were required along with Gray County to have that growth plan. It tells you where you can grow. And in uh, Gray Highlands, primarily serviced area, the settlement, you know, the prime, um, prime settlement areas, Markdale. But what concerns me about this is one, the limited time to respond. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable the kind of changes that you're talking about making here at the provincial level um, and, and the limited time by June the 6th to respond. So, you know, I, I agree with the, um, what's, what's in the agenda here that, you know, that we, we need to, one, there's no point in us pursuing our official plan amendment too aggressively until we find out what the overarching document is gonna look like. I'm very concerned about the lack of control that seems to be apparent here that we cannot be more restrictive now. Um, that takes away any control that we have basically. So it, that overarching document is gonna have a whole different um, consequence for, for our staff and, and for our residents and, and for this council. It's, and, and, you know, to only try and absorb all of that, you know, I'm sure our planning staff <laughs> uh, has been working hard on this, but I, I was at county council and talking to Scott Taylor, just uh, when, when this first came out, I was up there for a, as an alternate and uh, had lunch with Scott and there's huge concerns about this. It, it, uh, it goes beyond a lot of what the mayor was saying. You know, I mean, the, uh, the way farming is today, uh, you're either renting a lot of property and uh, I mean, that's not even efficient because you're still dealing with small acreage. You, you know, most, most of the larger farms now, not so much in Gray Highlands, but to the, the west and south of us are, are huge acreages where they've cleared everything. There's no fence roads, there's no houses, there's no barns. They're working with equipment that costs millions of dollars. It's beyond the scope of the family farm. Um, the feedlots and stuff that we do have in Gray, uh, Gray County at least, uh, you know, that's, that's the way that industry has gone too. But the lack of control in the uh, in the proposed revision to the provincial policy state is of, of great concern. Uh, you know, I agree that uh, you know we don't have the staff here at Gray Highlands. We need to work with the county to respond to this. And I think great. You know, I think from my initial discussions with the with Scott and at the county, which were informal, uh, you know, we, we share a lot of the same concerns. But incredible that uh, June the sixth to comment on this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So in, in the motion, it's got staff to provide, uh, council direct planning staff to provide comment through the co uh, co co yeah, cooperation with county planning staff. Um, I don't think there are options. There are four different clauses, but how like we could, I think, discuss this for the rest of the afternoon. And we're obviously not on the same page either. So how, how, like, I think something that Councillor Allwood just said, the, the ability to be more restrictive, I think is the key point here. Um, it, it wouldn't be so bad if they pass this, but we can be more restrictive, but how are we as seven councillors going to agree on what we direct our manager of planning to convey to the county when there's differences of opinion here. So any, um, <laughs> any words of wisdom here? <laughs> um, I was looking more to staff, no <laughs> offense, <laughs> but uh, um, Manager Rapke. Yeah, so this is kind of the debate that I expected to come up with yeah. writing this and why I, I suggested <laughs> Instead of articulating a letter or having me write something after like a debate uh, with some motion of a position, um, 
you put some faith in staff to go to the county, raise generally, you know, we think we know that there's consequences of agricultural severances. That's why the rule is in place, re-highlighting those, talking about the timeline for comment, how that's a concern. Uh, just, you know, not condemning anything, but raising raising the concerns that we see with it as comment. And the county, county staff, since I've written this report, have already released a report so I don't know, some committee, I don't know if it went to council, they sent it to me. Uh, it's public facing now though, where, where Scott Taylor, the director has summarized county staff's concerns that, and we had a, a meeting uh, with lower tiers and, and the county and went through all the PPS changes. And it pretty much touches on everything that we think is a concern uh, to just submit to the province. We think these are concerns. Here's the comment. This commenting window was really tight. Would appreciate more time uh, before any decision is made. And it's not necessarily a position that the municipality supports or doesn't support the change, but that there's a concern uh, and, the, and the timeline's tight. And to just kind of put some weight behind the county's comments when they submit them to say, you know, the lower tiers are kind of in agreement planning staff, at least with, with what's been summarized here. So is that process okay with, with council? And, and sorry, I'll go to our CAO first then. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Allen. I was just going to suggest that Council can still individually provide comments as well. Right, and, and maybe that's the, the key to this, because as I say, there's, there's definitely differences of opinion. So are we okay with kind of ending this or summing this uh, or coming to an end on this discussion and um, have our planner make comments that he just mentioned and individual councillors can make comments on their own. Mr. Mayor. Well, I think we have to be careful. Your mayor, you're, sorry, yeah, you're- and, and, and I respect uh, <laughs> Manager uh, Rupke on this, but the comments are coming from Great Highlands. I know it's gonna probably be hard to, to convey that, but we are elected officials as well. And the comments are coming from this body. I think the comments should come back to this body. I, 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 that's in a bit of a difficult part because he knows there's a lot of debate on this. And I think, I think you've got to try to generalize the feeling of Gray Highlands, not, I, I think, I think there has to be some, because it, it's our comments from this municipality. Mm -hmm. Cause we are, we are elected. We are as a body. I know individually we'll have those, those comments as well, but there are other parts in this report that I would also like to, like, I look at option four as my, uh, as my one. So, I think there needs to be what I try to bring a perspective of, of just is, is the understanding in Grand Highlands, what is ag and what is rural? I mean, it, it varies. There's a lot of, there's a lot of parts that, and I, and I, I mean, and I said this to Matt this morning that um, I said also, and this is a free for all in the, in the rural land or the ag lands, is that mean then, then the rural lands are more restrictive because Basically, they're only speaking to egg lands. They're not speaking because in egg lands, uh, right now we're only we're restricted to two. It's only speaking to agricultural lands, not rural lands. Uh, something that we have talked about and has been talked to this council and the past council was an amendment to follow up with what the county is, and they have the ability to have three lots per per hundred acres on rural, and we were supposed to bring it forward. I think in the report, Matt, you say that, you know, you have had some amendments. That is the process that it, we've dealt with on, on council. And then it, 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 it makes the amendment and then they can go to the committee of adjustment. My feeling is, I think you need to move forward that because of all of a sudden you get two, three, four amendments. It's going to take up the same amount of time as just doing the amendment to mirror ourselves with the county. And I, I option four speaks to that. So there's a lot of points and maybe they have to be individually, you know, so maybe to start with, I would suggest that uh, our planner makes comments, his comments come back to this body, whether we take action or not, at least, at least we, at least they're here. Uh, I do like them part four is I think he, the, the planning staff needs to move forward with the housekeeping amendment, with the official plan, with relationships to rural consent policy, because we talked about that. A lot of people, a lot of people are, have done it. A lot of people are knocking on, a few people are knocking on the planning door. I just think that it just makes sense because all of a sudden you get two, three, four, five amendments. It's gonna take more time to deal with the amendments than just dealing with the housekeeping, which has to come back to this body for approval. But, um, and yes, we can be more restrictive, but so, Mr. Chair, I want to move a motion that 
the council direct staff to proceed with initiating the housekeeping amendment to the official plan in relation to rural consent policies. I'm moving that right now. No, because I think it's it's all over the map. All the options are are all over the map. I see Matt has his hand, but I just look at there's a lot of different perspectives and all those options that. And I just want to get that one out of the way. <laughs> okay, so where where are you looking here? That's an option page four. 15. Page fifteen. Option four. Just account, the last. Just, yeah, yeah, the last paragraph that council direct staff to proceed. And it, it, it's in there. It's in the communication that it's in the report. And the reason I say that it just makes sense because you're going to get the amendments. And why the time it takes to deal with the amendments because there's a long list of grocery list that, that, that involves with that and we have talked about bringing that forward and we haven't we haven't and i think that's why i'm putting a motion forward is is to move forward with that i mean it still comes back to this body to make that decision okay all right i see a hand up to second that by uh, deputy mayor any discussion on that okay manager rapke just to clarify so the four options um I think I tried to give you uh, the combination for, for two things. So four would be to do kind of the comments and come back to this body and try to get comments coordinated uh, to send our own and also do the housekeeping amendment. And then there's like different combinations. There's also uh, just talk to the county and arrange comments and do the housekeeping amendment, I believe. And then do you know neither of those things, right? So number four would be two things. If if that's uh, what the mayor was was going for, I think he was in support of both of those. Uh, I will change that. Can I change that? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to include. I turn turn your mic on there. Through the clerk, I'd like to include then option four. Is uh, I was trying to do it piecemeal, but yeah, that that sort of I think carries a, a good generalization. It, it allows the report to come forward. It allows it to come back here. It allows the other housekeeping, I think, to move forward. So, yeah. I, Is the clerk know. okay with adding that, or do we need an amendment? We're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Try chairing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I did hear the mayor say recommendation option four. Yes. yes. So yes. I think so. we will in, include the whole of the option. Right. Okay. And it's we had a secondary. Still, still seconding. Yes. So, uh, Manager Rapke, are you you're done with your comments? Yeah. Finished. Okay. Comments from staff uh, from council. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Dubik and then to the deputy mayor. Thank you, Chair Allen. Um, so, looking for some clarification here. So, when we say we, we're going to pursue housekeeping of our OPA, um, given the fact that the provincial called policies um, overrule us. S sorry? Well, they don't yet. P point of clarity. Yeah. We're talking about egg lands. This is rural lands. They're not speaking to egg, to rural land. Or, yeah. Okay, you get clarification yeah, so, so, Manager Rappi. So Go please ahead. clarify. Yeah, so I'll quickly run through the, the OPA uh, suggestion. So in the rural designation, Yeah. We allow two severances per 100 acres, three total, including the retained. The county allows four pro rates, depending on whether or not your original 200. If you're a 200 acre parcel, you get six total at the county, five total here. We've done like three or four of these since I've been here in the last few years. Previous council was friendly to them. I personally don't really care. Like, I think it's fine. I think it would be convenient to align with the county. As a planner, I don't think it makes sense when you have something that's very discreet that says, like, you know, if I'm, if I'm counting apples and I say I only want two apples and then someone's like, well, a third apple, oh, okay, well, you asked for special permission. Let's just change the rule. It, it kind of taints the sanctity of the OP to just entertain the one-off site-specific amendment for something that is so specific. I don't really like supporting that, uh, but to support a housekeeping amendment, I don't have any objection to changing the, the policy and, and council wants to open that up to align with the, the county plan. Sure, we can do that. I had just noted that it, it'll be like a six month process. That's assuming we very narrowly scope. This is to pretty much delete two policies from the lower tier plan. 
We do very limited public consultation on this because that can spread things way out. Uh, you can get appealed and you know that can snowball, right? Especially as we lead into, uh, as I've noted, we, we sh should be doing a whole new plan at some point soon. So, uh, but it can be done. And it's, it's not, it's probably about the same amount of work as the site specific one, as the mayor has noted, which are, you know, waiting there. They're just, people don't really want to proceed if staff saying, oh, I don't really know what council's going to say. I don't know where we're at with our recommendation. And they would still be coming into an uncertainty. And as I would be telling them now, I'd be recommending no again, just from that sanctity of the OP perspective and council will do what they do, but it's not, it's not nice to people if council's wanting to amend that anyway, right? To, to kind of have that fuzzy recommendation from staff. So if you want to amend the OP, that's it's based specifically on the rural policies saying we're going to go to four lots per hundred acres. Uh, and then there'll probably be some stuff in there, but the retained being a minimum of 50 acres, which causes some problems too, that we would know. Anyway, that's what that's about. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, because my other concern was about um, staff time, um, given the fact that we have so much on the go. Um, and I do want to ensure that we are focused on you know, getting the zoning and, you know, we, we have a lot on the go. Um, so if this is something that can be done, um, I would say like, you know, with in, in good pace and not hold up our other big processes, um, then that's, then I, I appreciate that clarification. Manager Rocky. Clarity, those proposed PPS changes as, as noted in the report, but we haven't discussed them. Uh, they only affect prime egg lands. So the, the, the forcing you to allow two severances per lot only applies to egg. The PPS has always permitted rural severances. They have not forced you to do anything extra. So now we have policies in place that say, oh, you can only do two severances per hundred. And in the rural referenced to the original lot fabric. And now in the egg lands, it's referenced to anything existing as of this year. So you're flipping what is the more restrictive, you're actually making it way easier to sever in ag lands provided the province moves forwards and overrides our policies and we sit still on the rural end. Um, so that's kind of a little uh, funny nuance there that this would kind of address a little bit. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Chair Allen. Uh, through you to council and staff. So the mayor has moved option four, which I support because um, to what manager Rapke just said, the official plan is trying to align ourselves to the county official plan in this sense. I'm not uh, against that. Um, what I also agree with the mayor on this one is that um, Gray Highlands, having a Gray Highlands specific um, statement to the province on the PPS is appropriate. Realizing that the seven of us do have difference of opinions, realizing that there are different um, perspectives sitting here at this table, which is what you want in a council table. You don't want to have seven Councillor Nielsen's, Deputy Mayor Nielsen's, whatever you call me, here, because then everything goes in a very specific straight line direction, one favor. It is important that we have the different voices here. What I will say is to Mayor McQueen's comments earlier, the, the reality is there are different regions within Ontario and that different regions have a different perspective and understanding on um, how things should proceed. The biggest concern from myself, and I think Councillor Allwood said the same thing with the, PPA, the PPS the way it's coming, is that we don't get the option. The biggest, one of the biggest pushbacks on the Green Energy Act was that a municipality was not allowed to say no to wind energy. It wasn't, you know, there were lots of areas that supported it and, and Greyhounds is an unwilling host, it's fine. The biggest concern was that the province said, you don't get a choice. And in this policy, the way the province is bringing us down, saying we don't get a choice is a concern. And I think that that is a common ground that we may all be able to agree on, whether or not the seven of us that disagree or agree on the policies itself making sense, the ability to sever, the fact that the province says, hey, municipalities, I don't care what you think, this is now law and this is what you have to do. You cannot be more restrictive is a concern for me, which is why I would like to see the option for proceeds that this council can give that direction to the province that agreed that the commenting window time period being, you know, June, uh, less than 60 days or 60 days is a tight window. But moreover, that this province seems to think 
municipalities should not have a say in how we get to operate and run. And this is not the first time this government has done that. It will not be the last time this government does this. Okay. Um, we've got Councillor Allwood. Is this to do, like you're commenting on the actual motion? I am, Chair. Okay. Or I'd like to direct a question to our Director of Planning okay. on the motion. So through, through Chair, on to you, uh, Manager Rapke. Yeah, option four wasn't your recommendation. You were recommending one. Can, can you just explain to this council what, you know, the reasoning for that? So that, uh, you know, we're trying to make a decision here that's different than the recommendation. And uh, I just want to make sure that I personally understand it and perhaps that council understands the reason that you didn't uh, recommend four. Thank you. Manager Rapke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate the question. Um, these are all fine options. Like, like I was thinking through what to recommend first. And as I went through the consequences, I ultimately think we're going to land in the same place within the next two years, no matter what option we take here. So if we develop council's comments, um, which was, that'll be really hard, just so everyone knows. So I'm going to have to rip through a letter really, really quick. We're going to have to come up with a meeting and get everyone to agree on the content. So I'm, I'm right now, as we sit here, thinking through how I'm going to word each kind of resolution or, or statement from, from this council that then they'll have to agree to, to be in a letter, right? So that's kind of tricky. Uh, whereas going through the county, raise some general concerns from a planning professional perspective, maybe leave it apolitical for the time being, again, just because the window. Uh, so this is gonna be hard to do by June 6th, but that's fine. And then the, uh, the housekeeping amendment and, is just because if we lead, if we waited, you know, whatever until next year to start the the comprehensive update to the whole OP, you'd capture it there. Um, but that was that was a coin toss, honestly. As as the mayor said, uh, some people might still proceed with the site specific ones anyway. Same amount of work there, so it's trying to hope, you know, fingers crossed, less work and you get the same uh, end result. But this might end up being uh, less work if we go this way, and it avoids the uh, site specific amendments. Any follow up? You're okay. Just just one follow up, if I may, Chair Allen, through you to the director or manager, rather. Um, I mean, how many of these site specific uh, amendments are we looking at in, in the next? I mean, they're talking about having this in place by the fall of 2023 and perhaps to the end of 2024 before it's all of the concerns are addressed. But uh, I'm just wondering that in. In the, in the time frame between the fall of 2023 when uh, municipalities will be required to uh, um, follow the directives of the new provincial policy statement, how many site specific uh, amendments are we dealing with? And uh, do we really want to move ahead? So, so point of order on that. The, sure. site, the site specific, are, we're talking about our rural, yeah. not Ag, which I, this is talking ag. I understand that. So it, it, we're not talking the same thing. So right now there won't be any site specific because you cannot sever in ag. Yeah. So. All right, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Marin, I'd really like to get this. We're, we're 59 minutes so far on this item. Well, and generally in our procedure bylaw, we flip it to committee of the whole, but because the urgency of getting these comments in is very important. Um, thinking about what a lot's been said here, and I, I try to be a reasonable person, I really strive to be a reasonable person, <laughs> <laughs> is I think Deputy Mayor brings a really good point, and I've heard this report, one size in the province of Ontario, it does not fit, because we're unique. We're unique in Green Islands. So I would suggest that one of our comments is, is, is to the province or to the ministry is that exact thing. One size does not fit all. And we should have the ability, obviously, if it's allowed, we should have the ability to decide whether we want it. And I think that's fundamentally a, a point because it, it, in past, and you should say this with the Green Energy Act is willing and unwilling host. Well, if you're a willing host, Put up turbine. Yeah. But if you're an unwilling host, because there are there were one willing municipalities, give us that option. So I'm thinking is maybe take it to a higher level that allows them to allow us to do it, but it's up to us 
to decide what we wanted to do. And then that way, you know, you have the flexibility to, because is talking to Matt and what I've read so far is I had a conversation with a director of OFA this morning and help me out here. He said, well, I could take my 65 acre farm and cut it up in three pieces. And I said, well, wait a minute. I think it's, it's a not restricted to two acres or can it, can it be cut up to three parcels, which then takes the whole perspective because then it becomes a state lots. If he comes, because this is the big thing that happened to the green belt is the idea. It was to protect farming. You know what happened? People bought up the hundred acre farms, put their big house on it and let it grow up in trees. It did not help farming at all. And I heard that from one of the NEC meetings we had down in, in uh, Grimsby at one time. So, you get, you know, the province thinks they're doing right, but in, this, in the end of the day, the people will figure it out. And it's also at the end of the day, if you're paying two and a half million dollars for a piece of property, it's still up to you whether you want to take that severance. Right? It's still up to you. It, it's, not, it's not mandated that we go in and we make everybody's farm two acre lot. So, but I think high level is give us the ability to decide if this is what you want, give us that ability. Yeah. I, I would hope we don't land on that. And that, I think that we discussed that yeah. a little while ago that, yeah. that I think we're probably all on board for that. So maybe. But can I get so. clarity on the cutting up the 65 acres versus, I thought it was restricted to a lot separate, but I may be wrong. I mean, <clears throat> because that, that changes that whole perspective. You can take I, but but aren't yeah your mic's not on but is, isn't that down the road like is is that important to this decision we're making now there's a motion uh, on the table i can provide some so a quick answer for the the ag thing it, it effectively says the size of the lot has to be limited to accommodate water and sewer so it's pretty much caps it at two acres and our policies say minimum two acres you're pretty much coming out at two acre severances. Uh, but also to answer uh, Councillor Allwood's question about how many of the, the rural severance OPA site specific requests we're gonna get. I don't know for sure, but I know we've got two people have been patiently waiting for me to bring this forward. We had turnover and stuff and, and a bunch of stuff come up. So this kind of got delayed till now. Uh, but we get people all of the time, uh, realtors, people who own stuff, whatever. Hey, can I get a severance? No, uh, you're capped out for severances. And I don't go into detail going, hey, you, know, you can apply for a site-specific official plan amendment. It's really only the people who already know that we've entertained some who go, hey, you know, you did a couple of these last years. Well, what then? Well, okay, you could do that. And now that we've had this conversation uh, in the council chambers, there's going to be quite a number of them, I would expect, in the next uh, couple of months if we decide not to move forward with the housekeeping amendment. But, but anybody can apply for anything if they really want to. I can never say you can't apply. Yeah. And I tell everyone that I'll tell them I don't agree with it and won't support it, but I will help you through the process and we yeah. will take your money and council will decide. Okay. <laughs> we point away, Mr. We've had two or three amendments already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need to move on. I saw your hand go up CAO. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Allen. I was just going to suggest, I mean, it <laughs> seems like the majority of council has, has a, an issue with the timelines and the province dictating what, municipalities are going to look like over the next 20, 50 years. Uh, I was just going to suggest that perhaps collectively um, staff and council write a letter to the Ministry of Food, Agriculture, Rural Affairs and the Minister of Municipal Affairs um, just voicing our concern with the uh, the way these initiatives are coming forward. We're seeing more and more of it and I think it would be good if we had a collective uh, voice uh, that spoke to the ministers uh, that oversee uh, rural and municipal affairs. Okay, thank you. All right. Yes, there's a motion on the floor. I hope there's no other discussion. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, thank you. Just a question before we leave this, Mr. Chair, and something we haven't talked about rural no agricultural subdivisions is that because that was something in 2005 no real sub and one example is Pebersham. um if you remember they but there is one in maxwell and there's one allowed in in eugenia because it met that certain time frame but Pebersham was cut off do you have any information on on that what's proposed manager after real quick comment um, there's no agricultural subdivisions are going to be allowed. They have stated that multi-lot creation in rural would be permitted. Uh, those ones in 
Maxwell and Eugenia, I think for the most part, actually fall within the settlement area boundaries. So they would be slightly different under, under different set of rules. Okay. So that's important that, that that doesn't get out there that that's going to happen because there's a lot of information that can, right. Okay. So, so we, we're done with that item. So uh, I don't know, I'm still seeing hands. <laughs> Councillor Alwyn. Thank you, Chair Allen. So if we're preparing our own comments, I mean, we need to refer this, don't we need to refer something to a committee as a whole to get the, before before the deadline or just we, a question? We have a committee to hold meeting booked for planning. Yes, no, no the 24th, I think. We have a zoning meeting next Tuesday. Yes. Um, that's yeah, that one's going to talk about zoning. So I will work on writing a really good letter that has captured everything that has been discussed and the differing of opinions and the challenge with the time frame and bring that back ASAP and uh, see how everyone thinks about that. Great. Okay. Thank you. And my last word on this, if I may, perhaps uh, the, the manager planning could um, share that county report uh, with council. Yeah, it's been yeah. just was emailed out 10 minutes ago. To okay. Us. I'm not watching my email. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I'm in the council meeting. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I've been so efficient on doing my section of the agenda over the past weeks, but uh, it went all out the window today. So, <laughs> okay, so. Um, so uh, that's 9.9. .9. So there's still three to do. Um, yeah, we're going to break, I believe. I'll turn it back to the mayor to, uh, to officially break. Thank you, uh, Chair Allen. And uh, you're moving into 9.10, I think, when we come back. So yeah, we'll take a break. And can we say quarter after one? Does that sound good? Okay, we'll take a break. And, and Mr. Mayor, just before I will be um, attending after lunch, via Zoom. Um, I think I, I said to council, but um, my uh, daughter is in the process of having a, a baby <laughs> and um, we're looking after the other two. So I just want to be uh, close by if I'm needed um, for wellness. So. Yeah. <laughs>
And I'm okay, sorry. Because I closed my laptop and it. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back for a few minutes past quarter after here, and uh, um, hope everybody had an enjoyable lunch. How's the weather, Madam CEO? It's a good day to be indoors. Um, so we're going to continue on then with uh, item uh, section 9.10, and as mentioned before, we recessed, or maybe just after that, the chair, Chair Allen, will, was going to be going remote, so... Uh, Chair Allen, I'll pass the floor over to you because there's still two more reports under your chairmanship. I think actually there's three, Mr. Mayor. There was one that was added. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I just need to, this is the first time I've done a meeting without an extra computer. So just give me a moment. Mr. Mayor? Yes? I think, um, I think I'm going to ask you to chair this portion of it. I'm just having difficulties getting everything on this one screen and to be able to see everybody. So I think it would be better if you just take the next three items for me, please. Yep, no problem. And that gives you the opportunity to still have uh, comments. So, all right. So then we're moving on to uh, section 9.10, the 06.2022 uh, 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 GH1 developments. And there's a report there. I'm just going to pull it up here. And uh, Matt, uh, do you have any comments to, to this report that's other than what's in the report itself? Uh, not, not much other than just for everyone's information. I think this is in the report, but the subdivision still has to come forth, subdivision approval, or at least the recommendation from this council with conditions and whatnot to county before the county makes their decision. And there will be a lot of opportunity for detailed conditions and whatnot at that stage this is just to get the zoning in place great okay thank you for that are there any questions uh if not can i have a mover and a seconder for for that motion councillor allwood uh, councillor wohead that report pl.23.22 uh, related to planning application 06.2022 GH1 developments be received and that council resolve, uh, resolved that the adjustments that have been made to the proposed bylaw since the draft uh, was circulated prior to the public meeting are minor and that no further notice under section 3412 of the Planning Act is required in advance of the passing of the bylaw and that the bylaw 2023-055 being a bylaw to approve zoning 06.2022 be approved. Any further discussion on that motion? Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Just a comment or maybe a question for uh, Manager Rabke. Within the report, um, we do have the new holding provision discussion in there um, and the, how it's showing that 
um, because of allocation of services, we want to make sure that one subdivision doesn't trump any future development or block, I would guess, any future development. Um, given the projects that are coming in, um, trying to word my question, the allocation that's being given, is it set up in a way so that as the phases get built out, it's the number of units they, that are intending to build in a year? Is it longer term than that? How do we set the projections um, through that holding provision? Just if you can give a little bit more information on that. Glenn Rupke. So um, we have a bylaw in draft on the staff end because this is coming up as an issue with all these big things coming up. We're, we're well away from it being a problem, but it's, you know, looking three, five years in the future, we're going to get a pinch point potentially, depending on upgrades that get done on our end to the sewer. So we need a mechanism to allocate the stuff and, and when it expires and, and stuff like that. So there will be something coming forward soon with a bunch of detail on that. A big component of that process will be having holding provisions on big stuff. So when someone comes in for an apartment, even we're going to use a hold to say your zoning's in place. You have a permitted use, but you can't actually do it until you have your allocation granted and your site plan approved. Then we can work through the site plan control process before granting them allocation and lifting a hold just so that we can then decide how to hand it out with an expiry date to the people who are most ready and not have anyone sitting there waiting. So that's that's just to set the stage for the process that we're gonna have to implement moving forward. Uh, so the hold, the hold achieves that simply for the time being. Go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Just a follow-up comment. I appreciate the, the foresight there, um, Manager Rabke. We hear a lot of reports because of the the, I, I want to say surprise, although I don't think it is a surprise, amount of growth coming to the rural areas in Ontario. And we're seeing other municipalities that um, are being inundated with growth and not necessarily positioned to uh, have the allocation ready. And there's been holds and stops on development until they can reassess their um, services that are available. So I appreciate the foresight on that and, and um, the information you provided, because it is important that we don't hold up developments that are more ready than others in, an, in a way to try to um, slow development down as a developer might try to seize control of some allocation numbers. So thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you for that, Mayor. And yeah, like, like for example, Devon Lee is approved for the first phase, right? Yeah. And then you can move forward. And But it is for investment and time, and they do want to know that there's going to be enough. So you would definitely have to work through that process for sure. Any other comments uh, with regard to yeah, Councillor Dubik? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So just a um, point of clarification, can you just uh, provide the the next steps and process? You know, so this is, you know, as a new councillor, um, I'm just interested to understand um, what are the next steps in the process um, that we should be expecting? Want to you? Clarity, this would be in relation to Loon Call as a, as a development in general? So yeah, yes, thank you. So this, uh, this will pass the zoning, uh, which permits issuance of permits effectively once they're kind of ready um, and the use of the lands for the intended use that gets put in effect we go through the appeal period assuming there's no appeals that's kind of done we're still working with the developer on the back end for the nuances around what conditions there will be once we're kind of you know all on the same page with that or not it, that could happen it, it is going fine though on our end um we would come forward with a recommendation to council here's what we think should be conditions and then maybe count Something as big as this might take even a couple meetings for council to, to weigh in on some stuff too. Um, then the lower tier makes that recommendation to the county. Hey, we're, we're cool with it now and we think these need to be the conditions. And then the county council ultimately has to do the approval. They'll give draft plan approval with those conditions. That then has a, a timeline on it and they move forward with going through their condition list. And once that's done, then they apply to register they apply for like a clearance final approval and then they register the plan and then the lot fabric actually gets created at that point so for devon lee for example they have not registered at center point south they're still in the phase between draft plan approval and fulfilling conditions but they're getting close to there so there's kind of a quite a lag between this and building and being able to sell lots and you know, feel free to ask those questions because it's a refresher for us as well. So just on that, Matt, so Devon Lee is getting really close, and I'm not taking away from this, but they'll get to the point where they'll 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 get that allotment for the first phase. 
that is the impetus for the draft bylaw. Right, right. And then once they have that, they have it for how long? That will be coming forward in the draft okay. bylaw where council will have to decide. Because <laughs> in the past, there once you got it, you get to, you had you got to keep it. But obviously there was revisions to that piece of land and it got yeah. take, taken away. <clears throat> and then there was ones that, well, the one that, <coughs> that uh, Demacos, Demacos had to keep coming back to get extension, extension, and then it elapsed and they have to go over it again. So today you get approval, it's written in there how long you have it, providing that you're moving along. I guess you'll have it as long as you're moving along, right? But obviously economy scales, things change, market, so I guess you'll have that written in there as well. And there's probably provisions to extend it and all that kind of stuff, right? So I'm, I'm reading your, your face. <laughs> all right, good stuff. Any other comments then to that? All right, seeing none. Uh, can you hear uh, everything okay, Councillor Allen? Did you hear all the responses? Okay, very good. Seeing there's no other uh, questions, all in favor of that motion? That is carried. I know Councillor Allen, when I was doing the remote as you, sometimes I would just zoom council and make it a big screen so I could see everybody. Well, that's that's what I've done now. So I think I'm ready. And this next item is concerning you. So I I will take over again, if that's okay. That is perfect. Thanks for that. Okay. All right, moving on to the next item, 9.11, the Ontario Association of Committee of Adjustment and Consent Authorities, and it's for a nomination for Board of Directors. And the motion is that Council receive the Ontario Association of Committee of Adjustment and Consent Authorities Board of Directors nomination correspondence for information, and that Council support Mayor McQueen running for election on the board of directors for the Ontario Association of Committee of Adjustment. Um, somebody like to put that on the table? Okay, Deputy Mayor, Seconder, Councillor Allwood. Any discussion? Deputy Mayor. I think it's fantastic that Mayor McQueen wants to share his experience on another organization and I look forward to him being a part of it. Okay, thank you. Any other, um, Mr. Mayor? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks for that comments, Deputy Mayor. I mean, this is just one process. I have to get the blessing from this body and then certainly submit my name. And then uh, depending on the candidates, there may be an election at the, at the Committee of Adjustment Conference. No, no, it is electronic. No, it is electronic beforehand. So that's right. It won't be, generally it used to be at the conference, but now it's electronic ahead of time. So I'll have to do my sales pitch, I guess. <laughs> but uh, thanks for my my mover and nominator for, for that. Hopefully it'll pass. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? And that is carried, thank you. So now just Mr. Other... Chair? Yes. Mr. Chair, if that was to happen, I don't know, uh, Planner Repke or whatever, but in my mind, I think it would be really cool to have a committee of adjustment conference close by and maybe include some of our staff or speakers. So just giving everybody uh, how my mind is thinking and including uh, our, our resources. <laughs> well, I think we have some good good staff and good uh, depth in the sense of what could transpire. And uh, anyway, um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now there is one more item that was added to the agenda, which is item 9.12 regarding the flyer that um, residents of Gray Highlands received in the mail from the, I'm going by memory, Saugeen Landowners Association, I believe. Um, and Mayor McQueen, you asked for this to be put on the agenda. So would you like to speak to it? Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, Chair Allen. Um, so I will sort of hold this up and I, just want to make sure everybody on council and maybe staff has had, had a copy of this letter. I, I can sort of hold it up. It won't, it won't, but it's from the Saugeen Regional Land, Landowners Association and it's two page. It's a back. It's, this has been copied, but it's a front and the back. And there's two items of, of point that they raise in here. One is the nuisance bylaw and fire permits. And um, I, I don't want to get into the detail, but I think, well, I know 
I've got have have received a number of phone calls, a number of conversations, and I know um, it was communicated that to forward to the clerk's department. A lot of it's verbal because I get a call and then they want me to call them back. So it's a little. I, I did suggest that they send an email in to the clerk's department. Um, so there's a bit of confusion here on the two things of the fire permit and the nuisance bylaw. And the reason I wanted to put it on here, I think we need to address it. We need to address it today in communication because there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about, I, you know, does that mean I can't sit on my porch and have a, a, have a, a, a drink or, or whatever? There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of information out there. I know I was at a uh, um, very important gathering on Saturday night and, and I was having conversations as well. And I didn't know where it was until I got this in the mail on, on Monday. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I, I put it on here if you're familiar with it and I know staff and I know our communication uh, director hopefully is watching this uh, or, or, or is watching this because I think it's important that we need to get out communication that sort of clears us up and, 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 and maybe puts things in perspective because I, I know on the Facebook, there was the Mark Dill Facebook page and there was a lot of comments I saw this morning um, I was going to respond and I thought, no, I'm going to wait to this body because this is the body that speaks to items that are dealing with the municipality. So I put it out there. I think we need to address it. I think we need to clear, add clarity to this. Um, and I open the floor to others uh, on uh, around the table, Mr. Chair. And I, 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 I've opened it up for, I mean, the comments are there and I think it needs to be corrected. Hey, thank you. Any other comments? I know, um, okay, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. You feel free to go first, Carolyn. Well, I was just gonna say I had a, I had three phone calls and I thought, well, if I had three, the mayor probably had 33. Um, so I feel for the mayor. I agree that there's things in there that they have um, looked at one line or kind of blended two lines together to change the meaning of some of the the intent of the draft bylaw. I um, I actually phoned the number on the sheet and had a fairly long conversation with the person that sent that out. And um, I'm not going to go into details about what um, what they said, but um, I made a few suggestions that perhaps in the future, you know, ways of doing it in a way that um, would not cause the upheaval that it has. On the other hand, it's good that people are getting involved. We have so many topics that come up that people don't get involved until after we pass the bylaw or the policy, and then it's it's too late. So in a way, this is good. It'll get it out there, um, but um, I'm not sure what the mechanism is for for responding. So uh, Deputy Mayor, you go ahead. Thank you very much, Chair Allen. So the problem I have when a letter like this is sent out, and this is, I, I've received multiple phone calls and uh, Mayor McQueen and I were uh, on the phone chatting while we were getting phone calls and then he hung up and then I called the gentleman back and on Monday night, we were both fielding some wonderful conversations. One, it is good that we are having people engage in the conversation and to everybody who gave me a call and I called back, I'm glad that they are reaching out and wanting some communication rather than just accepting what is written in this letter as factual in what is being reported. I believe that the letter is misrepresenting what we're intending to do. I believe that what the letter is um, twisting facts to be presented in a way that supports their agenda, which seems to be that the nuisance bylaw itself is um, not only municipally wrong, but according to them, criminally wrong to even suggest we should have a bylaw like this. It is important to understand that the bylaw came forward to council last term. This council as a whole received it and forwarded it off to the police services board for communications. The OPP has vetted the nuisance bylaw the bylaw officer has vetted the nuisance bylaw. The police services board vetted the nuisance bylaw. It then came back to this body. This body agreed that we still wanted to have public consultation. 
That's the stage that it's at right now. The bylaw isn't in effect. The municipality is going to be looking out for commu public communication with residents. It is unfortunate that that communication started off on a um, sour foot because like I said, the letter itself misrepresents the intentions. I explained to a lot of the, well, to everybody on the phone that the majority of what the nuisance bylaw is doing is consolidating bylaws and regulations that exist across the municipality already, that it doesn't specify you can't have a fire at night. The open air burn permit and your campfire burn permit are two different things or two different size of fires. Um, that there's no regulation saying you can't be on your front property. There's no regulation saying you can't have a gathering on your property. The noise regulation does stipulate across municipality that after 11 o'clock at night, you can't be uh, creating so much noise that you're disturbing your neighbor. One resident said, well, you're not allowed to have fireworks. Nope, this council last term debated that argument multiple times. You can have fireworks. Just please don't light them off after 11 p.m. and disturb your neighbors and your neighbor's animals. The nuisance bylaw is trying to organize our bylaws in a way that our bylaw enforcement officer is able to efficiently identify the bylaws they're trying to enforce. I did reiterate to everybody on the phone that Gray Highlands does not have proactive bylaw enforcement. That was stated multiple times over the last two and a half years um, as we've had discussions and a changeover in bylaw enforcement officers. We are reactive, meaning our bylaw officer is not driving around the municipality looking for infractions. Moreover, they are there responding to calls of concerns and complaints. Um, there is a process working through with the nuisance bylaw right now. I believe that process is correct. We are looking for public consultation. I look forward to that public consultation. That's the, the letter to the nuisance bylaw portion. The other portion that's written in this letter is suggesting that our staff and our bylaw officer are intentionally trying to find a mechanism by which they can find residents for the purposes of either their own personal gain or the municipal's gain. To think that this municipal body council would be ignorant of something to that degree or that we would be complicit in something to that degree is just flabbergasting to me. I, I don't even know what word to say. Um, on this municipal body, we've had some wonderful, important, debate and discussions and topics during the five years that I've enjoyed being on council. Some of those topics end up coming with harsh criticism from the community, but to suggest that we are ever intentionally operating unethically or that our staff are is ridiculous. Our goals always is to do what we believe is best for Great Highlands. There are differences of opinions on how that may work, but the concept to say that we are trying to be criminal or attack our residents is just unfounded and unfortunate because it results in backlash to staff and to us as municipal councillors that is just unnecessary to the course of the debate. If you have a question or concern with the nuisance bylaw, awesome. Bring it forward. Let's have a conversation. Let's discuss the facts. If you are just going to send out a information that is going out to everybody across the municipality. And honestly, it's disappointing, but the reality is most people will not read that letter and then do the homework to read the actual nuisance bylaw to see what it is. They will take the information on this letter that's been sent out and call us as municipal counselors and attack staff and write this um, unnecessary verbiage online to attack the municipality. So I look forward to the community discussion we're gonna have on the nuisance bylaw. The municipality doesn't take anything lightly. We do the proper process for everything that we're doing. The nuisance bylaw itself has not passed. It may not pass, depending upon consultation with the community and the council as a whole, but to suggest that um, we are doing anything criminal is ridiculous. So that's a light way to put my personal feelings on this wonderful leather that has caused me to have some wonderful conversations with our residents of Grey Highlands. And I will add, ironically, they don't know the borders of Grey Highlands because I had more than one call from a resident from outside of Grey Highlands who also received the letter, who called only out of curiosity to say, 
was this letter factual or were they purposely stirring the pot? And I said, well, I believe they're trying to stir the pot and we're going to have some fun. Thank you very much, Chair Allen, for letting me speak. Thank you for those comments. Any other comments from council members? Okay, I'm not, um, we'll go to Councillor Dubik first. Uh, thank you, Chair Allen. So I'm gonna keep it really um, sweet and short. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so yes, so so definitely, um, you know, great that there's a lot of interest. Um, you know, our residents do want to understand, um, you know, what has been what is being put forward. Um, the words that I used with conversations, you know, I've had is, you know, we're looking for common sense, um, and you know, trying to keep things um, reasonable, um, and you know, we will move forward with the community. Um, and I look forward to continue dialogue to ensure that, you know, we do keep to the facts um, and the intent of, uh, you know, of, of the bylaw. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, anybody else? If not, I'll go back to the mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think we need a motion and I'm just in draft form. Help me out, Madam Clerk. But before that, is there any comments from staff before I try to put something on the floor, Madam CEO, or any comments, sir? I, I, I would agree with what uh, Deputy Mayor was saying that uh, we need to get clarification. We don't need people attacking our staff. Um, but I, I'm suggesting that a motion is that um, we go out in communication that we are in moving forward in the process of getting consultation back on the nuisance bylaw. We make that clear. Okay, and uh, I don't know, and uh, maybe they're during that communication because the direction has been given to staff. So when that or how that will be can be left to staff. And secondly, that um, I, when I read, you know, the part about the fire bylaw and stuff, um, I think, man, see, is there a report going to come back or something? Yeah, and that maybe a follow up report comes back on the um, process or. Yeah, the current uh, fire permitting, a bonfire permitting, or no, let me look at here, that a report comes back that speaks to the bylaw on regulating open open air burning and campfires. I'm not sure how that's worded. It's, it's worded because it, I better not look from the, yeah, yeah. So whatever that is. And so there's a report that comes back that speaks to, to the clarity and maybe to the items that have been raised. I, I don't think there's anything wrong that, you know, people read things to council, yeah, right? And to the public. And you, I'll tell you, and the mail still works because <laughs> it sure got out there. You know, it sure got out there. It was, as we know, we all went through election and we know we can send stuff out there as well. So there's a sense, a motion that brings the clarity of where we're moving forward with the comments on the nuisance bylaw. And then also furthermore, that the report comes back. So I, I put that on the floor. I, the, Madam Clerk, did you capture that in the... Maybe I can get you to read or say that back and then maybe I can get a seconder for that. <coughs> Through you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I know it's hard to, to go back and forth from chairing and not chairing. So I'm, I'm giving you leeway, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> so when the clerk has something um, uh, typed out, if, if um, you could read that back to us when, whenever you're ready. Thank you. The council directs staff to provide communication related to the already approved consultation with the public prior to the draft public nuisance bylaw coming back to council for consideration and that a report come back to council reviewing the open air burn bylaw 2020-046. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor, is that um, okay? And Deputy Mayor, you're seconding that? Okay, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor. That is carried unanimously. Okay, thank you very much. And that concludes my section. So Mr. Mayor, I'll give the chair back to you. Okay, I was just gonna to add to that through staff. Obviously that's coming forward, but we are, there is a lot of stuff on, on Facebook, stuff on social media, I guess in the sense of time frame, And, and you know, as it, as it blows up, so to speak, it keeps going. And I, we, we need to, Madam C, I guess I can chair now, Madam CEO. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Mayor McQueen, um, through you to council. Uh, so our communications manager has been reviewing um, the sites. Uh, our communication policy states that we won't comment on private sites. However, considering um, the ramifications here of this letter, um, uh, she made a judgment call and did say that uh, the letter was going to be discussed at council today and that you know there would be a resolution coming out of council and we'll certainly start communicating on our own social media pages uh, with the facts. Thank you for that, Madam CEO. And I don't know, Madam Clerk, do you want to just add the part that you had sent out that any communication, maybe I'll just say it, any communication that we receive, we'll forward to the clerk, but <coughs> I think I'm the chair. So. Uh, through you, <laughs> Chair Allen, uh, to Mayor McQueen and the rest of council. Um, yes, as part of the process, there was a resolution already on the books to direct staff to go forward with public uh, consultation in the form of a meeting prior to this draft bylaw coming back. We do welcome every comment. Um, so if you, anybody has any comments on the public nuisance bylaw, uh, what we do is similar to the process we've done in the past. We will compile all of those comments and we will put them together um, for council consideration for any changes to the proposed draft. Um, so if you have any comments, please feel free to email clerks at greyhighlands.ca as well. If you want to be added to a list of people who are notified when that public consultation has been scheduled, uh, you can email clerks at greyhighlands.ca and we'll add you to that list and send you notification when it gets scheduled. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, as we're still discussing 9.12, I guess I was still chair, but uh, that's okay. So now, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I got one question, stay there. Okay, all right. So <laughs> go so ahead. A number of us, a number of us have received phone calls and we've got back to those phone calls, but it's nothing in writing, Madam Clerk. And there's the protection of privacy and names and all that kind of stuff. How should we report back that we received eight calls or just so we follow the right protocol and process? Because I know I've received quite a few calls and others too. Through me, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, through you, uh, Chair Allen, to Mayor McQueen and the rest of the council. Um, I would recommend that you contact those people and ask them to contact the municipality to provide their comments themselves. I have done that, but some of them won't. They'll just they'll just call and, and then we add clarity and then yeah. With all due respect, it's hearsay if it's coming from a secondhand person that needs to come directly from the source. Yeah. Okay. Okay. As we're done with uh, item nine point one two, Mr. Mayor, I'll hand the chair back to you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Allen for chairing that portion. Uh, moving forward then to section 10 of our agenda, we're going to 10.1, and this is uh, under the chairmanship of uh, our Deputy Mayor and uh, Deputy Mayor Nielsen, you have a report there to report on. Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Uh, so under section 10, we've got 10.1, as Mayor McQueen said, uh, Economic Development Advisory Group unapproved minutes that council received the 2023-04-18 Economic Development Advisory Group unapproved minutes for information. Can I get a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Dubik, seconded by Councillor Allen. Uh, any questions or comments regarding the EDEG group minutes? So just as, a, oh, quick, Mayor McQueen. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I think and maybe you're gonna speak to this as well. And this is, I think I asked this maybe during the um, agenda review about training for members, Madam Clerk. Clerk Martel. Uh, thank you. So we have reached out with our integrity commissioner to provide, to find out dates that they were available to provide training for our committee members. Um, so we're working through that. We've got a potential four dates uh, to choose from. So we're kind of looking through all the, the committee scheduling at well and uh, through on the same day we will also be scheduling um, an introduction to parliamentary procedures as well as the code of conduct training so we're hoping that'll be the end of may thank you very much clerk Martel. uh thank you very much mayor mcqueen for asking that question as we have a a lot of new members to our different boards and groups it's fantastic to do some training just so that we are all on the same page on um decorum and procedures through all of our committees of council. So thank you very much for that. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I was just gonna report that um, during the discussion on the Economic Development Advisory Group, 
um, the goal was to come back at the next one with uh, kind of some key items that the members of the uh, ED group would like to discuss. So um, I think what the goal was for each of us to come back with three or four items and be able to have um, uh, a discussion on kind of where to move forward. Um, as the E-Day group is a new group and, and still trying to uh, come together, we're trying to just figure out the direction we're trying to go. So as we move forward with that, I'll make sure that council is apprised of the um, what's happening at the E-Day uh, group. So all those in favor of the motion on the floor. Uh, that is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, item 10.12. I wonder if we could get a reminder before our next meeting to send that out to, to do that. Right. Um, I will um, mention that to um, coordinator Thompson. I was going to say coordinator Danielle, but that's not appropriate. Thank you very much for the last name there. Um, I will, I'll send her a reminder to ask us to uh, be reminded of that. Yes, homework is always fun when we're on the, all these different committees. You forget which homework you have for which committee. Uh, so moving on to item 10.2, uh, Councillor Wickens had had an addition to the agenda regarding Oh, rats need for fees waived for the Osprey Hall. Um, Councillor Wickens, I'll go to you if you can uh, help us specify the number of days, maybe the particular days that staff can capture that. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair Nielsen. Um, I should get my calendar out here so that I can put some dates. Out. Maybe I'd be better to go to my computer. Do -do -do -do. Sorry for not being prepared. That's quite all right, You're Councillor right. Wickens. Just in terms of, um, as we're trying to try and craft a motion, having the, yep. the dates in mind will be helpful for staff. Yep. Okay, so Sunday, May 14th, 21st, 28th, and the 4th of June. And as long as there are no um, conf conflicts, I would like to reserve uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So that's the 7th, 8th, and 9th for um, dress rehearsals and stuff. So, um, and just, just as a note, uh, all, monies, all monies made from this is going directly back into the community centers. So, wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Wickens. I will comment that there is a conflict on. I believe it's the twenty eighth, um, and I'm just trying to confirm that because we have the rodeo going on at the location, and the rodeo will be taken over the entire grounds. Ah. So we will okay. have a conflict on that particular day. Right. Um, I don't know, and that the rodeo is for the full weekend. So yes. just for. Uh, clarity to um, staff, Clerk Martel, if the intention is to provide um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven days of fee waived for the purposes of rehearsals, if we specify the number, not the actual dates, and then that would allow staff to work with the old rats to complement the dates that did ha didn't not have a conflict, would that be appropriate if the motion was worded that way? Director Harris on, because this is within her realm. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Clerk Martel. Uh, Director Harris, are you available to comment on if a motion just regarding the number of fee waivers, fee waivers required would be suitable given that the one Sunday is a conflict, maybe they might want to still want to have that many rehearsals. Being a you know, community actor myself, rehearsal time is precious time. So I just want to make sure we can support the ORATs. Thank you so much through the chair to council and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I think if the motion just said that for weekly rehearsals and up to three dress rehearsals until the date of performance on June 10th, and then we can coordinate and have some flexibility. Traditionally, this would go, this request would go through the community grant program, but because it didn't come through and there wasn't a timely matter, we will report at the end of the year on the community grant program because we are tracking number of hours of free rental. So we can just um, put it in there. I'd hate to hamstring them and not give them the opportunity to work the dates around our schedule. 
that makes sense. Thank you very much, uh, Director Harrison. Mayor McQueen, you might want to see your comment, but you said the same comment to myself there a second ago. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess in the sense of the time on the Sundays, because I'm thinking the rodeo is during Saturday, and then the kinsmen have a dance Saturday night, and then the rodeo is during the day, but it's done around three. Your rehearsal is in the community center itself? Yeah, it's in the community center, and it's at seven in the evening. We don't do it until the evening. So, so I guess my, my point to you is it, it could be possible. I don't know through you to the director, Director Harris, uh, the, the rodeo stuff may be almost wrapped up by hopefully by Sunday night, I would think. I don't know if they will even be using the community center. Are they, Director Harris? Thank you so, so much. Through the, sorry. I'll let Director Harris go ahead, but then I do have uh, CEO Govins. Hand raise as well. Through the chair to council, we should be done. Um, and, and I think we, as long as the group is flexible, we may be able to work that in. I just don't want to commit. We don't use the hall per se, but there is tear down and clean up and the parking lot's going to be full. And depending when the horses and the trailers and everything get out of there, we I think we'd have a conversation with the group just to make them under, you know aware of the situation. It's probably not, not a problem, but uh, I'd like to have the conversation with the group. Thank you very much, Director Harris, uh, CEO Governor. Uh, thank you, Chair Nielsen. I was just going to say it, it's the operational staff will yeah. work with the group if that's right. what council wants us to do, and we'll figure out the logistics. Thank you very much for that, oh, Mayor McQueen. Another comment? Uh, no, that's 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 fine. And uh, well, maybe the group might want to do a, a trial run in front of the folks at the rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> that's not, uh, that's that's not going to happen. Like I said, that's not unless they're willing to pay. Unless they're, unless they're, that's right. Unless they're paying participants, yes. <laughs> we can, however, advertise at the rodeo that there is a community dinner theater coming on, uh, uh, coming up soon. Um, okay, thank you very much for that, um, Councillor Wickens. Uh, Director Harris kind of gave direction as to the kind of motion to be worded. Are you comfortable with that wording? To you, before I ask Clerk Martel if she actually captured what Director Harris was suggesting. <laughs> I think that's fine. Maybe uh, Clerk Martell, could you read that back to us all? Clerk you Martell, captured do you it, mind? please. Thank you, Chair Nielsen, through you to the rest of Council. That Council approve a, way, a fee waiver for up to four weekly rehearsals in May and June and up to three dress rehearsal dates in the beginning of June for the Osprey Recreational Amateur Theater for their June production and that this is to be funded, or I don't know how to put that, actualized through the community grant program. So, Councillor Wickens, first off, that okay with you? That sounds great to me. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for the motion? Seconded by Mayor McQueen. Director Harris, you have your hand raised. I'll go to you now that the motion is actually on the floor. Thank you very much. Um, through the chair to council, I just would like to clarify I do know the performance is scheduled and we have it blocked already for June 10th, but I have not seen and I don't recall a community grant request for that. I'd have to go look in the files, but if that could be added to the motion just in case, and if it's already been accounted through the community grant program, we don't need it, but I don't want this to be, we don't have permission to waive fees without council approval. So I'd rather just put it in there just in case. Thank you very much, Director Harris. Yeah, better safe than sorry, I understand, given that staff uh, have communicated to the uh, the group involved that staff themselves cannot actually waive fees. It does have to come to council. So this little process, uh, Clerk Martel, the motion is edited fine. Yeah, that I believe I did say that this be actualized through the community grant program. And just, the, I think uh, Director Harris was more commenting to make sure that June 10th is captured as well as a specific date uh, to make sure that that was covered. The June 10th date was requested as well? June 10th is the actual performance day. Okay. So the, the uh, director has to want to make sure that the actual motion captures not just the rehearsals, but the actual performance day because staff themselves would not be authorized to waive that fee. I think Clerk Martel will do a fabulous job of editing that and then we'll be ready. Thank 
you through you, uh, Chair Nelson. The council approve a fee waiver for up to four weekly rehearsals in May and June and up to three dress rehearsal days in the beginning of June for the Osprey Recreational Amateur Theater and for their June 10th production date and that this be actualized through the community grant program. Thank you very much for that, Clerk Martell. Councillor Wickens is nodding his head. Mayor McQueen seconded. Any questions regarding the motion on the floor? Seeing none, all those in favor? That is carried. That comes to an end of my two items. Uh, Mayor McQueen, the chair is yours. Well, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thanks for taking care of that. Moving on to item 11 in our agenda. This is uh, Bolt Fill Station, and I'm gonna pass the chairmanship over to Chairman Personship. <laughs> Yes, Chair. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Over to uh, Council. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. Um, yeah, so we are in item 11.1, .1, bulk fill station limited tendering. The motion reads that Council receives staff report ENV.23.12 regarding the limited tendering of a bulk fill station and the council award the purchase of the bulk fill station to Flowpoint Systems in the amount of $107,567, sorry, one, I'll, I'll start that again, um, $107,567.97 plus HST. So to put this on the floor, may I have a mover and a seconder? So Councillor Wickens and Councillor Lowhead. Um, so is, are there any questions or comments? Mayor McQueen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I probably should know this, but obviously when this is up and running and uh, it's great to see a, a sort of a image put on our screen so we understand where it's going. Mm -hmm. Obviously there will be a charge you said this maybe i'm looking at the treasurer <laughs> uh will there be a charge or a usage charge or i don't know i'm, I'm i see a hundred thousand dollars but uh yes so uh, so we will put that question to director moyer we'll just give him a moment to come on board hello director moyer did you hear the question about um <laughs> fees associated with the service Yes, so there's a multitude of uh, services that this system is going to provide, uh, but our fee water bylaw does have fees in there for bulk water, if that's what we're focusing on here. So the fee right now for bulk water is $5 a cubic meter. So that would be set up as a payment on the bulk water side. Uh, on the septage or the trailer kind of receiving area side that it'll be the gated end on the, what I would consider kind of the north end of the station there will be a different payment style currently we're looking at uh, either a credit card swipe or a, like a coin operated door uh, just because those people that we are using that typically wouldn't have an account set up with the municipality whereas bulk water they would uh so that end would be a separate uh fee and then the bottle filling station where people that are biking or using the ball diamond or the area were to fill up just a small water bottle uh that part of the station would be free there would be no charge for for that part, section of the the station uh, mr mayor follow up thank you madam chair and just following up on that so at one time this location was a um a new unique spot for fifth wheel trailers to come in and and uh, dump their gray or black water and then fill up with water. So there will be a fee to dump their black and gray water from the from the fifth wheel hitch or from the trailer, whether it's fifth wheel or bumper, or whatever. Will they be able to fill up? Because in, in a, at a provincial park or a campground, you have a hose that you can fill up your holding tank. But I understand that there's probably issues around funding this and, and all that stuff. So it what it so if if if, if Councillor Nielsen, Deputy Mayor Nielsen rolls in with his camper and he has gray water and black water and wants to fill up, what's the process? So I don't know about gray water and black water. I don't think you want to fill them. Usually they're going the other way. So if he come right. in with with that and he was to use either the coin operated door or the, the gated end of the the system uh, there will be an access point where he can connect his hose on to get rid of the gray and black water 
and there will be a hose bib there for rinsing and cleaning everything up. And if it was wanted at that time to fill up uh, the camper or the, the water tank on the camper, then that would that hose bib could be used for that, I believe. If that's what you're asking. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, no, thank you. That's just sounds perfect, uh, Director Moyer. So my last comment through Grey Highlands and Economic uh, Development Director is, is this something that we're going to promote? Is this something that I know there's people that have used it in the past or it was, but obviously with trailers, they have to come in one way because not everybody's good at backing up and go out the other way, which it does have that ability at King Edward Park. But is that something that we're going to promote, hidden secret, people show up, they pay, I just wanted on the marketing side of that, is that something that uh, we're moving forward with? Is so. Director Harris available? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you through the chair to council. And um, we haven't talked about this yet, but obviously as an asset of the municipality and something that we're investing in, I think it makes sense too. So I would work with um, the our other departments, including our communications manager, to get that out once we we get settled and going. I know there um, are other issues. I mean, we will be talking about signage as well, so we'll come forward with a full plan for that moving forward. Mr. Mayor, any further discussions or questions, Councillor Allwood? Uh, thank you, Chair Dubik. Uh, through you to staff. Um, I just wonder what the timeline of the installation was. I understand that Radford Street is going to be um, involved in the installation, but uh, there's a huge event uh, that the council has supported that's going to be happening at the complex on September the 10th, the Grand Fondo. There'll be 400 bikes there along with support and uh, the OPP cycling team and a multitude of people. I just wanted to make sure there was no conflict in timing. So, so, so great point in terms of um, getting that up and going for our, our cycling events. Um, Director Moyer. Uh, through you, Chair. So that was in the report on the last council meeting when it come to the tender. So that date uh, was included in the tender as kind of a blackout date uh, for work along there. Now, it really depends on the construction, what stage they are at, uh, but they do know about it and if needed, uh, we, if the, like, if it's not cyclable at that point in time, uh, there, there is an alternative route out the other end that we've talked to the, the group about. So, but it, it is in the tender and it is our plan to try and avoid that date as, if possible. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Chair Dubik. Uh, just wondering about um, the director mentioned that there would be a the option of using cash and uh, just a concern about uh, vandalism. I know the um, car wash in Flesherton is a popular spot for vandalism. There's a uh, um, coin operated system there and, and it is smashed off the wall often and i just wonder if that's been taken into consideration that uh, perhaps we just only accept uh, credit thank you thank you for that comment uh, director moyer uh, that is a great point uh, i guess our concern there was if somebody showed up and didn't have uh, a credit card but i think nowadays that's probably not a huge concern so if that's council's wish we can uh, uh, look at that and, and see if that option can be just strictly credit uh, and, and move forward that way that's not a problem at all yeah, uh, so please i think that would be um a good point to follow up on uh, yeah. um, and oh, so, sorry as a follow-up yeah so uh, the, it's to me it um if somebody breaks into it and tears it off the wall it's going to be out of operation for as long as it takes for somebody to come and fix it and then we've got costs which probably would have to come out of municipal um, funds not insurance because it wouldn't be high enough and i i just think it's it's asking for trouble especially out 
in an area where there's not a lot of people around at night. So um, I, uh, I, I don't know if a motion is needed, but I would, I would make a motion that we look at just um, um, what, what do you call that? Um, you're just using credit, credit or some other kind of, of um, non-cash payment. Uh, so thank you for that, um, Madam CEO. Uh, thank you, Chair Dubek. Um, I, I think, you know, Councillor Allen raises a good point and we're trying to move away from, from cash operations. I mean, obviously for, for health and safety of our staff as well. Um, but um, I think we're finding debit is actually easier than credit. So, um, but, you know, with a credit card option, um, but we're looking at that across the board for all of our cash operations. So um, I, I think, um, I, I don't think staff need a resolution because obviously it's going to be first and foremost safety of staff, the second uh, protection of property. So um, we'll be certainly looking into both those options. Okay, thank you. So, so we won't make a motion for that, but staff will look into that option to go cashless. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just following up on that. Uh, yes, most definitely. Um, you go to Costco today and you want a hot dog and a French fries you, and you put your credit card in there and next thing you know, you got hot dogs and French fries. Um, I just wonder, swipe, swiping, like, I don't know if we'll have a camera there. I've heard stories where people put false swipers to get everybody's information. And I, I, I don't know enough about electronics, so I'll leave that to staff to, to follow up. My other question though is through you, Madam Chair, is parking or no parking? Mm -hmm. If you look at the picture, you see a car sitting there. And I'm sure when Deputy Mayor Nielsen's pulling his trailer in, he, he'll probably want to pull up beside, because that's what you usually do is you pull up on the side. But if there's eight cars there and we're promoting it and I mean, events going on there too, but should we have along the front there a no parking zone? Because it makes no sense if there's cars all parked there and nobody can use it because then you're going to get a frustrated mm -hmm. deputy mayor and his trailer and, uh, <laughs> and, and that sort of thing. And I just, I just, as an observation, that's usually at provincial parks that they, they have a drive in and a drive out. Right. So I'll leave that. I ask that question to staff. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. Okay. So I think we have um, two staff people ready to answer that. Um, so about the servicing area. Um, so we'll start with Madam CEO. Uh, thank you. So the, the whole site will be marked out and signposted. Um, it is, again, an operational issue. Staff are on it, working together. And um, I, I mean, I'm just looking forward to the site being operational and uh, we'll be sure to send out uh, pitches and, and notifications so that council is aware of what it looks like. Uh, thank you for that. Any follow up, Mr. Mayor? No, it's just uh, it just. I can just see people parking where they're not supposed to. <laughs> right? And that's, yes, that's right. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, further questions, discussion? All right, so we'll move that to a vote. Uh, those in favor? Opposed? That motion is carried, thank you. Um, so I will pass the, the chair back to Mayor McQueen. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Dubik. And uh, moving on to finance, Section 12, uh, we have three reports under finance, and I'm going to pass it over to Councillor Elway. Uh, thank you, Mayor McQueen. And uh, I'll start with item 12.1, the Treasurer's Statement on the 2022 Development Charges, Parkland Dedication, and in lieu of parking. And the resolution reads, the Council received report FIN.23.06, Development Charges, Parkland Dedication, and in lieu of parking for information. Would somebody like to move that? Moved by Deputy Mayor Nielsen, seconded by Councilor Dubik. Any discussions on the report? Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Chair Allwood. Um, just a thought when I was looking through this in terms of the in lieu parking, I know um, we're going through the new zoning bylaw and then that there might be some changes to the minimum parking standards and such. I'm just wondering if um, Planner Rapke had a comment on the in-lieu parking fee. And um, I don't know how to word my question, but my question is more along the lines of, 
uh, the income revenue for the municipality being able to utilize the in-lieu parking fees to create green pea parking in municipalities where we might want to buy properties or such. And then the zoning by law lowering the parking requirement, and therefore we're not going to collect the parking fees. Just a comment on, because I, I believe in conversations with you, the zoning by law may have uh, less, than, less than the requirement for the parking do you have a clue of what I'm trying to ask? Because I'm having a hard time wording it. My apologies, Planner Rapke. Just, just before I go to uh, Planner Rapke, uh, I mean, we're receiving a report today on the uh, 2022 results, but I, I understand your question and it relates obscurely to the uh, report presented, but uh, I'll allow Planner Rapke to answer that if he can. I think you're asking through the chair to Deputy Mayor <coughs> about uh, you know, if we're tinkering with a fee, how does how does the zoning change of, of lowering the amount of spaces impact that? On Sunday, I finished an 11,000 word uh, paper on removing parking minimums outright that I've been humming and hawing on how to present this to council and the public. This will be my position moving into the discussions. There will be debate on this topic, probably at least one whole meeting. <laughs> So I'll reserve most of my comments till that time, till that's released, till I have a presentation on the topic, but we will be getting into that throughout the deliberations on the bylaw. Fair. Thank you for that answer. Any follow-up? No. Fair is your follow-up? Okay. Any questions on the report and the motion that is on the uh, table? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried, thank you. The next item, 12.2, then, is the uh, debenture application for unfinanced capital projects. And the resolution reads that Council received report FIN 23.07, debenture application for unfinanced capital projects for information, and that Council authorized a debenture application with Infrastructure Ontario, and that Council authorized that the debenture repayment term of 10 A debenture, sorry, doesn't read very well there. And that council authorized that the debenture repayment term of 10 years and that council authorized the funding of the addition to fire station one from the fire reserve. Can I get a motion? Uh, put that on the floor. Councillor Wickens, moved by Councillor Wickens, seconded by Councillor Dubik. Any discussions on this report? Deputy Mayor. Thank you again, Chair Allwood. So I have a question for, like, I'm trying to help council understand when we look at a total outstanding and pending debentures totaling $2,092,761. We've had significant conversations and discussions during budget time in the last five budgets I've had a pleasure being a part of. And one of the things I keep trying to make sure is council's aware of is how significant that debenture dollar adds up over time. So a question for um, Director McCarthy is, um, when it comes to our levy versus that total, so one is the total outstanding and pending is predominantly paid for by levy because we need to levy the money in order to pay down our debts. So am I correct in that understanding? And two, what is that number equal to in a relation to our, the actual percentage of the levy we receive from the taxpayers. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Director McCarthy, go ahead. Uh, thank you, through you, Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Um, so the 2 million um, is the uh, estimated annual repayment amount. Um, I would say it probably is worst case scenario at this moment because it does include um, projects that will be financed in coming years. Um, and in, there'll also be payments that are reduced in coming years. Um, also that 2 million um, is financed through levy and uh, water rates, water and wastewater rates. So it's not just levy. Um, so I'm hesitant to provide a percentage, I guess, compared to levy, um, though I can provide that info, info at a later date. Um, however, the total um, estimated percentage of the gross operating budget is around 9%. 9% just so for follow up, follow -up. So, sure. thank you, Chair Alwood. So 9% of our total operating budget is just to cover our current debt load. As projected, 
in the next coming years because we, uh, it may take a couple of years for some of these items to actually get completion and funded i mean we're looking at like wyville bridge for instance which is just to start commencing but it may take time for it to finish okay That's thank right. you very much for that information treasurer mccarthy thank you deputy mayor any uh other questions or discussion on the report mayor mcqueen so thank you mr chair so looking at the 2023 debenture application and projects approved to be debentured so we have a total of seven million dollars to be eventually debentured at some point it seems higher than other years but uh i guess the question it talks about the interest rate floating around four percent what are we today we're may so interest rates were starting to creep but Four percent versus at one time. Well, there's all the rates right there. Yeah, like as low as one point zero seven. So a bigger chunk of our repayment is becoming more interest bearing. But I guess that's why we went through the budget process this year. We were a little bit more conscientious of the higher interest rates and stuff like that. So um, yeah, but still not a bad rate for ten year money, but comparable but it still uh, makes things move forward but yeah okay thank you was there a question or just a comment <laughs> just a comment. no just a, seven million seems a little higher than normal years but we did the hot water tower last year and all those things. i know we have a delay because we sort of fund it through our capital or works money and then when we get to the completion then we roll it all in and it's good that maybe interest rates are sort of maybe leveled off right now so we could sort of have that bit of a normal Four percent is not the end of the world type of thing. It's still doable, but I don't know what it says on there on the original. Yeah, there were some three at yeah frogs. To, uh, they were three point one three. So yeah. Anyway, because it doesn't get too crazy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to go to uh, Director of Finance McCarthy for a response. Uh, yes, I'll just clarify that this debenture application will only be for the three point four million. Um, the remainder um, will be in future applications when the projects are finalized, um, and it is for several years of projects, so it's not um, just within the past year. Right. As it mentions in the report, we'll also be working with. Sorry, just one comment. I'll go to Councillor Allen. As it mentions in the report, we'll also be working with Infrastructure Ontario to, to look at the best time to uh, optimize those rates, but uh, it's a lengthy process applying for financing, so there are time frames involved. And having said that, Councillor Allen, you've raised your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that I'm quite pleased that the interest rate is only 3.84% when you think of what, uh, what the rate has done over the last um, several months. And, and just a comment on Deputy Mayor's comments about you know, how much we pay each year, but that, that's just the equivalent of doing a couple of projects. So this way over the last number of years, we've been able to do a lot more projects than we can do at a lower price. We all see what prices of things are, are doing. So we've been able to do a lot more projects um, over the years, um, for the same amount of payments spread over years, if, if that makes sense. So uh, it, it's not, shouldn't be used all the time, but I think it's a very good mechanism. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Allen. I would agree that, uh, you know, the, the decisions that our finance department, this council and our senior management make when uh, we're funding projects, whether it's through levy grants or, or debenture are, are important considerations. And as Councillor Allen has pointed out, it does allow us to do uh, a number of things that would be beyond the scope of just, just the levy. Any further discussions on this report? We are well within our annual uh, repayment limits, by the way, so there's no concerns there at this time. Any further comment? Seeing none, all those in favor of receiving the report? Any opposed? That motion is carried, thank you. And that would take us to item six, uh, sorry, 12.3, the community group liability insurance. And the uh, resolution is that council receive report FIN.23.08 for information. Would somebody like to move that? Councilor Lohead, would you like to move that? Thank you. Councilor Lohead and Councilor Wickens. Any discussion? Uh, 
Again, I think this was in response to uh, some consideration that the uh, council had asked staff to look into the fact that uh, <clears throat> submissions through the FAP program for covering insurance for some of our groups and uh, were we paying for insurance twice and that sort of uh, that sort of thing. And uh, it does outline the uh, sort of the requirements to be a committee of council or a uh, a second uh, option there, which is sorry, the acronym has just slipped out of my mind, but uh, it's a, uh, oh, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, there, so there are two options in there basically. And uh, if would help if I had the right report up, I thought I did click on that. I wonder if I couldn't find it. Sorry, so the uh, low risk events would have um, other options. Any comments or questions on, on the report? Seeing, sorry, go ahead, Member Queen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was looking at my notes. So I, I did have a note here. What are low risk versus high risk? <laughs> Obviously, there's a division or a dividing line of what high and low is. And I just wonder if there's an explanation of what that is. I'll go to our director of finance for that. Thank you. Um, through you. Um, so it's our insurer that provides the that definition, I guess, of low risk versus high risk. And there is a very specific list of items that are lo low risk and those that are high risk. Um, if there's ever any question, then I reach out to confirm with our insurer as to whether they would be covered under LCIS or not. Thank you, Director McCarthy. Uh, Madam CEO. Uh, thank you, Chair Allwood, uh, through you to Mayor McQueen. Generally speaking, when it comes to risk, anything that involves alcohol or motorized vehicles would be considered high risk uh, because those are where we see catastrophic claims. Um, low risk would be, you know, um, small fundraisers or birthday party. Yes. So, um, but it is pretty specific what our insurers uh what the information is that they give us. Thank you for that. I can imagine horses and bulls may fall into that category. <laughs> There's no risk in that. <laughs> Any further question or discussion on the uh, Mayor McQueen? So, so following, I remember years and years having fundraisers and doing stuff at junior farmers and different things. We were required to take a PAL or buy PAL insurance. I don't know if it's changed or whatever. So I think we still have, if you're having a, a buck and door are you having a, a fund? They don't call it maybe that now, but they're having a fundraiser or you're having a wedding would be considered low risk, would it not? I guess it depends on the wedding, but right. But but if you're having a fundraiser where there's alcohol, because you do have alcohol at weddings. Not the That's right. <coughs> Pardon? Not at the ceremony. No, 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 no. Maybe if you have a wedding dance. It would depend on if there's a shotgun involved with this wedding, sir. No, no, I'm just saying, I, you know, I know that. I think they are probably considered a low risk compared to a fundraising event and stuff. Cause sometimes at weddings it's alcohol is provided and stuff like that. It does affect alcohol, but I guess I do ask that question. Are weddings required to have extra insurance? <laughs> they are, right? Yeah, I mean, events that fall outside of the uh, descriptions in here would uh, be required to come forward with some sort of arrangement. And we, we would have that, I think in our rental policies. Go ahead, see you, Devin. Uh, thank you, Chair Elwood. I'm, I'm just trying to think of uh, the acronym is, is PAL. It, it's alcohol liability, but I can't remember. Party alcohol liability. So that is a separate policy for parties that serve alcohol. So that leads me into- Follow up, uh, Mayor McQueen. That leads me into a private party. If it's rented by a private party for an anniversary and I didn't, you know, uh, I invite my friend here, Deputy Mayor, and he comes and he brings a cooler for a few beer, but it's a private party. Is that a, is that a low risk? Madam CEO. Um, thank no, you. No, I mean, did, you know, I... you rent you rent the facility. I'm talking about low risk. I'm talking about what I'm talking about. You're having a, a family of reunion or you're having a, a social event. Is that considered low risk? Because you're renting it for a private function. If, my if buddy there's... here brings a... a, a bottle of wine and he comes over and he said it's a private function is that is that considered low risk because alcohol could be there but it's a rented it's a private party uh thank you mr mayor i'll uh 
defer to our CEO, the, our risk management expert. But uh, in my opinion, if you're renting a facility that is alcohol involved, you're supposed to have a permit. But uh, I'll sure. defer to Madam CEO. Thank you, uh, Chair Alwood. That's exactly what I was going to say. The AGO um, has a permitting process that is very strict. Um, and they um, set out the criteria that people have to follow when alcohol is at an event that is beyond the municipal um, uh, rental. Uh, our um, uh, insurance ask to members of the public who are renting our facilities is to protect the municipality. Thank you. Interesting. Follow up, Mr. Mayor? No. Well, I, I just was always under the understanding if you're renting it for a private, if you're renting it for a private party, whether it's a, a birthday party or a social or a come and go tea or a baby shower, I don't know which, and alcohol appears, but it's a private party. Anyway, maybe I should just stop right there. <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. I'll, I'll go to Deputy Mayor. My comment was going to be to just inform everybody, if you invite me to a party, I'm bringing my RV and it will be full of wine. Thank you very much. <laughs> if we just provide the license plate, we'll have the OPP. Make sure you get there safely. <laughs> right. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Any further discussion on the motion that is on the floor? <laughs> Seeing none. All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is carried. Thank you. I'll turn the chair back to uh, his worship. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Chair Alwood. And I'm still I'm still stuck on the thousand words that uh, the, the uh, planner is working on there. Uh, eleven thousand. Sorry, what did I say? Eleven words. Eleven thousand words. Yes. Okay. Moving forward to section thirteen, fire, police, and safety. We have a report here, and I'm going to pass it over to uh, Council Lohead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So. Um, uh, 13.1, uh, we have uh, draft bylaw 2023-058, which is a bylaw to amend the adopted terms of reference for Road Safety Community Partnership Committee, that's the RSCPC, to increase community membership from eight to nine members. And so the resolution reads that council approved bylaw 2023-058 adopting the updated terms of reference for the Road Safety Community Partnership Committee. So can I get a mover please to put that on the floor? And that is Deputy Mayor Nielsen and seconded by Councillor Dubik. So is there any discussion on this resolution? Okay, we all recall it. So I suppose seeing none, call the question. All those in favor? And none opposed, that carries unanimously. So that concludes my very brief section of chairing once more and i will pass the chair back to mr mayor well thank you uh Councilor. We're, we're breaking in easy here right yeah I'm loving it <laughs> all right section 14 is uh, transportation and public spaces we're all right to keep going here we'll try to get to three o'clock usually all right uh at this point i'm going to pass the uh, chair over to uh, Councilor wickens for the uh, public utilities uh or sorry transportation and public spaces huh, thank you mayor mcqueen so i think we have four items, four items today. Uh, the first is item 14.1, the award of RFT F18, 2023, 07, one new grader. So um, if we could have somebody, uh, a motion to put this on the floor, Councillor Dubik, seconder. All right. Um, uh, Councillor received report TPS 23.12 and the council support awarding RFTF 18 2023-07 one new grader to Tormont Cat in the amount of $579,017, excluding HST. And the council support the purchase of the five-year, 5,000 hour powertrain and hydraulics extended warranty option in the amount of $15,659, excluding HST and that council accept the trade in offer from Tormont Cat for the surplus grader at $93,000 as outlined in option two. So the, uh, the trade in, uh, talked with uh, Director Cornfield this morning, the trade in value I think is exceptional. And uh, if we go to, uh, 
gov gov sales dot com or is that what it's called? Gov deals, right? Um, they uh, they will remove that offer actually, so we may risk getting less. And I believe myself that is a a good offer. Um, uh, anybody uh, have any questions or concerns? Uh, on that. All right, barring none, all those in favor? Opposed? That motion's carried. So Council Wickens, do you get to drive it first? I would love the chance to drive it, absolutely. And all the years that I worked in construction, I never ever got a brand new machine, never. <laughs> Always got the hand-me-downs, but they were broken. And you know, anyways, uh, item fourteen point two: uh, revise site alteration and fill bylaw. So, uh, could I have a motion to put this on the floor? Councillor Dubik, second. All right, Councillor Lowhead. That councillor receive uh, TPS twenty three point one three. And that council directs staff to bring the site alteration and fill bylaw to council for approval at the next council meeting. And that council accept the proposed fees as outlined in this report and that fees and charges bylaw be brought to the next council meeting to be updated accordingly. So these, uh, these, these bylaws more or less are uh, to protect our infra infrastructure uh, so that uh, these folks come in and just don't beat up the roads and aren't, uh, aren't uh, you know, they have to fix them or pay fees and stuff like that. So uh, I think uh, if there's any questions, I think Director Cornfield would be, would be much better uh, to answer them than I, so. Anyways, yes, Mayor, or not yet, Mayor. No, Deputy I'm good. Mayor Nielsen. Deputy Mayor is fine. I just barely got rid of the councillor title. Thank you very much, Chair Wickens. A simple question to start with, because forgive me uh, not knowing my cubic tons. Um, with um, 500 cubic meters, I believe is Phil, is, is where this policy will start. Can you give me an idea on truckloads Forgive me, sorry, I just can't compute that 50. in my head to how many truckloads are we talking? 50. Through Chair Wiggins to Deputy Mayor um, Nielsen, um, I'm going to defer these questions to uh, Manager Milner. Um, she has uh, basically, uh, how do I put this? There's been a lot of staff involvement in creation of this bylaw, but um, Manager Milner has uh, taken the lead on it and uh, I'm confident she can answer any questions from council. Yes, yeah, so 500 cubic meters is equivalent to, so a standard dump truck is 20 cubic meters. So to get to 500, you can, <laughs> yeah. That's a triaxle, by the way. Triaxle. So just a follow-up comment. So uh, Chair Wickens, during the first reiteration of this bylaw, there's some significant concerns about the, that minimum size because of um, agricultural farm uses and somebody trying to just, you know, level land on their property and stuff. So that does um, answer the first major question that came from the first bylaw. I'm curious to see here Mayor McQueen's comments before I make any more, because I think I went first last time. I'm gonna let him go first this time and then we'll see where we end up together. Mayor McQueen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And yeah, thanks for asking that question because that was one of my questions to ask. Um, number of questions I have. One, this this was forward to the community the whole the last time. I sort of was questioning myself whether it should go back to the community whole for more in-depth discussion because it's in the for 20 minutes. But a few things. Um, when it said 20, 20 cubic meters per truck, which is about 25 trucks. Gray Road 40, just last year, there were two large farm, I 
and Chris will probably know where this is, where there were new buildings, long laneway, uh, site yard. I'm pretty sure there was more than 25 trucks to prepare that site for, for the building site, for the new house, the new barn and everything else. And my one question is, as to building and, and planning is if there is a proposed building, barn, location, you know, shop, or whatever, 25 truckloads aren't going to go very far in a driveway. And I know, I don't know, Chris, if you know where I'm talking, Railroad 40 across toward Walters Falls, there were, a barn was torn down, two farms were completely redone, and all new buildings. And there's a long way, there's a whole big yard. I bet you there was 200 to 300 truckloads just to build that driveway. I have no idea. I have pictures of it. And I'm not but it just, there's going to be circumstances through a building process or a planning process where you may, it could be a, a C4 or a commercial application where they need a lot of material to build a commercial driveway. So my first question is, is does that supersede this one because it's through a process of a building permit site alteration or not site alteration, but you know, you're, it's a brand new, it's a brand new building site, right? And I could go back here. I'll try to find pictures of it, but it just, I don't know, Chris, if you know where that is or anybody else knows. If you go across Gray Road 40, Gray, it's west of Gray Road 12 before you get to Walters Falls. It's about halfway in there on the south side of the road. There was two major, but they knocked everything down and built new. So through you, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Director Cornfield. Through Chair Wickens to uh, Mayor McQueen. Um, I do know the site you're referring to. Um, first off, that's off a of county road, so this this fill by law would not apply to that particular fill project. Um, if you recall from the previous uh, committee of the whole um, bylaw that was presented to the last term of council, um, lack of a better term, we were the, the bylaw was getting way too far down into the weeds of basic operations of day to day up uh, standard building practices. So there is an exemptions in this bylaw under the act that re references uh, under the egg. Um, I can't remember that bylaw. Maybe at least you can answer that quite, but, but for fence rule removal for agriculture, so that would be an exemption. Um, if somebody's doing a fill operation outside of aggregate that it requires that soil sampling would fall under this bylaw. Um, I, we refer to Alicia here if uh, there's anything else to add to that. Senator, your question, Mayor Queen? Yes, Mayor Queen. So if that same project was on our municipal road, and it was, I mean, just, yes, I understand if it's an account road, but if that same, I, I use it as an example, if, if that was being applied to our municipal roads, but it's, it's, it's a one-time thing where they're, they're just building the site and it's through mm. a building permit versus just filling up a hole or filling up a big hole. It's sort of part of a one-time thing where they're building the site for the buildings, the C4, commercial driveway, all that kind of stuff. You would soon surpass the 25. So would you still be required to have that or because it's an agricultural operation, you're exempt from it in that sense? Through yes, Chair yep. to Mary McQueen. If you keep referring to the specific one you're talking about, that's a fill operation. Cut and blunt, like there's nothing, there was no building permits pulled, there was nothing that was a fill operation. So that would fall under our bylaw at this point. So there would be, um, now when I say that, it's not on a municipal road, so they would have to identify it as a fill operation going on, going on within our municipality so that we're aware of it. So they're not utilizing our infrastructure. But if it was on a municipal road, yeah. then they would need to complete the full portions of the bylaw, i.e. enter into the hall road agreement, and then we would track the amount of material and the fees would apply to the cubic meters. Yes. So basically, if you needed to build anything to expand a commercial C4 for a barnyard and you're over 25, truckloads, you're going to have to take a fill permit for agriculture purposes. It's it's not necessarily for agriculture purposes, a C4 operation. No, 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 no. Well, it's being, <laughs> it's sort of that. It's yes, yes, through the, 
uh, ADU, whatever you call it, it is it is part of the agricultural operation. It is allowed because uh, off farm farm for off farm diversity uh, can can be can be used on off farm income for a farm. So my point is is without the C4, there may be still the application where somebody is building up their operation or expanding their barn or whatever. 25 truckloads don't go very far if you're building up a barnyard or building a driveway or, or you know, say you're, say you're changing to a, a dairy operation and you're bringing a milk truck in every day, you, you know, you have a long way. Wait, 25 trucks for agricultural purposes, whether it's a C4 or not, won't go that far if, if, you're, if you're upgrading your system or your, your, mark, your uh, operation. So through Chair Wickens to Mayor McQueen, um, it's still a site alteration to the yeah. site. Um, and that being said, um, it would still fall under the, this bylaw process. So any site alteration require it. And going back to um, the previous bylaw that was presented to council, it was at 300. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> and you know, yeah. is, is, this, is this a line in the sand? Um, at the 500, it is staff's best guess about what it feels large scale versus small scale right. fill operations. Um, this is our first kick at this bylaw as far as if, if council supports it and we have it act mm -hmm. actually active. Um, and if we find that we're basically impeding what we'll call normal construction processes, then we can revisit the actual um, 500 cubic meter threshold. Yes, Mayor McQueen. Well, okay, I, yeah, and I and I understand what we've been experienced with is, I took a screenshot on my Facebook. If you want dirt, you can sign up and get dirt to fill a hole or whatever. I'm talking, I, I'm sort of more specifically of going to getting aggregate material from from a pit and it's bringing to build your, or it could be on the farm itself. You can move stuff around. And I understand that versus making money and filling up a hole. I, we see that as well and stuff like that. I'll leave it. I'll leave that part for now. And I guess the part is, should we get some, some feedback from the agricultural side on this? And I like the 500 better than the 300. I'll, I'll sorry. I don't mean to wave my pen. I don't mean to do that. Um, and I, and, I, and I just wondered if there's a, an opportunity should this go out to the public just to get feedback on on that side. I understand the intention and I, I, I fully support supporting our saving our roads for something that. But there is a, I just think there is a little bit on that agriculture side, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Um, it does speak in there about being to expire after six months if it isn't acted on. And I think it sits in here at will. I wonder if it should say me, because I know the director yourself or whoever's in that spot has that authority. I'm just thinking if somebody took out a permit October 1st and for whatever reason it didn't come together, you got through the winter, six months is like uh, April 1st. I'm sure there's probably the ability because right now it says it will, but I, I, I just wonder if it in there should say may expire because of their circumstances, because of the winter, you can't you can't haul in the winter time, or maybe you wouldn't haul in the winter time, or whatever. I don't know. And then when you get into March and April, then you got half load, so then you you you're you're sort of limited on that part. Because um, anyway, it's just a small note in there. It says will, but I just wonder if it should change to me that it could it could pass six months at the discretion of the director. So before it expires. Yes, Director Cornfield. I I don't. Go ahead, Director Cornfield. Um, I think we, we got to take a step back here in the premise of the bylaw. Yeah. This bylaw is not necessarily um, restricting on the fill itself operation. It's to protect, as the note of a motion that came from council, is yeah. to set fees and protect the municipal infrastructure, whether that be culverts, bridges, road surface, subgrade. So, again, um, basically, if you choose to go through with a, an application or a process of having a fill operate large scale fill operation on your property, these are the elements you have to be able to execute to meet and protect our municipal infrastructure. Okay. Um, you did say that you, Mr. Chair, that if it's on a county road, it's, it's all about the road. So basically you're on a county road, 
no permit is required. Is that correct? Through Chair Wickens to the mayor, yes. It's not necessarily a permit, but you would have to register identifying that there's a fill operation going on within the municipality. And the reason that is in there is we get a lot of inquiries mm -hmm. um, about particular operations that may be or may not be have jurisdiction with the municipality. At least then we know they're registered and we know where they are and active and we can refer them to the um, agency that would be more um, responsible for the road infrastructure. So um, it is in, as, you, as we have in the bylaw, there is a, a rating of basically, if you have access off an MTO highway first, or a Gray County Highway, that would be the first two options before you would be able to be granted the municipal access hall road agreement. So we're encouraging people to use the roads that are constructed for the purposes of heavy equipment, heavy truck traffic, if you will. Okay, and so is there a cost to that or just registering? Or just, it's, uh, There's a registration fee of $150 for us to process okay. the application. Um, excess of soil from the province side, um, that came in in 2019, I forget the regulation, and that sort of changed, they sort of, they sort of regulate or follow where excess of soil is moving around in the province, these are supposed to, right, I don't know if that's changed or not, I, I know we got a legal opinion from Ed and, and all that stuff, and that came in in 2019, but at that time, the regulation still hadn't came really in place, and I don't know if the regulation, I know, uh, at least if you did some research on, on the regulations, but, um, the bigger part on that is, and we've heard from our public, is the quality of soil, right? The quality. And as I understand, that provincial legislation was supposed to be tracking the quality, as I thought. Is that right? So we don't have to worry about that? Um, so through OREG 1 or 40619, that's on site and excess soil management, anyone that is receiving material, they have to register through the ministry, the MECP, and all of the testing is facilitate, facilitated to them and kept in record. So we have no um, control, of control of that, essentially. And just following up with that through your chair, is there an amount that you have to like? If somebody got 25 truckloads, it's a truckload that's ex ex or there is a minimum threshold, and there's a certain amount of quantity that dictates how many tests you have. Um, that's that's all up to the MECP okay. and stuff, and that'll be in that regulation. It'll probably spell it that way. Like, okay, correct. Uh, the other question is do, you're not allowed to bring dirt onto the road, but sometimes I don't know how you clean a tire before you get to the road. Uh, I know you can put mud mats down. There's, there's certain things like that, but I wonder if it should be a little bit leeway of that you must clean or brush the road off daily. Like I, I know like construction sites and maybe even ourselves or whatever, it's pretty hard. I don't know how you clean the tire for, if, it's a, if it rains. I mean, we even got aggregate operations that track mud out to our road. I just wondered if there is written in there that the road must be cleared by a, in a daily mess because you get tractors with the brushers and we even have county guys come down and do the sand in our intersection. I just wondered if there's a little bit of flexibility <coughs> in that, that the road has to be cleared off daily or whatever. Like, like I don't know. I, I think uh, I've heard mud mats, mud mats that you put down, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's probably limited too. I mean, if you've got muck on the road, you need to clean it off. I, I, and I just wondered if that should be written in there that you need to make sure the road's cleared daily or whatever, because I mean, <laughs> Joe Farmer down the road has stuff comes out on the road too, right? But Dr. Cornfield, the chair wickets to Mayor McQueen. So we have seen this as an issue of yeah. uh, the existing, and there will be no. Um, um, they have to be compliant. Yeah. So if you're exercising a fill operation, it's a liability issue. It's a safety issue with tracking material out onto the road. Every subdivision that's gone up here in Markdale, they've been required to have um, mud bass, mud mats, yeah. um, whether that be an actual water traffic avian that actually removes um, to the best of the ability, yeah. obviously, you know, but there's been circumstances when, where they're dumping this fill, they're obviously in fill. So they're gonna track, but they need to be responsible and we can't allow them to have our roads mm -hmm. into a situation that would Again, liability and safety issues. So I, we're going to be pretty stringent on 
that process. Yeah, it's just in here, uh, Schedule A, Item 9, tracking of mud or dirt debris or on municipal highways. By last section, 111.7, there's a $500 fine for it, so. I just know some of our aggregate, aggregate license aggregate operations oh, yeah. track yeah. stuff out onto the road. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, it just, you know, anyway, I guess we have to be consistent there. Um, what was my last comment here? Um, just again, I, I sort of think this is something I, so site alteration, and when it says a site alteration bylaw versus just a fill bylaw, if, if Joe, landowner comes in with a motor scraper and decides to change the contour of his farm, his her farm, this has nothing to do with that. This is only to do with regards to on the road registering and, 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 the, and the issue around our roads. Do yeah. Through uh, Chair Wickens to Dep through Mayor McQueen. Um, yes, again, I revisiting, this is by law is protect our infrastructure. There are other agencies that govern um, the actual fill on the property themselves, whether that be ministry, NEC, or, um, or conservation. But, but I, yes, Mayor Queen, last I, comment. I know Dan, I know Councillor Wickens would relate to that because sometimes, uh, you, you know, you've seen a, a hill on a farm and there's <laughs> a hill and fill a hole and mm -hmm. there's one just on Highway 10, just outside of Fletcher, when that was done three years ago. And, uh, you know, you're making it better to, land you know i mean certainly if you're in the edc yes you, you know and in other areas but there is agricultural purposes that i think do have some exemptions as well and what you said about fence rows and sometimes you know farm farmers take hills and stuff like that but more specifically this is to do with the road so i guess that'll be my comments for now i, I do think this should go to a public a public meeting personally mr chair just in the sense that this is um something that is being put in place i know chatsworth has had it in place for a long time. And I think the 500 probably mirrors Chatsworth, which is, is something that they've had in place as well. So I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Deputy Deputy Mayor Nielsen. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chair uh, Wiggins. I'll just um, ask um, staff the same question. I sent an email in just so that the rest of council is aware. So section, 11 is the fee schedule of the bylaw. 11.3 uh, says the actual volume quantities will be determined by a pre and post construction topographic survey of the site alteration area. The survey and data analysis shall be completed by a qualified person retained by the owner. I'm just wondering if we understand what the cost is of that, only in the sense that um, if realizing the 25 loads helps understand, um, you could have a small one you know, maybe what Mayor McQueen talking about trying to do a site alteration for the purpose of building the envelope. You're trying to build your um, property or home or barn or whatever, adding extra costs. I'm just wondering if we have an idea of what that kind of like engineer coming in and doing a topographic survey. Is that something that'd be like a $5,000 cost? Is it a thousand dollar cost? Do we have an idea? Just sometimes we write a bylaw where we don't necessarily understand what that impact means as council. Yes. So through the chair to deputy mayor. Um, so that fee is not going to be on the municipality. It is going to be on the owner. Um, in regards to your site plan examples, they're already going to have a topographic survey in order to come up with their grading plan. So that cost is already um, incurred no matter what. Um, also, the fee is going to be dependent on the size of the fill operation because it is someone's time to go out and complete the survey of the property twice, essentially, um, and then to process the information. So I can't really give an answer because it is site specific, but for the most part, they already will have one topo complete. Thank you very much for that. And then the other um, section here was just that the 11.4 um, is that 50% of the fee will be required prior to any site alteration work start. So I'm trying to think, the uh, fill bylaw itself for the site alteration bylaw, the predecessor, the conversation started because of the item 14.3 on this agenda um, and the significant uh, land works that was happening there and, and the amount of fill being brought in. So I'm just, uh, I just, just, just a general comment that requiring 50% if 
costing wise. I think the fees were laid out there pretty well, but uh, will add up pretty fast if you're doing $1.10 per cubic meter and you have say, significant number of thousands, I would assume, <laughs> cubic meters of material uh, will add up pretty fast. So it was just a, more of a comment that um, I'm wondering if in different circumstances, if that's a, a, a harsh down payment to start works that might take a while. I guess one other question actually is, so the bylaw does state that it is a one year at a time. So every year they have to reapply for an extension or new application. Um, it's not a question. Answer my own question in my head. Thanks very much. So uh, <clears throat> we've dealt with this. We've spent quite a lot of time on this. Um, well, we've spent enough. Um, I don't know whether there is interest in taking this like to a committee that holds or to, do you want to go ahead and yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Wickens. Um, I don't disagree with Mayor McQueen that I would suggest public <coughs> engagement process similar to um, some of our other bylaws. Um, we're looking at doing with it, like same with the nuisance bylaw, um, before passing something like this, getting some community feedback. Um, I appreciate the amount of staff time needed. I don't think um, there didn't seem to be a significant number of questions that would warrant a committee to the whole, but moreover, get some community feedback mm -hmm. to the bylaw itself would be warranted. So the motion has been moved and on the floor currently, correct? Yes. So then an amendment to the motion is not needed according deferral is the answer. Thank you, Clerk Martel, uh, that we defer this to public consultation. Clerk Martel will put the words in my mouth. All right, so we have a motion on the floor for a deferral. Uh, through you, Chair yes. Wickens, yes, it would be that this item be deferred pending completion of public engagement prior to coming back to Council for consideration. Okay. So, for, uh, so uh, uh, <clears throat> motion made by Deputy Mayor Nielsen and seconded by Mayor McQueen. So any, uh, any more uh, comments? Yes. Councillor Lowhead. Thank you, uh, Chair Wickens. I just, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I genuinely wonder how much public um, input we're going to get on this bylaw. I mean, this this is specific, and there are. I know that this is going to affect some people in Gray Highlands, but it's it's. I mean, it's fairly niche. You gotta you gotta admit. And so, frankly, I wonder if this requires public input or if we can um, maybe get get some input from some you know particular members that we we know that this may affect or if we can you know enact the the bylaw and, and then simply you know um, welcome feedback uh, but requesting public input for this to, to me seems I have a feeling that it will be somewhat futile my two cents yes mayor McQueen well I, I, I recognize the Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate my colleagues' comments. I think it's unique in the sense that on the, uh, look, I think Deputy Mayor made a point of the next item 14.3, we're talking thousands of truckloads versus 25 truckloads as an exemption. So there's a lot of difference in between. And I know that there are circumstances, and I, I'm going to hold back any more comments at this time, but I think it's important to hear back the feedback is, I always remember all the years I've been on, it doesn't hurt to go because of nothing. You've done your due diligence and mm -hmm. so that somebody said, what the heck are you mm -hmm. doing, right? So I just think that that's good to get the feedback. This is something that's that has been boiling for a while, bubbling around. And uh, so I just think it's important that we do get yeah. the feedback. Well, I know, I know in my experience, 500 meters of earth is nothing, uh, really. Um, you start talking 5,000 meters, then you're starting to talk a significant quantity. Um, we have a motion on the floor. So, oh, so, oh, sorry, um, Councillor Allen, didn't see you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wondered what um, public consultation, what type of consultation council is thinking, whether this is going to be a a uh, in-person thing or if it's just going to be a, a survey on the website what are we thinking uh, 
I guess, yes, Mayor Nielsen, or Deputy <laughs> Mayor Nielsen. I've got the mayor stuck in my head. That's because he's doing the most of the talking, so no thank you, no thank you. Um, I, sitting here, both Mayor McQueen and myself are thinking the same thing that um, to Councillor Lohead's point, there might be a kind of a niche response and we are looking for kind of the agricultural response. Um, is my first instinct is to say a planning meeting. Is it something that we could put attached to a public planning meeting? And I know because there's planning meeting falls under its own legislation, but that's the kind of meeting we want or perhaps even may whatever we decide for that first town hall meeting is something where we can bring it up and have a discussion just to let people know what's going on and direct them for to make comments a lot of the agricultural community um, are not big fans or users of the computer of computers and and don't find that to be the most efficient way to communicate with the municipality or us as council so and that's the kind of the group we're looking for feedback from so i would almost say that first town hall that we're going to do or um, trying to have engagement with um, farming agricultural landowners in an in-person mechanism. Yes, C.A. Gove. Uh, thank you, Chair Wickens. Um, I'm just going to speak generally about bylaws, not specifically about the site alteration bylaw. Um, and I and I and I understand, you know, there's recent bylaws that have come into question and and you know, council are kind of second guessing things here. But at the end of the day, you're voted in to make the decisions. And I understand that certain items are hot topics and it's good to get community feedback. Mm -hmm. I think one, it's important to tell the community why you're asking for the feedback and, and set the expectations clearly that you're not asking them to make the decision, you're just asking for information so that you can make your decisions. So I'm thinking in the case of this bylaw, it might be a good idea for staff to come back with the bylaw and then the bylaw is kind of held in abeyance until you've had an opportunity to have public meetings to see if people have an issue with the bylaw before passing it, rather than setting up another opportunity for public engagement. Because if every issue comes up and we have to go to the public, one, it's delayed, two, it's an increase in staff time, council time. At the end of the day, you know, we need the business to keep moving. So um, I, get, I get where it's coming from, I totally understand it, but I think we have to look at the way we're doing it. and I, I, my suggestion to council would be to kind of hold it in abeyance. So don't approve the bylaw, have the bylaw published, and then you have an opportunity to have a, a town hall meeting shortly and see if any questions come up about it. And if questions don't or do, if they do, at least then council's got some information before they pass the bylaw. So it's just a suggestion to try and kind of tighten things and, and not have public engagement on every kind of contentious issue or not even contentious. Councillor Dubek. Okay, um, Councillor Dubek has given the floor to you, uh, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> Just one final quick comment for myself and I'll stop talking on this item, which is this that next to a particular land sale, this item 14.3 and a fill bylaw has been the number one conversation in my shop during my term of council. I've had more residents come in and talk to me specifically about this issue. So I think that there is more interest in what this bylaw looks like and how this bylaw affects the municipality than is understood necessarily at this table. I'm gonna to go to uh, Councillor Dubik first. Um, so, so there's obviously a lot of interest even at, at the council table. Um, I, I do like the idea of, of keeping pace and reaching out in tandem. I'm just wondering if we can sort of do kind of uh, these two items like in tandem, um, you know, as per Madam CEO's recommendation of just, you know, at least putting it, putting the bylaw out there. And um, if we do have specific items, like, you know, to me, what, I, what I'm hearing is, you know, or so, there are some questions around volumes, et cetera. So if we have specific questions, I'm just wondering, you know, if we just reach out to, you know, our egg societies and, you know, and, and just 
send it to them in terms of, you know, what's the feedback on, you know, ABC. Um, so we can sort of get that feedback right away. Um, so if we can do that in, in a more, in a, in, a, in a direct way, because it is a, you know, as we've stated, you know, sort of a niche issue that's, you know, that's impacting a very specific population of our, of our municipality. Oh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, Mr. Cornfield, sorry, Director Cornfield. To, uh, to you, Councillor um, Wickens, I just want to point out uh, under the recommendations that you're receiving this today, and that actually the bylaw is to be come forward at a next council meeting. So you're not actually approving the bylaw today. So you do have time to reach out to constituents as, as well. So just want to, just for a, some clarity as you're kind of struggling with how to move forward mm -hmm. with this. Thank you. Councillor Allen, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I did. Thank you, Chair Wickens. Uh, just um, again, a comment on the deputy mayor's comments. I, I understand that the public was really interested in this bylaw, but I think it's stemming from the first bylaw that was uh, brought forward. And this one is far less restrictive. So I don't think there'll be the public input that would have come or did come from the previous one. Thank you. All right. Uh, one more time, Mayor McQueen. Last comments. I won't we stop. We have a motion, amendment of the motion on the floor here, I believe. I won't stop. Now you get my defer. Up. I think one of the problems we bring it forward, I don't think it should be a site alteration bylaw. I think it should be a site fill bylaw because you go to the general public and say site alteration. It means you can't change your, your site. Like I said, a motor scraper or a different thing or a hill or, or so I think that's one issue. Exemption of 25. Uh, I'll tell you an example. When the County of Gray back in 2000. 1817 was was going through green and gray when they're looking at the corridors crossing people's lands. I'll tell you, you want to get the dandruff on, on people that own land. They they had a planner down here and the people are lined up at the door here at the ag office. So I, I would suggest that we could work with the ag office uh, through that. But we're talking about people's land here again. We have to protect our roads. Sorry, I don't mean the point. We have to protect, and staff have done a great job. I don't, you know, we need to get to that one spot. My point is we're talking about like I think personally, I think there should be a one-time exemption if you're doing site alterations to build buildings or build barns. That's just my opinion because it's a one-time deal. The issue that we're here today is because people are getting free dirt and they're putting it in a hole. Is that not why we're here? Yeah. Right. And they're, never they're, been getting paid, they're getting paid to receive well, it. Yes. I that's that that's all over the map, right? Yeah. Well, however that works and and and, and Contamination, I, I, I certainly feel it's good that the province is sort of regulating the, the type of soil because that was the biggest thing I heard is well, what's the soil, what type of soil this is. And, and we don't want contamination soil. We want to check, we want all that stuff. There's a, I, I think we're going, but I, I was hesitant to bring the bylaw forward because I think there may be some alterations to that bylaw. But when you go to people and say, this is a site alteration bylaw, the first thing I'm going to say is the McIntyres and, and, and uh, all the other people are going to say, what do you mean a site alteration bylaw? Because they're doing site alterations all the time. You know that, Dan. They go in and they do absolutely. They, they do ever they, they have they have big trucks and they move and they yep. they move dirt. And so that's going on. And and we talk about the discussion this morning about improving agriculture. Guess what they're doing? They're improving agriculture. Well, they're changing agriculture and and making. There's a lot of discussion there. So I think we need to go out in a proper way. Because I can just imagine if we bring the bylaw forward and there is no comments, it's okay. But if we bring the bylaw forward, they'll say, well, you guys already determined that. It, it, you know, this is not a unique, this is not just a regular bylaw. Uh, you know, this is something that's affecting people's land. We have to protect, sorry, I don't mean to point, we have to protect our roads. I don't mean to do that. I, 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 there's no disregard to staff or I just think we need to do it. It's been two years, pretty well to the month that this was here before. Um, I just think, I understand that the regular exemption of 25 truckloads is one thing, but I think there has to be an option for a one time or there's an exemption or there's an exemption to council, depending on it is. I, I don't know what that could be. I just, I just think that 
you know, there's a lot of changing in our agricultural rural lands and it's there, there's a lot of people out there, they're, they're not bringing in dirt from somewhere else. Their intentions is a one-time thing, changing building yards. What's the intent of here? We're trying to control this dirt coming in from somewhere else. And I think we just have to get it right. So what that looks like for public engagement, I can talk to Lori next door. I think we can look at, I think I agree with you, Deputy Mayor, the people that may be, be coming here won't be doing a survey. All right, so I think we need to set aside a time and advertise it. And if we get no comments, we move ahead. All right, Mayor McQueen, CA Govan, you had your hand. Okay, Manager Milner. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Just through you to Mayor McQueen, in regards to the name of the bylaw, whether it's site alteration or fill, under the Municipal Act, they actually go hand in hand, site alteration and fill, so we won't be able to split them. Um, it will have to say site alteration and fill, just for clarity. Just point of order on that, so that's the clarity that we need to provide to people because people will see that as, you mean I can't change the hill, right? That's it's all in the, it's all in the interpretation and the wording because people will, well, I, I just know that uh, the McIntyre brothers move a lot of hills. <laughs> they move a lot of dirt, just as an example, right? Yeah. So we have a motion on the floor to defer this. Uh, if there's any, no other comments or questions, I don't see Councillor Allen on the screen. There he is. Anything else, Councillor Allen? No. All right, then we'll put it to a vote. Uh, motion to defer. Those in favor? Opposed? That motion's carried. So, I'm not very good at chairing. So, we go, that's it? That's all? Good? That's all, folks. 14.3. Thank you, Councillor Lowhead. Right on the ball. Wilcox Lake imp uh, Road Improvements. The Council received staff report TPS 23.14 and the Council directs staff to work with Canadian Environmental Resource Management to create a detailed design and schedule for reconstructing Wilcox Lake Road. Can I have a motion to put this on the floor? Yes, Deputy Mayor Nielsen. Seconder? Councillor Lowhead? Any questions or concerns about this? Mayor McQueen. Thank you and good on staff. I don't know how you did it. Kudos. Uh, that was always been an issue. Wilcox Lake Road is getting some road improvements there. And that. the question I have is, this isn't here, they'll do it, but they're gonna haul for two more years and then they'll fix if there's need to be fixed. Um, question for you to the director or staff is, does it make sense from the economies of, economies of scale, if they're doing the short section, 360 meters or whatever it is, does it make sense that we do the road all at the same time, just in the sense of piecemeal? And I don't know if, you're, if we would be able to work with a contractor that would do, or they're gonna do it, or they're gonna give a contract, or it, it would be just a quote and they would go ahead. Obviously they'd have to meet a certain requirement they talked about uh, putting material in the bed and whitening or whatever, shouldering and stuff. But I just wondered, does it make sense to, to do the whole section of road at the same time? And then you have the economies of scale versus a short piece. Director Cornfield. Future workings to Mayor McQueen. Um, so staff had had this on, would have been part of the 2023 um, capital projects plan. However, after reaching out to the Phil site operators, um, they had indicated that they would not be completed within 2023. So we did not present that in front of council. So this letter of intent has kind of made a bit of a game changer um, that they're willing to uh, reconstruct the section of a road to a four season road that would allow them additionally to haul year round to the entrance to their site. Um, at this point, there is no budget allocation it's a, a substantial number to complete all the way out to Durham Road B. 
Um, that being said, um, I think we indicated in the report that we would be presenting that as part of the 2024 budget deliberations. And we are getting a little later in the season to um, going to tender on such large projects. Uh, it may not be able to get a contractor or price will be relevant to their ability to fulfill <coughs> the contract. Yeah. So those are some of the factors as why we did not indicate in the report of other options. Um, mainly there, at this point, there would be no budget for that particular project. Just to follow up that, could they hold off their section till next year and do it all at once? And we put it in the, we put it in the next year's budget. Then I know it's getting pretty tough. I know I see the road pictures and stuff like that. It just, I just think the economies of scale of doing it both at the same time and, and you bring it forward through through staff to to budget next year and and reconstruct it all at the same time and then they pay their portion through uh, uh council witness to mayor mcqueen so the intent would be that um no different than our connecting link or any of our larger project that the first lift would be the first year and then the second year they would be putting the second lift on so it's not that we wouldn't have availability to reconstruct the other section um, by postponing it. And again, as per the resolution or uh, the recommendation to council, it's to engage with Mark, with the uh, corporation for the staff to see if we can determine exactly what the fit will work for both them and the municipality. Um, I can tell you right now, the road surface will not sustain. So if we're going to postpone it, it will be returned to gravel. Um, and it may be to the point now that that might happen before if depending on what their timing to move forward with the reconstruction because it's gone beyond the point of being able to patch repair mayor mcqueen so just the last comment it just seems i i yeah the pictures it is getting pretty tough patch 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 hopefully, hopefully they're paying for the patching um it just to say that there's two more years and you're right the second lift would be put on when we go to do the road so yeah okay i, I was just thinking economies of scale and trying to do it right the first time and, and that sort of thing but if they got two years left gosh that thing keeps moving on hey he keeps dragging on but anyway that's the comments for now thanks any other questions or concerns We'll uh, put this to uh, to a vote then. All those in favor? That's carried unanimously. Uh, Fourteen point four side road A bridge structures update. Uh, council received staff report TPS twenty three point one five, and the council support the addition of structure E four to the scope of work and that council support preceding the 60% design for the replacement of bridge E4, E5, E6, and E12. The council authorized staff RJ Burnside to prepare and submit an application for funding through the disaster mitigation and adaptation fund. Can I have somebody make a motion to bring this to the floor? Councillor Dubeck, second by Councillor Lohead. Discussion? Councillor Lohead. Thank you, Chair Wickens. So uh, I was under the impression that um, these bridges were part of the, um, the discussion about the, the proposed developments uh, on Talisman. So uh, um, somebody could correct me if I'm wrong here, but I thought that there was, um, there was discussion with the, the developers about uh, them <clears throat> undertaking the reconstruction of uh, this road either in whole or in part and uh, this infrastructure either in whole or in part. So I could just get some clarification as to where we are on that. Director Cornfield. Uh, to Chair Workings, to Councillor Lowhead. Um, there has been at no consideration with any developer most recently for participating in any up road upgrades of seven um, I, there was at one time, I'm going to date myself here. I'm looking to Mayor McQueen here, maybe to help bail me out on it. But at one time there was a plan of condominium on what I'll call the old tube hill. 
And um, that at that point, it was attached to road upgrades. Um, <laughs> but uh, at this point, um, to my knowledge, there has been no um, consideration for uh, any of the, I'll say the Talisman lands development to participate. Um, it is my understanding they will be utilizing Talisman Mountain Drive for the development. So um, this for council that uh, most recently come on board here, um, these bridges uh, have been on staff and council's radar for 25 years, <laughs> probably um, 20 anyways. And um, most recently it was to undertake um, a study because the infrastructure at this point um, especially the first bridge off Gray Road 7 is to the point we cannot keep pro prolonging <coughs> their replacement. So the direction was to do the hydro study, which Burnsides has been engaging with us at this point, and um, to include the fourth bridge because it is basically a system. It's not just a simple one bridge, one river. Um, it's multiple, um, it's an, an encompassing system. So it's gonna take some time to get this to a 90% design. And it's gonna take some quite a bit more time to actually get all the approvals in place for the reconstruction. And staff's concern at this point to move, keep moving forward is that one bridge right at the, uh, that is deteriorating to the point it needs attention. Sorry, I may have add that I believe we have a consultant from Burnside's um, should there be any technical questions about the study as well, to the report. Okay, any other questions or concerns? Mayor McQueen? Well, there's two options here. You've got option one and option two. Which means something This is what you require. This is a million dollars to the side, and you could qualify for 20 percent right? We can't hear the, uh, the mayor. I guess it helps if I turn my mic on. Sorry about that, Councillor Allen. I'll start again. So um, there are two options in the report, uh, option one and option two. And in the report, it says there is a billion dollar funding available and eligible municipal projects will receive up to 40% of the total expenditure. So just an option two, all bridges. And I, I would agree with uh, Director Cornfield that these bridges have been on the radar for quite a long time because they're, they're not getting any newer and there's four in that strip, but option two has a total amount of 3.9 million. And it is a big, a big number. And I'm sure that will continue to get higher as time goes on. But 40% of that is 1.5 million, um, which I think is pretty, we don't see that kind of stuff anymore. You don't see 40% funding. So, you know, I mean, this is, you're moving this forward. The design is certainly the start with, but I think just like our connecting link, um, certainly we, we can be advocates to the, uh, this, is this federal or provincial money? Anyway, we can be advocates on both sides, but I just, I just think that I've never, I just don't recall seeing 40% funding on bridges. And I, I look at that as, as something that, uh, I think something that we really need to seriously look at as a council, and I would support option two and and making that application for that. Just in the sense of, I know it's a big chunk. We have a lot of bridges. There's a lot of water there. I understand what uh, Councilor is, is saying, and I know the only thing I can relate to that is what the director said in 2006. There was, I think it was 2006. It was after Jake Hammer sold the resort and Bill. Minutes, trying to think who was, it. yeah, had it, and they proposed condominiums and stuff, and there was a public meeting, and, and that's as far as it go. And I think there was some discussion from staff at that time that uh, if if that's going to be your, you know, could we try to get some some upgrades to that for increased driveway or increased traffic on that road? But that's sort of I think where it was left. We have no idea what's happening here, but I, I, I certainly think that we need to, to move forward with the option to and apply or see if we can get 40% funding. So I'll leave it at that. I, I would move option two, Mr. Chair. Oh, is there? For option two or option one? 
What's on the agenda? Well, I'm sort of reading to myself, maybe. On the bottom of that motion, it does say council authorized staff and RJ Burnside to prepare and submit an application for funding through the disaster mitigation and adaptation adaptation fund. So if you're going to make an application, you're going to know which option you're. Are you not? Do you not? Director Cornfield. Uh, through uh, uh, Chair Wickens to Mayor McQueen. Um, sorry for if there's confusion here, but basically, the, as the recommendations read, the first study included the, uh, although it's a system, it only was focused on the three bridges for replacement. But now that we've determined that it's a system, that the fourth bridge be included, that is option two yeah. as part of the study and the repl overall eventual replacements of all four structures. And that council authorize us to prepare, working with Burnside's engineering to prepare an application for the disaster um, uh, mitigation oh. fund. And I believe it is a federal E4. funded program. So point of order, I see E4, E5, E6, and E12. Is that the four bridges? That is correct, sir. Okay, so that, that, that answers that answers it. Sorry, thank you. Deputy Mayor Niels. I'm trying to look at a close up on the GIS County map. None of these fit for culverts, right? They're all in need of continuing with the bridge. Um, I, if Matt, uh, Matt Brooks is our uh, consultant, um, these are some of the conversations we've had. Is uh, Amanda, is, uh, is Matt available? And I'll maybe let him refer to some of the structural and proceeding with the design stage. Um, Matt, are you able to unmute yourself now? Sorry about that. Yeah, so part of that study, um, if we're able to get that funding, we would be upsizing bridge E4 and E12, and the two central bridges, E5 and E6, would be made smaller into uh, culverts. That is the intent. Yes, Director Cornfield. So um, through Chair Wickens to Matt, um, just give some clarity. Um, I don't want them to think that it's going to be a corrugated pipe um, on what the definition of culvert is. Sorry, yeah, so it would be a precast box culvert. Yes. We're on the same page now. Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. Councillor Lowhead. Thank you, Chair, because I guess I, I've got two questions. Um, one, just for, out of my own curiosity, I'm sure that this is considered, but I know that, that this section, as a, as a resident of Kimberley and as a fly fisherman, I know that these hold resident trout and our migratory trout routes. I'm just I'm hoping that um, that has been considered in the, uh, uh, the type of culvert that's going to be implemented. And then two, I know I'm gonna get some questions about this from the folks who live on 7A and Shilvox Side Road. Um, five months of the year, that's a, <clears throat> a dead end um, with no exit uh, as the Talisman Road is impassable or it could be anyway. So is there gonna be, will the, will the bridges be out completely or will there will be some consideration for them to be able to egress from there to their homes? Yes, Director Cornfield. Through Chair Wiggins to Councillor Lowhead. So obviously that structure will be out and depending on, and again, when we move forward with the design with Burnside's engineering, we'll determine if you do one or two of them at a time, but they all have to be staggered probably for financial reasons and for construction. So you're absolutely right. Egress out of that is only seasonal. And at summertime, it's, it's a challenge and even at the summertime with the switchbacks. So we would have to look into some way of making sure we had, i.e. entering an agreement with the adjacent landowners to 
utilize Talisman Mountain Road um, and uh, possibly the parking lot that they could access Shivlock Drive and the uh, uh, residents on the other, uh, sorry, the west side of the bridges. That would be our plan, but we're a little ways from that at this point. Um, but you know, those will be some of the mediation things we'll have to consider as the design is completed and we move forward to construction. But those things are captured. Okay. Any other discussion, Mayor McQueen? Two things uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the director. Obviously, we have, I think currently Burnside does our inspection of our bridges every two years. Um, I don't know if you've indicated in here the status of that inspection. Um, so that's one question. And obviously it's, yeah. And maybe I'll wait for that answer and I'll ask my second question then. Dr. Cornfield. Through Chair Wickens to Mayor McQueen, um, the annual B BCI inspections have already been awarded to Birdside's uh, engineering. So they'll be conducting them out throughout the summer. So just to follow up with that, but we have some data because they've been inspected. So I guess my question is, is uh, of an index, currently what's the index on that bridge? Because we do get our bridges inspected every two years. So obviously is it low, medium, high? I don't know how, they, I forget how they index it. So, Councillor Wickens to Mayor uh, McQueen, I'll defer that to uh, uh, Matt to uh, respond on, I believe the closest structure to Gray Road 7 is of the most urgent. So, Matt? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, so, when we do a bridge, a bridge uh, condition insect, uh, index, um, a tour is about 40. And structure E12, which is at the corner of Side Road 7 8 and Gray Road 7, is 39, which is generally should be replaced within one year. Um, the other three structures but range from uh, the low 50s to 60, which is generally a replacement within 10 years. What should also be noted is that the funding as part of this application is good until 2032. That's why. Alicia had mentioned that this could be phased over multiple years, or the Chris, Chris had also mentioned that this could be phased over multiple years. Mayor McQueen. So my, that, that leads into my sort of more of a comment. And I'm trying to think, I think Chris, you were here when the lower, we had two bridges fail in one year, the lower Valley road, because I think it was lower Valley where the greater went through the bridge. It was Graham. Graham Road, okay. And then the other one was uh, Quiet Valley. No, it wasn't Quiet Valley. What's that one on 19th? Epping, yes, the Epping Bridge, where we were doing our inspections and then I think a canoeer <laughs> was going underneath and says, why is that brace not there? So we had two failures in one year, which we had to fix. Obviously we did ventured it, but we like, you know, greater went through one and another one, we had hydro, one was doing a, a, an upgrade on a power line down there and they were driving all over that bridge and then <laughs> we had to close it up. I don't know if you have any comments to that, Chris, but we, some, you know, they fail, they fail. And, and uh, you know, I think as Councilor O'Head is, you know, there's people live down there. It just, it, when they fail, they, we had to close the bridge. We had to have a special meeting and close that Epping Bridge because we couldn't let people go across it. I don't know if that's any comments to our director, Mr. Chair. Through Chair Wickers to Mayor McQueen, I'm going to refer to Matt again because this is a conversation we had a number of years ago um, on um, OSM, OSM um, requirements and bridge inspection. So we have what we what I call, maybe Matt doesn't, but more of a modified um, uh, bridge inspection numbering. So Matt, if you can comment on how we go about that process now. Yeah, so since those failures or the closures of the Epping Bridge and the one on uh, Grams Hilt Road, um, the bridge inspections have been modified slightly to have a bridge condition index for each uh, individual element. So if, if the element is in poor condition, it would flag it that the structure should be replaced just based on one specific element. Um, maybe the overall bridge condition index of the structure might be in about a 50, but the bridge deck might be down around 30. Uh, this 
came up on uh, the Yville structure. I believe a couple of council meetings ago, there was a photo of like the underside of the bridge deck where the soffit was in very poor condition. You, you could see all the steel. So that same condition, what you saw on uh, the Yville structure is very similar to bridge E12 and actually E12 is probably in worse uh, condition. Okay, any other questions, comments? So all those in favor of uh, going ahead with this? That's carried unanimously. Ah, uh, that's the end of my uh, little ditty here. I'll uh, give the chair back to Mayor McQueen and, and uh, hope that he's gonna give us just a little break here. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Wickens, and uh, thanks for doing that. Uh, one more item, uh, consent agenda. There are none. <laughs> so I can get past that, which I was sort of shocked when I was reading that. Uh, we'll take a moment. Uh, we, we got six and, section 16. We'll take a break. We'll come back at uh, 4 o'clock.
Did we lose everybody? <coughs> okay, we'll call this we'll call this meeting back to order. Uh, okay, so we're at the uh, notice of motions. I think that's where we were. Sixteen, wasn't it? Yes. And Councilor Allen is is on the screen, so uh, I'm going to pass this portion to you, Councilor Allen, to speak to your notice of motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So let me mute that. Um, yes, so we had a doctor recruitment committee back in um, 2010 to 14. I believe it ceased to exist perhaps in about 2004. 14 or 15. And um, we had a, the senior advisory committee, we had a presentation from um, Alex Hector, the ex executive director of the CHC. And we talked uh, doctor recruitment and retention. And I came out right out and asked him if we should be um, recruiting locally ourselves. And he said, yes, um, we are the main catchment area for the CHC and the new hospital. And he felt it would um, it was very important for us to be involved. Um, he suggested, or there was discussion about including the hospital um, or not specifically the hospital, but the foundation or the, what would it be? The, the Gray Bruce Health um, Services and um, perhaps neighboring municipalities like uh, Southgate and West Gray and Chatsworth. So um, brought it forward and I will make that motion that council support the re-implementation of a South Gray doctor recruitment and retention committee and to discuss next steps, potential partners, and provide direction to staff. Okay, so you're putting that on the floor? Yes. Okay, uh, do I have a seconder for that, uh, Councillor Allwood? Do you have any further dis uh, point to that, Councillor Allen? Um, I don't think so. I guess if there are questions, then we'll try to answer questions. Okay, I'll go to, thank you, Councillor Allwood. Yep, uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship, through you to uh, Council and Councillor Allen. I mean, we, we, we had the uh, Joint Municipal Physicians Recruitment and Retention Committee. Uh, I believe I'm appointed back to that committee should it reinstate, but uh, that was a committee uh, of the town of the Blue Mountains and, and it wrapped up. I know there is a task force um, up in the Owen Sound area that involves the Owen Sound Family Health Team. The, uh, the CHC has a kind of a unique situation in terms like when Alex was here and uh, delegated to us. Um, he mentioned that they would have no problems recruiting doctors, but the issue with the CHC is that the, the way they pay their doctors and how they're funded. So it's not through OHIP. The family health teams and uh, family docs are, uh, have different billing arrangements. So the issue with the CHC is funding. So they did apply for $1.4 million, I believe, and uh, got $250,000. Mm -hmm. uh, there still is a request for, for funding. At, at the last AMO conference, uh, we delegated to the Minister of Health and Deputy uh, Premier and uh, Sylvia Jones and looked for funding for primary care. But I mean, the, uh, the CHC has no, cannot take on any new uh, patients right now. I mean, the roster is full. Um, the docs that we do have in Gray Highlands are getting to be of an age. Uh, as are a lot of family practitioners uh, where they're, they're going to be looking at uh, retiring. And, uh, you know, they were taking on rosters, say, of on average of 2,000 patients, whereas new docs aren't, aren't interested in taking that many. So there's an estimate that it takes one and a half new doctors to replace every family practitioner. So it, it's an urgent need. Um, I, uh, and it's something I, that I'm very passionate about and I'd love to be involved if we, uh, if we choose to uh, undertake and reach out to our neighboring municipalities. But uh, there, there is the task force 
up and on sound, which I unfortunately don't have a lot of information about, but I think it's it's a need that that continues. Uh, it's re reliant on provincial funding, and uh, um, I, I I think putting putting it together. I know that Councilor Allen and I, Allen and I did talk about this, uh, perhaps on the last term of council. But uh, it, you know the, the need hasn't gone away, and uh, I I would support this. No. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councilor. Well, just before I go to other questions, uh, tell me about nurse practitioners. Is that something you can also recruit? Because the CHC has nurse practitioners. I just wonder if that should be added to this as well, because it's sort of halfway there, right? I don't, I don't know. I know that uh, nurse practitioners have, have a certain mm -hmm. ability. I don't know, Councilor, right. if you being on the CHA, if you have any comments there. Sure. Well, I mean, nurse practitioners can be, uh, are considered primary care. Okay. Providers, so uh, it's. I mean, the the generation that I grew up into had a family doctor for for forty years and right. finally retired. But that 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 way of uh, providing primary care now seems to have passed. Most young docs are not interested in hanging a shingle on their own office and and taking on all of the administrative functions. So they they want to be part of a family health team or a, a community health center as the CHC is. So uh, within Within the CHC, they have, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, more nurse practitioners than doctors, but, you know, it, it uh, nurse practitioners can take on some of the, uh, a lot of the issues, and uh, they have the family docs there, and uh, they, you know, and nurse practitioners can refer you on to specialists too, so, but they, they're primary care facilitators, right, so the new hospital is acute care and emergency care, prim you know, primarily, it's, it's not, if you're winding up in a merge with primary care of things, you're, you know, you're in the wrong place, but right. that's what people are doing these days because they have no other option and it's not cost effective. And there's a discon there's issues with the continuity, continuity of care, right? So you're, when, when you're dealing with a family doctor or a primary care provider, they've got your health records in place, uh, you know, access to your health records in emergency departments is, is sketchy sometimes. Uh, I know they're working on resolving that and um, as they put the Ontario health teams together uh, to replace the LINs, uh, you know, maybe some of those things are gonna change. But the, the thing is, yes, nurse practitioners can provide primary care. So can a nurse practitioner have a roster of patients that can do certain things or do they work into another setting that they are just providing the service up to what they can do, but they have to have a roof over their head that they don't have a roster of patients or can they have a roster of patients? Um, it, it gets a little complicated there. I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a position to speak accurately right. to that, but they, they, they do help the CHC deal with their complete roster of patients. Right. As a, as a uh, client of the CHC, it's not uncommon to not have the same nurse practitioner when you book your appointment. And there are a couple of issues. One is a lot of them are younger and are on family leave or, and there's a lot of competition for that type of position. So people move around a little bit, but uh, um, they, they, add, they add to the number of rostered patients that the CHC can service. But there's limits on that based on on staffing and that staffing is primarily due to the funding that they receive. So they, they, they believe, and I, as a part of their board have seen demonstrated that, you know, their numbers and performance, they can provide those services more efficiently. And, uh, and it is one of the top rated, uh, they're, they're in the Alliance of uh, community health centers. Um, right. That may not be the exact title, but they're, they're one of the top performers. We have, we're very lucky to have that, facility in Gray Highlands and not only just Gray Highlands, but it, it also services uh, Dundalk and Chatsworth and but primarily Gray Highlands. Thank you. So, so a doctor's like a, like, a, like a contractor, he, he, that person looks at you, they bill the province to get, to get paid through billing, but a nurse practitioner would be a, a salary person that would work under the umbrella of a facility like CHC. They don't, nurse practitioners don't do billing, do they? Again, it gets. Sorry, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, yeah, Mayor McQueen. It gets complicated. The CHC doesn't bill through OHIP, so uh, yeah. they, they do things differently. Ontario Family Health Teams, which do have nurse practitioners, do do some billing through OHIP, and I'm not quite sure how it all works, but 
it is complicated and uh, and at the end of the day it, it you know the the actual funding and how how these services are prov provided for and paid for is the issue so my last but question in recruiting um, primary care practitioners to uh, to gray highlands and um, the surrounding municipalities I mean it's not just it's not just you know it's the lifestyle that they need to know that one they have got an affordable home that's one of the big things when you talk to the uh, we uh, entertained first year medical students last year you know it's it's the quality of life in the in the in the area they're going to be practicing uh, the schools or kids are going to be going to uh, the price of a home there, there are lots of things beyond just having a, a place to work that uh make a place attractive to a, a new primary health care provider, whether it be a nurse practitioner or a doc. So my, my question is to the mover and yourself, should you include doctor recruitment and nurse practitioner on your on your roster? Because it, I don't know, I asked that question to you, Councillor Allen. We can include that. We can, like, it's not restricting what we do here it's not just that we're going to recruit doctors i wouldn't think uh, that'll be in the terms of reference of the uh, committee yeah hey thank you i'm going to go back to councillor owen and, and then councillor Wick. sorry on that on that subject i think primary care practitioner is the you know the phrase you want to use and that would capture both okay just, just, you, you know because you know you got to think outside the box maybe a little bit and it, it's all that stuff councillor Rickens. You might want to add uh, nurses on that as well, because there is uh, there is competition now, even in our local area. My my daughter is my daughter is one. So being pulled in being pulled in two different directions, absolutely. Right. Yep, and they're the ones that carry the load, right? Don't throw it. I, I was actually going to add to that my last comment there that uh, Councilor Wickens. It's not just you know the primary care; it's the support that you need from the nurses, uh, and, and even in our hospitals, you're seeing, you know, the uh, the work life balance that the, these nurses have to put up with. They they can they can work at a community health center where they work nine to five and their day is done. They've got a support team around them. It, it's not the same in hospitals, and hospitals are now forced to uh, go to contract nurses, which cost a lot more money. But you know they they can't open those beds unless they've got staff in the facility, uh, they have to shut, you know, in Chesley, they shut down their emergency department for a while. But all of our local hospitals, I believe, are facing issues with nursing. And uh, again, it's not necessarily primary care unless you're going to the emergency department for your primary care, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a big issue. Yes, and, and I remember back in the 90s, and there was a time where they, thought they had too many nurses and look at our problem today we cut back on on that so uh, any other comments to the notice of motion that's on the floor um mayor. thank you very much mayor mcqueen and to the mover and the seconder so during the last term of council councillor allwood was on the physician recruitment group and organized out of the tunnel mountains area which serviced Great Highlands and Tumba Mountains and Collingwood and Wasaga Beach. And we have a doctor recruitment situation going on in Owen Sound. And we have the doctor recruitment from the CHC and the hospital working because it's being built and doing doctor recruitment. And I believe it was two or three budgets in a row, Councillor Alwood, you might be able to correct me, at least two that we did not support financially into this. Um, I don't, I don't disagree in the need. I, I'm just curious as to what will actually come of this. What would be, what will Gray Highlands actually do? In the past, Councillor Allwood uh, has been our voice at a few different tables. And um, I support that, in, that initiative, but Gray Highlands as a whole hasn't put a budget amount in towards this. And if our goal is to, create a doc, uh, re reconstitute or re-implement the South Gray Doctor Recruitment and Retention Committee, will this council support it financially? Will we be working with the groups that are already doing doctor recruitment? Are we, are we a, uh, um, Councillor Allen, you said 
that the conversation at the senior advisory committee was that, you know, having us at the table would be a, uh, a benefit that, that we are in the catchment area. We have, we are home based to the CHE, we're home based to the Markdale hospital. Um, then if we're, if we're going to be a benefit, then I think it's great. I think it, if we're going to do this, then I think we need to be looking at um, and, and see this council willing to put a budget towards it. I, I just, um, when I look at the re recent history of what Greyhounds has done, I don't know where, where we'll benefit here and, and, and how much um, support we can give through Grey Highlands um, or, or what the, um, what our great, what, what Greyhounds ability is here. And I, and I tossed with even trying to bring up that negative t negativity to this motion. Cause I, I don't disagree, and, and Councillor Allwood has done a fantastic job reiterating time and time again that this is um, a need in our area. It's a need across the province, and and we are in competition with areas across the province to try to get doctors and nurse practitioners to your area. Um, just, I wonder if Greyhounds will actually step up, or if we'll actually be able to be um, a benefit to this conversation. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe direct that back to Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Previously, I, I forget how much was put in by Gray Highlands and Southgate, but it wasn't a lot of money each year. It may have been a thousand or two. This is run by or with volunteers from the community. And so expenses usually were like advertising and, and going to uh, job fairs and things like that. But it's not a, to me, a high budget item. Um, the, I think the reason, well, I'll speak for myself. The only reason I didn't support the regional um, committee was because it was such a large area. It spanned three or four or five uh, municipalities, two different counties, the chances of, of getting doctors is low. The chances of that doctor specifically picking Gray Highlands was even lower. So um, I think we need to be focusing on recruiting to Gray Highlands. And what better way than um, Gray Highlands uh, counselors, uh, Gray Highlands doctors, a hospital that is located in Gray Highlands, a CHC that is located in Gray Highlands. We've already got all sorts of people coming to this area and we just need to try to get a few of them to be doctors. Uh, it's, I was going to say it's as simple as that. It, it sounds simple, but it, it, it isn't. But um, I, I just think if we don't do anything, then those are the that's the result we're going to get um so it's it's up to council whether they feel this is a, a need and whether they're willing to participate um financially um to the cause uh, mayor any follow-up okay. right I, one time i know there were three doctors that lived in Grey Highlands, that practiced in Collingwood, <laughs> that lived in Grey Highlands. So that's just what I knew of. Councillor Allwood. Thank you, uh, Mayor McQueen, through you to Council, Councillor Allen. I mean, the ask from that Joint Municipal uh, Physician Recruitment and Retention Committee was for $25,000 from each of the member municipalities with the idea of hiring a professional physician recruiter. Um, and they have their own association. And uh, that wasn't embraced by the council today in Grey Highlands or some of the other council council members. But uh, the task force in Owen Sound, which I think is a, has a private members um, too. I don't think it's just a municipality, the municipalities involved. It's the Ontario uh, health team, family health team, and some, uh, some members of the private sector. And at the, the wrap up of the last committee that I was involved in, there was a white paper published and it showed statistically what the results were. It showed what some of our competitors were doing in terms of incentives, which included providing free housing 
for doctors and, and cash incentives and how effective it was and, and things like that. So that, that, that's part of our records. It's, it was, it was um, on an agenda at one of our council meetings. Um, you know, I, I think we, this motion says we need to provide direction to staff. I mean, staff should probably reach out to our member, uh, uh, neighboring municipalities and see if there's an appetite. So did we not do that last year? I thought there was a motion that we reached out to our neighboring municipalities. Madam C and I see, I see Councilor Al, but Madam C uh, Thank you, Mayor McQueen. Yes, the, the motion was that we reach out to our member municipalities to see if there was any interest in forming a group, like a multi-municipal group. Yeah. Um, it was brought up at the um, regional, uh, uh, Great County CAO's um, uh, monthly meeting and at that point there was no appetite but that was just at the staff level that's right. where yeah. I was asked to take it that's right go ahead as I recall that motion was you know we were talking we're going to be talking to Southgate and perhaps Chatsworth it wasn't uh, it didn't include Collingwood which was involved in the other um, committee uh, along with Clearview and uh, mm -hmm. Town of Blue Mountains Meaford yeah. and ourselves um, so, so Councillor Allen, do you have a, a comment? I was going to say that we should reach out and ask the neighboring municipalities um, that are in the catchment area of the CHC and the hospital to ask council if there's an appetite. Um, and going back to the um, comment um, about incentives and things like that. Um, one of my visits to the hospital to, uh, to get my, <laughs> my thumb rebuilt um, was the comment was you cannot entice doctors to the area. You need to show them the um, benefits of living in Gray Highlands and they need to want to come um, or that they grew up here and they want to come back to Gray Highlands, giving them $50,000 and a place to live um, works for a, a little while until the time frame that is required for them to stay runs out and, and then they're, they're gone. So they need, to, they need to want to come to Gray Highlands. So to me, it's our job to get out there and, and promote um, just like we do with the economic um, development um, of Gray Highlands. We need to do that for doctor recruitment. And I think that was at one time, I think Chapman's, uh, David Chapman put up some money and I think they did uh, in, in, in uh, had a person come and they stayed for a period of time and then they left right after the- <laughs> And the, after the, the rotary, rotary put up some money too. Yeah, that's right. But sorry, Deputy Mayor. To, to me, Thank sorry, you, just Mayor. just just one last comment. I think the companies you mentioned, Chapman's, uh, Ice River Springs, some of the larger employers, they they would welcome this, I believe, because they need um, employees, and that's one of the things people look at um, when they are considering moving to a community uh, among other things obviously but but yeah. doctors is a big one so right on. thank you very much mayor mcqueen just trying to understand the motion as it's worded is this suggesting that so it says next and discuss next steps potential partners and provide direction to staff it feels like, like this is given direction to have this as a council item at the next one or are you looking for amendments to actually give that direction to staff, including potential partners and provide direction? I'm just trying to like understand the, the motion that's on the table to me feels like we're saying at the next council meeting, we're gonna have a fulsome discussion about this. Coach Ellen, <clears throat> comments? Well, we, we're already um, been talking about potential partners and um, discussing next steps a little bit. Um, I think the only thing we need to do beyond what we've talked about is provide direction to staff. 
and and that's um, I think reach out to our neighboring uh, municipalities and um, and then I don't think that I don't think it should be contingent on getting partners from other municipalities for us moving forward. We need to decide that we want to do this regardless of who the partners are. Clear enough? Obviously, if this passes, you could add a subsequent motion that then gives that direction if this passes. I think you sort of getting first sec first base, second base, right? Are any other comments, questions with regards to the notice of motion that uh, has been read and moved by Councillor Allen and second by Councillor Allwood? Seeing no other discussion, all in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Okay. Uh, do you need to give any more direction then that this has passed in the sense of uh, next steps? Or are you think there's enough here, uh, Councillor Allen, that to staff there's enough here, or does staff need clarity on? Now that it's passed in this direction, do you need more clarity to staff? Anybody? <laughs> um, I, I, I would make a motion that staff reach out to um, the municipalities in the, uh, I'm getting a message here. I'll just read it. So, you know, it's hard, hard to do all these. <laughs> Hard to do all these things on uh, <laughs> on a phone. If I can interrupt, uh, Councillor yes. Allen, yes, um, I just sent him a message. I just sent a message that the um, for the action tracking follow up from this. The first step I have is to reach out to neighboring municipalities and report back. Right, and and that reaching out, Madam Clerk, will be this council has I passed have... this passed this resolution and looking for to move forward, right? With a potential doctor recruitment for Grey Bruce and I have yep. GBHS, Southgate, West Grey, and Chatsworth to reach out to. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, so do you, you move that motion then as the clerk had just, uh, yeah, okay. Do I have a second to that? Everybody understands the motion? Councillor Wickens? Does everybody understand the motion or do you need it read again? Councillor Elwood. Thank you. Uh... Mayor McQueen, I think we should add the Grey Bruce Health Services, the CHC, and, and the docs in, in Flesherton as, you know, if we're reaching out to people at this point. You know, the, the point that Councillor Allen made about enticing people to uh, want to come and live in Grey Highlands, potential doctors, is what the job of a physician recruitment is, recruiter is. And, uh, you know, in the presentations they made to the committee that I was involved in the last term of council, that, that takes years. You have, to, you have to reach out to them in the year one, convince them, one, that family medicine is where they want to be and not a specialist, which, you know, a lot of uh, the new docs all want to be specialists, new medical students, right, they all want to be specialists. But um, so I think involving... The CHC, Grey Bruce Health Services, and and perhaps the doctors that are practicing in Grey Highlands right now, adding those to the list would be a good thing. I'd, I'd be prepared to amend the amendment if I got a comforting so. smile from the clerk. So go ahead, Madam Clerk. Uh, thank you. That's not included in the in the motion we reached out to. It's the follow up action item to oh, okay. staff to do. So I just added those. All things. right. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Allen, did you uh, wave your hands there? Yes, during the senior advisory committee, those exact partners were mentioned. Um, CHC, um, Grey Bruce Health Services, and the existing doctors. Um, some of the doctors um, are very, very close to retirement. And I would suspect that since they have been in the community for decades, they would love to be able to retire knowing that um, there has been physicians um, recruited to, to take their rosters. So I, I think, I hope that they would be um, interested in participating. All right. So we have a, a subsequent motion on the floor. Any further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. All right. 
Are there any other new notice of motions? Thanks for adding that on there so I don't forget. Any new notice of motions? Councillor Allen. Councillor Allen. I have another one. <laughs> so I will be bringing forward a, <laughs> a notice of motion to review the delegation of authority. Um, I was speaking to the clerk um, yesterday and mentioned that I was thinking about doing this because I feel that each new council should um, be looking at it and approving um, whether they make any changes or not, but it should be this council's decision on whether they're happy with what is in the policy. And the clerk mentioned that there um, are also some housekeeping issues that need to be brought back um, so we can do all this at, at once. Okay, thank you. Last call, are there any other notice of motions? All right, there is none at this time. Thank you, Councillor Allen. County uh, Council report, pretty straightforward. The Deputy Mayor and the liaison were not available. I attended uh, for a short period of time uh, remotely as we were at the OSM conference. Um, it's a long meeting. Pretty straightforward. There were a couple of delegations that spoke. Uh, green nursing programs. There's one thing. Oh. I was going to. Sorry, Mayor McQueen. I was going to ask you if you wanted to expand on Scott Taylor's report. I was told to actually review that part, and I haven't had a chance to go back and watch it. His report just on public meetings and the process and consultation with the public about it? Yeah, he had quite a lengthy report, as Scott always does. Um, uh, <laughs> which are very thorough. <laughs> Slow you down. Chris, Chris, uh, Chris uh, commented there as well. Uh, I mean, you'd almost be better to go back and watch it. I'm just, I mean, he's very thorough and he's, he's very good. I mean, he's very good on, on his report. But um, uh, the one I was going to more zero in on um, was the tax ratios. And I did mention this to Councillor Allen after my meeting is uh, a, a direction that's being proposed from the province that residential multi-residents are supposed to be zero at tax ratios. So the, pro the county is, is slowly moving, I'm going by memory here, is it from a four point something to a three point? That, that's that's the number. There's a number, but they eventually want to get so late. So the province they they want to slowly move there before they're told from the province you're doing it right. So basically, um, help me out maybe here, Madam uh, Madam CEO, where residential is one um, is uh, multi res like one point three or something. Yeah, one point three nine or something, and I think it's at I think it was at one point four something, and they're going to one point three something, but eventually they're going to get down. So multi res and residential are the same tax ratios, right? Because it's residential. So the feeling is is they got direction from the province that if they don't move in this direction, eventually the province will come in and say it's all the same, and then you're going to have a big shift. But you do it in increments. It's not. It's, it's so. Mean, basically, means residential. Basically, residential is your major taxpayer of the whole system. You'll see hardly anything, but it's making so. So those that are multi-res and and I think the question could be asked. So if multi-res is more rental, is is the savings going to be conveyed to the rent rentees or the people renting it, right? Or what's going to happen there, right? It's or, or is it going to go in the pocket, right? So anyway, that's not ours to discuss, but that's that was the bigger part uh, was there. Um, Council received an update from the University of Guelph Students Project, advancing additional residential units. We're going to continue to work on that. I'm trying to think of anything else. It was a pretty straightforward meeting. It wasn't a lot of stuff. I mean, it's like I would certainly highly recommend anybody go back. And uh, yeah, Scott had two reports. He had a report on that. He had a report on a subdivision, I think it was as well. And uh, it's kind of came a long way over the years. Yeah. Even before you knew him, I, he's, so he's, came, he's, he's actually quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's actually, uh, is it, you know, anyway, I don't have any questions, but I do. I don't know if you have anything to add just in general, Deputy Mayor, you, okay. I must say, and I'll say it right here, that the Deputy Mayor has been 
appointed by order of council for the province of Ontario is the new um, municipal rep for Gray County for on the NEC. It is public knowledge. It's a big deal to be from the order of council from the province. It is a big deal to be to be appointed from the province. I know it was a big deal when I got appointed, and so the deputy mayor uh, will be uh, representing Gray County from the municipal side. Uh, the public side is Duncan McKinley, uh, and at one time the representation across the NEC planned area sort of got out of balance, and there was a lot of representation from the south. But it sort of got worked out that it sort of got spread out again where there's equal representative because basically on the NEC, I think it's eight municipal, eight public, and the chair. And so that makes up 17 and the chair will vote if there's a tie to be to be uh, to be put in place. So congratulations, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> lots of reading, lots of lots of work, but uh, interesting uh, 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 commission to be on. And uh, all the best, and uh, you will learn all the comments that, uh, or all the sayings that uh, Duncan McKinley has. <laughs> the only, the only one request I have to you, Deputy Mayor, and it was one of my things. Is the kids out yet, or is the? Um, and I always felt this very important on the NEC, and it, it will be going through a, a, a plan review in a couple of years. Is I felt that the development permit for three years is too short. The development permit should be good for five years. And the reason I say that, and one example is that we've had some circumstances going through COVID where things were delayed and then people came back and then they had to go through the whole process again. And it's a lengthy process. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things, and you will get to a point twice a year that you have policy meetings and it's the policy meetings where you talk about that stuff. So I, if, if anything, I ask one thing, is to continue the, the gauntlet to, to, to try to get that to five years. Because I just think it's important today because the people go through so much. And, and not only that, NEC is limited staff. So if you start, if you could, if all of a sudden it comes up through renewal and you got to go through it, then they got to go back through it and, and all that kind of stuff. So there may be other things that I wish to bring to your attention, but that's what comes up right now. So congratulations, Deputy Mayor. I will just add that the reason that got brought up now is because that is why I was not in attendance at the county meeting that's on right. last Thursday that's right. as I was at my first NEC meeting, which... Uh, should not normally conflict with the county council, but did on this particular occasion. <laughs> and generally the NEC meetings is the third Thursday, yeah. which doesn't conflict with the county, but the second, fourth, but then April's were a little bit messed up because April 1st was on a Saturday, right? So anyway, needless to not to say there anymore. Okay. Uh, any, so I need a motion then that... Uh, that we receive the highlights from the April 27th Gray County meeting highlights to be received for information. You move that deputy mayor, do I have a seconder? Councilor Allwood, any discussion there? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Okay, Councilor Privileges, who wants to go? Deputy Mayor. So I'll say now, now we're in Council Privilege, we're not under County Highlights. I'll say thank you very much for that about the NEC. Um, I do look forward to having some good conversations with you. It was a very interesting meeting with the way things are held. Uh, things run a little differently. The few quick things I thought were interesting to note was that every single vote is a recorded vote. So that was interesting. And that the only items that really come to the commission board are items that are not automatically approved by staff. So really you only get to vote and discuss the controversial items. So if you really want to have some excitement, get on a board that only lets you discuss the controversial ones. Um, it was very interesting. The one policy thing that I would say to you, Mary McQueen, that I'm sure we should have a conversation about later on is this idea that after two years of not working a farm, it has suddenly become not a working farm. And I think that the timeline, it seems very, very narrow given um, the time it would take to transition over to different crop styles or anything like that. So it was interesting policy, policy discussion at the commission on Thursday. Um, so, yep, very excited to be on the NEC. A different uh, item for council privileges. Just wanted to let everybody know that there is the Rockland Trivia Night going on this Saturday evening. It is a tropical theme. So make sure to dress in your brightest colors and funnest shirts. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing some people there. I have a team going on on that one. And then I think there was an earlier discussion 
Mayor McQueen's going to bring up about another trivia night going on. Oh, he's going to let me do this one for two. We got the lights, camera, action trivia night going on Friday, May 5th at 7 p.m. at the Maxwell Hall. And hopefully we can get some people out there for that one. It is fun that these trivia nights just work out so well. They're just such a fun night. Um, last week, I was at the trivia night for Markdale Egg uh, at the Markdale Hall. And then this one is for for the Maxwell SEC. So it's a school fundraiser. And then the one on Saturday is actually the um, Lions Club putting it on in Rockland. Um, so they're always a fun night. It's always interesting to see what random thoughts or trivia knowledge you actually have when a question gets asked. Like, wait a second, I know this one. Um, and I will say selfishly that at the Markdale Ag one, our table one best decorated and we did go for, it was the through the decades. We were de decorated as the 1990s. And I brought a bunch of uh, World Series championship paraphernalia for the Blue Jays. And we had our deck table decked out, including my father-in-law and myself wearing Blue Jays jerseys. And I also won a prize for ironically knowing that the municipality was um, created, the municipality of Grahans was created in 2001. And uh, it was a pretty simple question to be asked. And there was conversations of whether or not I was a ringer for that one. And I shouldn't have been given the prize, <laughs> but I did put my name in did the bucket. Answer right? I answered the question correctly. There was a, a prize bucket at the front of different questions for the decades. And one of the questions for the 2000s was what year was Great Highlands incorporated? And so when I went up there, people were like booing me because they're like, he shouldn't win this one. He should know this one automatically. It was a very fun night. Um, there was lots of uh, community members there. Uh, I think there's like seven full tables. It's just fun to get out and have fun at the trivia nights. I look forward to this weekend's trivia nights as well. So just want to share all that for councilor privilege. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just for what other ones, I'm just going to follow up with regards to the trivia night that uh, Cindy sent me a message that this is at the Osprey Central or from the Osprey Central School fundraiser, and it's at the Maxwell Hall. They had some cancellations, and it is lights, camera, action. And I, and I think uh, I mentioned it at, uh, at break that you're in. I'm in. Yes, I am, Cindy. Dan, you have three. So what's that? That's uh, five, six. six. Is there anybody interested else to uh, attend? I could be like a party of three. Okay. Add three. Like Isn't there a, nine, that's team. There was a show called 25. <laughs> <laughs> Eight. Yeah, we can take up to 10. Three's company? No, it was party of five, right? Well, yeah, three's company. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> showing. There's a TV here. <laughs> yeah, I know we get along. We get long in the tooth, and the day the day gets long. So we can have up to ten, and uh, so and the theme is uh, yeah, and uh, what's the uh, prizes for best dressed? Anyway, we can communicate afterwards. I'll send an email out to everyone, and if you. We can take up to 10. It's always fun. Other council privileges, other, 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 go ahead, uh, Councillor Dubik. Uh, thank you. Um, so the other month I shared with you that I uh, put my name forward uh, for the electorer now advisory council for consideration. Um, so I have been successfully selected onto the council. Um, so we have a good representation of women from different uh, municipalities and we're kicking off our council uh, work next week with our first inaugural meeting. Very good. And where do you meet? Virtually. Oh, okay. Yes, so it, it is virtual. Uh, we are sort of lo located in different areas. So, you know, that, that could require a bit of uh, traveling. Uh, we do have events, you know, that uh, bring, um, you know, members together. Um, there, there is a, an event coming up, um, you know, to bring members together, um, but yeah, but virtually. Yeah. Anything else, Councilor uh, Dubik, anything else? Councilor Wickens, anything? Councilor Allen, I got some more stuff. Else oh, I figured that. Councilor Allen, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> mayor. Um, the uh, mayor and I attended OSM yes. last week. And I think um, the last time I went to a conference was in 2014. It was also OSM in Niagara Falls. So um, I definitely enjoyed this. There were some really good sessions. Um, that I will bring some reports back, but um, I'm sure everybody will be pleased that it's not going to be tonight. Um, 
on the way down, uh, the mayor had a, a meeting that he had to, we, we carpooled and um, he had a meeting he had to take. So he asked me to drive and, and I'm trying to remember the last time I drove a standard, let alone a six speed standard. And I was a little nervous with the owner of the car sitting right beside me, but um, I quickly remembered how to do it. And I think, uh, I, I think I did well. And speaking of the, uh, of the Camaro on the way home, the mayor was driving and we heard a bit of a, a beep of a horn and we looked out the driver's window and there was this guy in a little Toyota urging us to, uh, to have a little bit of a, a drag race on highway 86 or something but the the mayor <laughs> resisted so that was good and um the duty. last item <laughs> the last item i won't go into details but just ask either the mayor or myself about um his uh hamburger that's all i'm going to say about it thank you <laughs> <laughs> yes we'll have to leave that offline that one um just before I go to you, Councillor Owen, I, I do, I, I will say it was interesting when you hear this beep beep and a guy revving his engine and he really wanted to race and yeah, we we're on duty so we, we couldn't do it. Um, I will correct you, Councillor Allen, because you were on a separate council, uh, conference in 2019 because you went to the Committee of Adjustment Conference. Uh, yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. We were on a, we were on a, a, a cruise. Yes, I, I, I had some connections there. So <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Okay. Anyway, thank you. For, thanks for that, and thanks for reminding me about the. Uh, yeah, that you did very well. I had a, I had a um, agenda review, and uh, hopefully my internet cut cut out a couple of times, and you got me back again. But it was good, Councillor Owit. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you, the um, Home and Garden Show was on the weekend. Uh, municipal staff were there. It was a very successful show. The weather was uh, in our favor. It was a terrible. <laughs> <laughs> terrible day, terrible weekend to be outside. So people were drawn to that inside event and uh, it was well attended. The uh, feedback from the uh, exhibitors on the floor was great. They're already talking about booking time for uh, the next show, which is encouraging. Um, uh, so a, a good time was had by all, very, very successful event. And I think we have the mayor's breakfast coming up as one of the next event that the Chamber of Commerce is involved with. So hopefully everybody's got that in their calendar, 7 a.m. start. What day is that? I knew you'd ask. <laughs> the 27th of June, I believe. June or don't, don't hold me to it. Yeah, okay. I saw it somewhere down there. Yeah. Should we I guess look out for it? Grass then, right? No, I, was, I will say that the, the, the uh, Home and Garden Show was, was well attended. Thanks for staff uh, for attending our booth and looking after that. I know that uh, we had a great booth there and... Uh, it showcased uh, a lot of our business, so that was good. And again, Madam CEO, make sure you thank them personally from council. Yep. Um, Sorry, if I can just, I just wanted to build on that because um, I was speaking to a shop owner in Flesherton after uh, the Home and Garden Show on the weekend, and they're just mentioning, you know, how busy they were on the weekend because of the multiplier effect. When you know, when you have a good event happening in town. You know, everybody gets busy and, um, you know, we get that sort of fly, economic flywheel going. So I just thought that was like a great reminder just, you know, that, you know, that, you know, one event, you know, has a good spillover effect, you know, for our, you know, our businesses and our economy, you know, as a whole. Well, and I like going around and you could spend all day just talking to everybody. It's great to see the, the diversity of, of booths that were there and, and, I didn't get a chance to listen to it, but they had seminars too, right? Mm -hmm. Right, and 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 I, I never got over to the Kinplex, and uh, but uh, they were doing stuff there as well, right? So it worked out well. It was a good day to be indoors. So it was. Councilor Lohit, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mayor McQueen. Um, I'd like to uh, give an announcement here of a uh, large plant sale that's going to be happening in Kimberley. Um, with all proceeds going to the Markdale Hospital. So I don't know if you've anybody has heard about that here at the hmm. council or viewing public. And so that's uh, Saturday, May 27th. Um, and uh, speaking of uh, 7A with those four bridges, it's right at the intersection of Gray Road 7 and 7A. It's a little farm called Penny Lane. They've got a 
a sign out front you may be familiar with. So they've got uh, market gardens, et cetera, and they'll be um, selling all sorts of, they say here, uh, mature perennials, peonies, hostas, ornamental grasses, thornless blackberries, raspberries, and more. Uh, and again, that's uh, May 27th, Saturday, May 27th, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, all, all proceeds going to the Markdale Hospital. So I'll be there. I hope somebody else will be as well. So, so yeah. Yeah, FCM and, and uh, yeah, so we'll be there. But but is that the place where it has like different stuff hanging on the building or something? There's some. I thought there's a building along there that has a lot of stuff. I can't remember. Um, yeah, maybe you're thinking of the the same building. There's an old little uh, farm yeah, house kind really, of thing, really and unique, uh, yeah. yeah, Penny Lane. Uh, they're interesting folks, and they they sell. They used to have a, like a sort of cosmetic business out of that little shop there that they sold all across Ontario. Um, but now they, they, it's a bit of a nursery. So anyway, I think it's a neat little event and um, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll raise a bunch of funds for the new hospital. So that's great. And just before I go to Deputy Mayor, at the Grace Hall Conservation Authority, there's also a tree sale. Um, there is. Um, so, sorry, yes. Uh, so the tree, the tree sale is at Ellen Park on, what day is it? It is May 13th, Saturday. That's the text. Take a screenshot. Sorry, what's the date, May? It's May 13th. And there's a conflict with something else, it's with your business opening or closing. No, <laughs> no, it's with the, it's with the grist, it's with the grist mill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not closing, yeah. it's a celebration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 10-year anniversary. Sorry, Deputy Mayor. <laughs> okay. They're closing and opening up a new chapter. Okay. Sure. Okay, go ahead, Deputy Mayor. So first quick one is a motion proceed past 5 p.m. Okay, uh, do, well, it's 5 2, so. Yep, I'm sure. Well, we still have a close session. Okay, do I have a seconder? Councilor Duby. Discussion all in favor? That's good. I always wonder when somebody doesn't yep. do that. But anyway, go ahead. And then one last, sorry, one last um, Councilor privilege is uh, this weekend is the coronation of King Charles. Um, and so there are two events happening within the municipality. The first event is going to happen on Saturday at 11 a.m. at the Ainsley United Church. Um, they will be showing the actual full coronation ceremony, as well as there'll be a light lunch um, provided in the, um, in the church itself. Um, and I don't know why, but yours truly will be the MC for the day uh, on that event. Um, I was asked by the member of the peace committee and said, absolutely, why not? So I'll be there. Um, so hopefully everybody can come out. And then also on Sunday um, at, I believe it's 11 a.m. There, or maybe it's, sorry, 1 p.m. At 1 p.m. at Grey Gables, there is a, a ribbon cutting for an oak tree planted at the Grey Gables property in recognition of King Charles's coronation. Um, so there'll be an event there. Um, Pardon? Are you going to that? My hope is to get to that one, but then there is also a community building event put on by um, the Municipal League uh, at the Kimplex at 2 p.m. on Sunday. So it was a very exciting time. I think uh, COVID is over and everybody just wants to do everything all at the same time. So it's been fun as a being on council and trying to get to as many things as we can. I don't know how we'll make it Sunday, so we'll talk better. Yeah, 4 a.m., right? Charles starts at 4 a.m.? Uh, it's 3 a.m. Yeah. But the, the, the uh, sorry, uh, the actual coronation is at eleven um, British time. time, which is six a.m. our time. Yeah. All right. Very good, Councilor Dubik. It's a quick comment. Um, so I'm just really excited um, to check out your fastener. Did you not see? It? I ha I have not seen it. Do Do you have one? What's so, the fastener? I do have a fascinator and I did send a picture to everybody. If you read uh, CAO Govan's update, uh, my response to her update did include the picture of my fascinator that oh. we'll see if I can pull it off or not. And this is the question of the day. I challenge everybody to wear their fascinator and show up. I, it will be hard to wear a fascinator and not my hat. I still am a little lost <laughs> on what a fascinator is, but <laughs> Councillor Wickens is going to explain it to me. <laughs> I believe it's an accessory you wear on your hat or maybe as a hat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. I'm going to school that day to get that lesson. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any, anything else? I will say that uh, late it was, is a, was for me to attend 
but I, I was happy to attend Councillor Wickens uh, birthday get together last uh, last Saturday night at the Maxwell Hall and uh, it was great to see Dan lots of, I, when I got there it was nice to see all the people that we went to school with a lot of people I understand a lot of people left and it's uh, it was nice to re nice reflection on just all getting together and, and I'm sure you had a had a great time and nice to see everybody come out and support you and uh, you know social gathering as it was was uh, was fun so anyway Dan okay if there's nothing I'm supposed to leave that on okay so we are to be moving into a closed session. I am that the council proceed into closed session. I'm going to say at five o'clock to discuss matters relating to the following Stonebrook discovery update 239 2 E litigation or potential litigation, and that the CEO Karen Govin and Clerk Ray Martel remain in attendance. Can somebody care to move and second that, please? Deputy Mayor, Councilor Allwood, any discussion on that? Seeing that, all in favor? That's carried. We won't be too long Mr. for the viewing public. Oh, sorry, Councillor Allen. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I have a link to the closed session. It's going to be emailed to you. Oh, it was mailed to you at three. Sorry, sent to you at three p.m. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So, from the viewing public, we're winding things down here for a minute. <coughs>
Let's try that again. Welcome back, everyone. We're in open session. We adjourned our closed session at 522 or 525. And that the closed meeting was held and only the closed session items identified were discussed in closed session. And there's nothing further report. And there was a, re a verbal report uh, that was brought forward with the items that we went in closed session for. All right, uh, I need a motion then for the, did I say that right? <laughs> I need a motion to the confirming bylaw. And Sir Allwood. Don't we need to move the uh, oh, yes. closed session? Yes, that's right. I'll move that. Sorry, Your Worship. That's what I got to look from the clerk. Councilor Allwood and Deputy Mayor. Again, what I just read off, all in favor of that? That is carried. All right, uh, confirming bylaw. I need a mover. Again, Councilor Allwood, Deputy Mayor. Put words in your mouth. But the bylaw 23, 2023-59 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council on May 3rd, 2023, be read first, second, and third, and finally passed that the mayor and clerk be authorized to sign and seal the same, notwithstanding any contrary, contrary provisions of council. All in favor of that? That is carried. We have a list of meetings there. Um, the one that's, it's not on there anyway for our, our town hall, so that will come in as a, as a, a new revision. I think you sent out as a thing, the new. Some, something was sent out for meetings, I thought today. I thought there was something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. All right, that's it for meetings. Am I, is there anything missing there for meetings? If not, <clears throat> motion to adjourn. Deputy Mayor, second by Councilor Lohead. All in favor? That is correct. You know what? There always used to be a competition to whoever could get to the adjournment first, but he's not here now. <laughs> so when I was 12 years old, I, I made the We're adjourned. We're adjourned. Are we adjourned? Yes. Yeah. Did I say that, Carrie? Did I thought say that? I thought we were Carrie. Bye, Councillor Allen. I wanted Good to ask Councillor Allen if there was any news. Any, not any yet. Update? No, no. Your, your, your lips said no, but. It's a, it's a work in progress. We can't hear you, Councillor Allen.